Hey guys, uh, thank you very much for watching. Um, my videos, unfortunately, my videos got, actually got taken down um, recently, quite recently. Um, I spoke to people on YouTube to see why it's removed, but unfortunately, they've got to send me an email to see why it's been removed. I'm not so sure why they couldn't tell me. However, um, things will change. I'm going to put my face a bit more on the videos. Hopefully, that will change a lot. Um, but we shall see, because I've been doing uh, just commentary on some videos. Um, fortunately, it wasn't enough. But let's see if I put my face on it, and with the old guy's support, let's hope this channel can stay up again, because it's been taken down way too many times. Just want to say thank you very much for nearly 12,000 um, followers. It means a lot to me. Um, we are getting there. I'm going to upload some more content, and the courses will be back on um, more often. Yeah. So let me know in the comments below to see what else I can change, and I really hope you enjoyed the video. And I'm gonna watch the stream with you guys. So I'm sorry if you got to see my face, but unfortunately, policies, I gotta do it. So I'm gonna put it right in the corner. Um, like, yeah, put it right in the corner. And I'll catch you guys um, in the next video. But for now, just enjoy it. And I'll see you guys later. Welcome to the Tape BHD course. If you've bought this course, which you obviously have, congratulations, you're gonna change your life for the better. I know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm fucking certified. I know I don't look like a pimp right now, I look like a tramp, but I just finished training. I don't owe you motherfuckers nice clothes, so whatever. I actually went out of my way and bought a whiteboard. That's some genuine effort. But the only pen I have is green, which is gonna be difficult for you to see. So we're not gonna use the whiteboard, we're gonna put graphics in the video instead, which is more effort. Should've charged double for this shit. Anyway, so me, I'm going to teach you from the ground up how to get it done. I was thinking if I was going to do like modular videos, like little modules on, on each thing of how to do it or just do one long video. It's actually quite difficult. It's almost like, imagine you're the best baker in the world and someone comes to you and says, teach me how to bake. Well, the first thing you're going to do is go, okay, well, bake what? Bake a cake, bake bread in an oven or on a fire or how long do I have? What are the ingredients? Like the first thing the master baker is going to do Master Baker, Master Baker, is going to ask you loads of questions because baking is such an all-encompassing art, it's very difficult to just explain everything. And pimping is very much the same. It's very difficult for me to just explain absolutely everything, the whole 360 degrees, but I'm gonna try anyway. And for that reason, I'm not gonna do modules. I'm not gonna break it down to little videos. What I'm just gonna do is I'm just gonna fucking lay down some knowledge for the next long time and your ass needs to get a pen and a fucking paper and pay attention. If you have to watch this video over and over and over again, fine. If you have to watch this video and understand that there's certain parts of it that you need to tweak to fit your particular style, fine. I'm not saying that this is gonna be absolutely not really rigid, but it is gonna be a fail, a fail proof system. That's what it's absolutely gonna be because there are some rules which are ironclad, can't be broken, and some rules there's exceptions to. So there's gonna be a whole bunch of talking here so if you haven't gone piss, go piss. Get some fucking popcorn. Buckle up. This is lesson one in your pimp and hose degree. All right, let's start with the basics. The basics are as follows. And like I said, when you're watching this video, there's gonna be some rules which I tell you which are ironclad and can't be broken. And sometimes there's exceptions to the rules. I've read a lot of, a lot of the Manosphere bullshit. And sometimes they say, if you fuck her on the first date, she ain't worth shit. That's not true. I've had girls who I fucked on the first date who weren't worth shit. And I've had girls who I fucked on the first date I was with for two or three years and they were fiercely loyal to me and they were fantastic girlfriends. So that is a rule which has exceptions. But there are some rules with no exceptions. Like, oh, my girl has male friends. They're just her friend. No, not allowed. That is a rule that can never, ever, ever, that cannot be broken. If you got your chick on lock and she's in love with you, she ain't interested in talking to no other fucking dude about Game of Thrones or some dumb shit. She's interested in talking to you and you only. So, like I said, I'm gonna do a lot of talking here and what I want you to do is pay a lot of attention and especially pause this video. If I'm giving you examples or I'm talking about things, try and apply them to your own life or why you, well, you, where you've tried things in your own life or your own current situation and see how they fit. I'm, I'm very open for questions, comments. If you have any particular questions or comments you wanna come at me with, drop me an email. There's no problem at all. So we're gonna start at the very, very beginning, which is the overview of the sexual marketplace that we currently live in. We currently live in a sexual marketplace which is extremely difficult for men. 
and it is getting harder and harder. It is not getting easier. It's getting harder and harder because women biologically are programmed to share an alpha male. Now I say this, and this is what's actually interesting to me. A lot of the Manosphere stuff, the 21 convention stuff, all this shit is talking about how women are wrong and women need to be fixed. I don't necessarily think that's the case. If you can position yourself in the correct place, you'll have more than enough women. So by the way the sexual marketplace works is, if you're in the wrong place, you don't have enough women. But if you're in the right place, you have too many women. I have more women than I can see. I, by the time I've fucked all the girls I need to fuck to keep my, my normal rotation going, I don't have time to go on a date. Every night is planned. Every night I'm looking at my phone and I've got four choices and I'm like, where am I gonna stay? And that's not just because I've got money, because it's been like this before I had money. I've had money for six, seven years. It was exactly the same before I had money. I've always had too many women because I understand where to position myself. So the first thing I want you guys to do is a lot of this red pill stuff is anti-women, the way that women are hyper gamers, and they don't like the way the world works and women only want this and, that, and it's really negative. You are not going to be successful with girls if you hate girls. You need to get that shit out of your head and you've got to change your mindset where you don't like how women think. I don't like how women think. Women do this. Women do that. Women think a particular way and that's fine. If you know the rules to the game, if you can bend the rules or you can put yourself in the right position so that the rules of the game favor you, then you should be very happy women think a particular way. So a lot, like I said, a lot of this red pill stuff is trying to change the way women think, They're trying to say that women think a certain way and this is wrong. And uh, like there's a new convention coming out, 22 convention, make women great again about how to make women great. If women were completely fair, like men and every woman just got with one guy, da, 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 then where's the fun in being a G? Where's the fun in having all these chicks? Well, how come I have so many? I only have so many because there's a whole bunch of dudes out there with none. That's the way the world works. So I'm going to teach you to be in my position. So you need to get rid of any hate or resentment you have towards women. Get rid of that shit out the, That's the first thing you've got to do. When you understand women better, you'll understand why they do what they do, and you'll understand how to position yourself so it suits you. So the sexual marketplace is very difficult for men, and the reason it's difficult for men is because men have one weapon in the battle for sex, and that is attention. All you can give a female is attention. All right, I'm gonna take my jacket off quickly. Before I take my jacket off, let me just uh, remind you this watch costs 30 grand. If that upsets you, get your money up. Um, so all you have is your attention. So the basics of the sexual marketplace are as follows. You give your attention to a woman to get sex. And the woman gives you her sex to keep getting your attention. Attention into sex, and sex into attention. That's how it works. Men give their attention to get sex. Women give sex to get attention. That's how it should work. But the reason the sexual marketplace is so fucked is because there's too many women out there who get attention without giving sex. So previously, not too long ago, men didn't give a fuck about a girl they weren't banging. They didn't care. They, why would you care about a girl you don't fuck? She ain't nothing to you, you don't see her. But now with Instagram, you got girls with millions of follower, followers. Millions of men are giving her validation. Millions of men are liking her comments and comment and, and, and liking her posts and commenting on her shit and telling her she's beautiful and she fucks zero of them. So that skewed up the whole thing. Now it's all fucked because you got chicks getting unlimited male attention without having to give their sex out. And that's why the sexual marketplace is getting difficult because it's the whole fucking, the whole fucking game, the fair equation has been completely skewed. Male attention is suffering from hyperinflation. Whereas male attention isn't worth shit anymore. 50, 60 years ago, if you were talking to a girl or you took her on a date or you bought her flowers, it meant something. Buy a bitch flowers now, she doesn't give a fuck. Why the fuck does she care? She gets unlimited inboxes in her fucking Instagram. She can get flowers anytime she wants. She doesn't fucking care. None of that means anything. So that's the sexual marketplace. So the number one game as a man is you need to attach some value to your attention. Your attention has to become more valuable because you have two choices. I'm assuming you motherfuckers are smart. I don't know all of you who bought this. I know some of you bought this. Some of you might be dumb. But if something hyperinflates, the choices are as follows. Imagine a currency. If a currency hyperinflates, you either do something to restore the value of that currency or you give a lot more currency to get what you want. So my question to you is, if male attention's in hyperinflation, do you want to give 
loads, 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 loads more attention to try and get laid? Or do you want to attach a value to your attention so that you don't have to give very much at all, but you get what you want? The problem with giving loads, 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 loads more is you might not get laid. And then guess where you end up? The fucking friend zone. Aww. It's complicated. I'm single, guys. I'm single. Holy shit. What? <laughs> oh, no, no. We're, we're really good friends. <laughs> I took her here, I drove her there, I took her to the movies. Every time she called me, I was there. Every time she felt sad, I was there. And this bitch is sitting there going, well, he's there anytime I want him and I don't have to fuck him, so why would I fuck him? And she ends up fucking some guy who doesn't give a shit about her. And you're sitting there going, why would she fuck the guy who clearly doesn't like her? Because the guy who doesn't like her, his attention has a value because she can't get it very easily. Just like a currency, the only attention, anything only has a value through scarcity. So when you want to attach a value to your attention, you have to limit the attention you give a female. You cannot be running through the earth, throwing attention everywhere for fucking free, and expect a girl to give a shit that she's getting any. If she knows you give attention to every hoe that walks, she doesn't give a fuck about your attention. That's the reality. This is why girls like bad boys. It's not because bad boys are assholes. Well, partially it's because bad boys are assholes, but it's not actually the fact they're assholes. It's the fact that they'll tell the girl to fuck off. Or they'll say to a girl, I don't want to talk to you anymore. Or they know that getting attention from this particular man isn't free and easy. This guy will get rid of, he's giving me attention and he told that he got rid of that other girl or he ignores that girl, but he talks to me. That is value. So the number one thing you want to do in the current sexual marketplace is attach value to your attention. So how do you do that? Now, this is where we're going to get into internal factors, factors you can do as a person and external factors. There are a lot of factors you can't control. I don't want to fucking, what's the shitty expression? Teach grandmother to suck eggs or some dumb shit. I don't want to state the obvious, but obviously if you have a profile as a high value male, your attention is instinctively more valuable. So we're talking about att attaching value to your attention and we're going to do that by limiting your attention. But you can also attach value to your attention with the obvious things you already know. Go to the gym, get in shape, dress well, have money, all these basic things. But I'm not here to tell you that because that doesn't help you. You bought this course on how to get girls. I can't sit here and go get a Lambo because that ain't a fucking answer. That's stupid. But I'm saying if you do those things, it will absolutely help you because it makes you a higher value person. It means, and a girl's more interested in you because you're saying, well, a lot of the time it just sparks their curiosity. My experience with money is that girls don't care about money, but they care about how you've made it. Girls don't care about money, but they're like, where did he get this money from? They're curious about it. So it, it, some intrigue there. And with intrigue, your attention once again increases. So those are all the things you already know. If you don't know to go to the gym, get some money, da, 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 well, then you're an idiot. You know all these things, so we're not going to talk about them. We're going to talk about the things you can do without increasing your bank balance. So increasing the value of your attention. So as follows, I don't know your current situation, but I guarantee there's a bunch of girls in your phone who you're talking to or attempting to talk to who you've never fucked and you never stand a chance of fucking. Why are you talking to her? Why are you giving your attention away for free? Why are you devaluing yourself? And that's a mistake. So for this reason, anytime we're giving our attention to a woman, we need to aim for progression. Progression towards the end goal. If you find a woman sexually attractive, I know the fucking modern world tells you that's a bad thing, but it's not a bad thing. There's nothing wrong with finding a woman attractive and there's nothing wrong with wanting to sleep with a woman. There's nothing wrong with that. That is your end goal. And every move you make, every bit of attention you give has to be progressing towards that goal. You cannot just flounder in a sea of giving out your attention and you end up in the fucking friend zone. So, like I said, just like with the bakery example, there's a million things I need to teach you guys. I need to teach you guys approaching bitches on the street. I need to teach you guys how to do things in the club. And, and teaching these things without experience is extremely difficult. So to keep this easy, what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna give you some ironclad steps that you can do in the next two weeks so you can fuck a bitch, brand new girl you never fucked, so you know that I know what I'm talking about. Because a lot of this stuff I need to show you in person, there's a lot of other modules, etc. but we're gonna keep this very simple. We live in the world of the internet. So, first thing you can do to start getting laid today is your number one tool to get laid is Instagram. Instagram is 
the new dating fucking app. Fuck Tinder. I mean, Tinder's okay. The problem with Tinder is, if you're going to do Tinder enough, you'll swipe, you'll get some girls. But every girl on Tinder has fucked someone else. And Tinder's been around for four years now. They've fucked dudes from Tinder before. You know, only real ratchet assholes are left on there, really. Maybe if they're newly single or something. You might find something good on Tinder. I've done it. I found good girls on Tinder. But in general, what you want is Instagram. The reason Instagram's so fantastic is because women sit on Instagram all fucking day. The only problem with Instagram is that they get unlimited inboxes from guys saying bullshit. So how do you make your inbox more appealing than anyone else's inbox? So we're gonna talk about some inbox game. That's the thing. First thing you need to do is sort out your Instagram page. You can see on my Instagram, I have my particular angle, and that is money, obviously. I play the fighter thing. And also what I try and do with every single post is a degree of intrigue. Intrigue is super important in the sexual marketplace because intrigue, it attaches a value to your attention because you instantly become interesting. So imagine you work in Starbucks. Your job, you work in Starbucks. If a girl says, what do you do? You can say, I work at Starbucks. Or you can say, uh, well, say, well, I was high level at Starbucks. I was high level management. And now they put me in as a mystery worker. I'm making this shit up off the top of my fucking head. I'm telling you what I do if I work at Starbucks. And the girl would be like, what do you mean? It's like, oh, well, I was high level management. And then what they do is they send me around to different Starbucks stores to just work as a normal person. But what I have to do is report back to the high level management about how the store is being run and if the manager's competent. And da-da. All of a sudden you sound like a fucking spy. You're now James Bond of Starbucks. You were a barista loser. Now you're James Bond. That's how you got to put a spin on things. Really, I've never heard of that. So of course, if you heard of it, then it wouldn't work. No one knows about it. So I moved from store to store. Now all of a sudden you're an interesting person. Bam. You've got to put a spin on things. Then you're sitting there thinking, well, if I say that, maybe she's going to expect me to have money. No, she doesn't. Oh, so you get paid a lot. Oh yeah, I get paid good money, but you know, I'm looking after my cousin. She had a, a car crash or my cousin. I'm putting my cousin through college. Make up some bullshit. Look, we live in a world where you cannot play fair anymore. When you walk down the streets nowadays and someone wants to mug you, it can't be, all right, let's have a, a fair duel one-on-one. If you win, you get, there's no more fair. People are going to run up from behind and stab you. You can't play fair anymore. In, in with violence or in the sexual marketplace, you can't play fair. If you work in Starbucks and you are broke, you now are high level management on a secret Starbucks mission to find the worst Starbucks employees as a spy. And the reason you have no money is because you're putting your sick cousin through college. That is how you have to play the game. All of a sudden you're an interesting person from a barista to James Bond, the philanthropist. That's how you gotta be doing things. So whatever your job is now, it may be a little bit interesting, but I guarantee you can put a spin on it. And one of the most important things you can do is never give away all the information because there is nothing as interesting that you can say as what she can think of herself. So girls ask me all the time what I do. I do loads of different things. I don't tell them. I say, oh yeah, you know, I'm just working. Why working doing what? So I'm just making money. That's the, that's, that's the answer. They sit there and think, is he an assassin? Is he a spy? Is he, is he this? How come he has this car? Let them go through all the crazy ideas in their head because they'll settle on the one they like the most. No matter, what I, no matter what I make up or what lie I tell, it's not going to be as interesting as what they can imagine it could be. So you need to have some intrigue there. Don't be afraid to put a spin on your shit. That's the first thing. And your Instagram page needs to reflect that. My Instagram page very clearly makes me look like Russian mob, millionaire, pure gangster. Is that true? Yeah. But still... It's done in a very particular way so that when girls look at my page, they go, who the fuck is this dude? Like, where's he getting all these, where's he getting this? Why is he there? I'm tagged in all these weird locations. What's he doing? And also, there's a very fine line here. You've got to be careful. But I have girls on my Instagram page because I'm telling you this. No girl wants to fuck the guy that doesn't get girls. They all want to fuck the guy that other girls want to fuck. Because women are purely fucking evil when it comes to taking a guy off other dudes. A, a, guy, a guy off other chicks. They love that shit. So you don't want to do too much. You don't want to try and be like a budget Dan Bilzerian. But you do want to make it clear that you roll with chicks. Especially hot ones. Even if she's your friend or some shit. Put a picture on there. Ain't gonna hurt you. Who's she? Oh, someone I know. Once again, intrigue. Your girlfriend? I didn't say she was my girlfriend. I said someone I know. Oh, okay. Lay it down. Let them know. Like I said, this is a lot of talking, so you better have a pen and paper, make some fucking notes. 
find a girl, take a picture, get that shit done. Your Instagram page has to be interesting. You have maybe half a second. When you send an inbox to a girl, she's gonna look at your page. You have maybe half a second to impress her. For me, it's easy now about cars and shit. But you know what? Girls don't even care about cars, bro. Girls don't give a fuck. They don't care about Lambos and shit. The number of times I've had girls go, Lambo's uncomfortable, come get me in the BMW. They don't care. I mean, yeah, it's good for an Instagram page, but in general, they don't care. So you need to put together an Instagram, which is appealing to females. You're a full grown fucking man. If you're a full grown man, you don't care about likes and you don't care about keeping your Instagram updated. So if you only have your five or six best pictures and that's all you have there, do that. Don't keep updating every day with new pictures of you and your friend drunk. Cause no one gives a fuck, bro. No one cares and it's making you look a dick and it's damaging your fucking potential. Construct an Instagram front page cause you ain't gonna scroll down. The first five or six pictures that make a girl be interested in you one way or another. I don't care if you have to get a professional, professional photographer. I don't care if you have to rent a car. I don't care if you have to fuck. I don't care what lie you have to tell. I don't give a fuck. You should know. Look at my Instagram. Put something together that is interesting. I've used the money angle. If you haven't got the money angle, you know what chicks love? Travel. Do the travel angle. Fucking right now, book something, go on holiday, spend two days taking loads of photos next to rocks and oceans and bullshit and do the travel angle. That's, that's cheap. And then bang, you're a traveling guy. Well, girls like travel. It's interesting to them because they all want to fucking travel for free because they're all scams. So put an Instagram page together that's interesting and, and don't update it all the time with shitty photos. Do not update your Instagram very often if you haven't got amazing things to put on there. That is your fucking shop window. That's your portal to the chicks. If you're gonna inbox a chick, that's the first thing you're gonna look at. That's all you've got. Do not give a shit about keeping people updated with your life because no one fucking cares about your shit life anyway. This is the absolute hard reality. Another thing you don't wanna do, if you look on my Instagram, there's a picture of me with four guys sitting with leather jackets before we did some work in London. We're clearly Russian mob, so that's allowed. If you're clearly mafia or you're looking like a G, you're allowed. But in general, groups of pictures of men are a no. I'm telling you some solid no-nos for Instagram. Because living in the animal kingdom, it's always little shitty weak animals that are in huge groups. Prey, like fucking buffalo or whatever, even though they're strong, the prey, the things that get hunted are always in big groups. The hunters are like one or two. Hunters are like lone soldiers. You don't see fucking 20 hunters together. If you think you and all your 20 friends are cool with your beers, 20 guy, a picture. No one gives a fuck. And if a girl looks at it, she's not gonna know which one is you. And instinctively, she's gonna think, beta, loser. You on your own, or you and someone else. Two guys, three guys max, bang, I'm a G. You don't need to be on fucking big groups of things. Next thing, do not put any pictures of you with your mouth open. That soy face shit is taking over the world. You know when, every, when guys are uncomfortable in their skin, so they take a picture and they go like, or some shit. There's, that's been scientifically proven in primates, monkeys. They, they, sh they open their mouth as a sign of submission. Primates, which are our closest cousin, when the alpha male monkey turns up, he's got pissed off face. And the other monkeys, when they see him, they kind of go and show their teeth as saying like, it's a submission thing, like don't hurt me. And nowadays, if you look at a fucking uh, a, a Democrat or a liberal or someone who doesn't support Trump, all of their pictures, they've got their fucking mouth open. The reason they do that is instinctually, it's a, it's a submissive sign. Like, please, world, don't hurt me. And women detect that shit. It's not, it's not attractive in any way. Get rid of that shit. Look about your business. You're a full-grown fucking man. You haven't got to look pissed off. You've got to look about your business. Look like you know what you're doing. Like you know where you're going. Like you're doing something worthwhile. Nobody is doing anything worthwhile going like this. It's bullshit. Girls don't want to see you fucking happy, having a great time laughing. You're not five years old. You're a fucking full grown man. Looking for a man who's going to take care of her. Looking for a fucking serious G. So put that shit together. Build an Instagram page. Even if you can only get five good photos, that's enough. Never update it again. Because girls don't check when the photo was posted. You think a girl sees a good picture and goes, oh, that was posted six months ago. They don't give a fuck. They look on your fucking page and go, oh, okay, I'll reply to him. Done. Get a good couple good pictures. That's that. Next stage. What do you inbox the woman that makes you different from everyone else? Now, everyone watching this, I'm sure you've already inboxed loads of girls on Instagram. I don't know what you particularly say. But I'll tell you what I would say and I'll give you screenshot examples. So, 
A lot of men say, hey, how are you? Hey, how are you? Bitch, she doesn't even know who the fuck you are. Why would she give a shit about telling you how she is? She knows you don't care. You don't care. And she gets that 30 times a day. So she doesn't care. That's a bad idea. You are beautiful isn't bad, but it leaves you open for loads of shit testing. It leaves you open for I know or LOL or some kind of sarcastic shit that they reply to you that makes you look like a dick. And you got to instantly fight to prove your manhood. If I message a girl, you're beautiful, and she'll go, I've had like before, LOL, as in laughing. And they're like, what's funny? And then they can ignore you. Then you look like a dickhead. You're beautiful, LOL, what's funny? And then you get blanked. You gotta be careful how you set this shit up because women are looking to shit test you as soon as they can. Women are looking to turn it on you and give you some shit to see how you react to them straight away. So in my experience, what I find raises intrigue, it inspires them to respond, and also makes it extremely difficult for them to shit test me is, I ask where they are. So what I do, and you're gonna see a screenshot in a second, I live in Bucharest, Romania, but it doesn't matter if I'm in London, Bucharest, Moscow, anywhere I am, I just say, Bucharest question mark, or Moscow question mark, or London question mark. Sometimes, because like I said, intrigue, I'll put a completely pointless emoji on the end. Some cherries, or an orange, or a strawberry. Because it doesn't mean anything. So the girl's sitting there, she's scrolling through, how are you, you're sexy, how are you, you're sexy, how are you, sexy. Bucharest, strawberry, like, fuck. Yeah, I am in Bucharest. Then they start to think, why does he want to know where I am? Like, does he want to fuck me? Does he, has he seen me? Does he have something of interest for me? And they usually reply, yeah, why? Or yeah, because they're interested. They're like, well, what the fuck, what does he want to know for? So that, that's how you get the instant response. In my experience, I've done a lot of them. Like I said, I got a PhD. I bought this course for a fucking reason. I know what to do. In my experience, it's the best message to send. Of course, not every girl's going to reply. But the ones who do, you've already, from the first question, raise some kind of intrigue because they want to know why you want to talk to them. They're a bit like, hmm, that's, that's interesting. So we're going to play through an example here of a girl. I'm going to look at it on my phone. We're going to put the graphics up in the video because we're fucking professionals, me and my boy James. So here's a very perfect example. Chick, a nine, hot. Bucharest, hey, yes. Then I, my, my reply, why do I never see you? Where are you hiding? Because once again, it's, it's some intrigue. It's an easy, women like easy conversation. What women don't want to do for a guy they don't know and have never met is think. If a woman has to sit there and go, what do I reply? They ain't gonna reply. If a woman looks at her phone and she hasn't got something instantly she wants to say, she ain't gonna say anything. Cause she has so many messages a day as a woman that if you don't get inspired to instantly type something back, you're not gonna type anything. So if you just say something boring, they'll look at it and leave you on read. You've got to write something that makes them instantly reply. So I said, why do I never see you? Where are you hiding? And the reason I say that in a very particular way is because it's extremely easy for them. 99% of them say, I'm not hiding. That's what nearly every one of them says. I'm not hiding. All of them. What did this bitch say? Let me check. I'm not hiding. Oh, no, she actually, this bitch said she was hiding. So there we go. I made myself look stupid. I'm hiding in work right now. Don't have much free time. Also notice I put cherries on there when I said, why? where are you hiding? Why did I put cherries? Who the fuck knows? Your guess is as good as mine, friend. It just makes my messages different because no one gets messages with cherries. If you motherfuckers start putting cherries in your messages, I'm gonna come over and beat the fuck out of you. It's my thing. Choose a different fruit. Anyway, they don't get messages with cherries. So it's like, the fuck cherries? When girls say to me, why do you put cherries on the messages? I, I always say, who doesn't like cherries? And they're like, LOL, true. So that's how you get out of the cherry thing. So if you choose strawberries and a bitch gets fresh out of the strawberries, you can say, well, who doesn't like strawberries? Fucking what the fuck? Strawberries are good. Calm yourself down. So that's what that is. I'm hiding in work right now. Don't have much time. I said, what work do you do? Break hearts. Look how fucking smooth I am. Look how smooth I am. So what I'm doing there, I need to shut the phone, is giving her a compliment. So the, there ain't no ugly bitches out there who are breaking hearts. Only hot girls break hearts. So what I'm basically saying is you're hot. But I'm saying it in a smooth operator kind of way because I'm a fucking G. So what do you do for work? Break hearts. I say that because it's a compliment. She replies, I do that in my free time. Smiley face. And I put, for fun. And then I would say, good thing I'm strong, I'm not afraid. So once again, I'm establishing some dominance there. I've given her a compliment, but I'm also letting her know I'm the fucking G. 
Like I said, everyone has to have their own unique style. I'm not saying to say exactly what I say. What I'm trying to explain to you is why I do it. I put the cherries because it makes my messages unique. I ask where they are. That's the one thing I would recommend everyone start with. If you want to fuck a girl and you're in fucking Grand Rapids, Michigan, go on Instagram, type in Grand Rapids, Michigan, see some dickhead hoes who have tagged themselves and message them and say, Grand Rapids, question mark. And go, why? Just say, oh, I never see you around. Where are you hiding? It's a good opener. That's the opener you can take, but the rest of it has to be you. You can't pretend to be anyone other than yourself. Impersonating someone else is not going to work in the long term. However, you got to be yourself. You got to be yourself in the right way. You can't just, you, you got to put things in the right angles. I'm explaining why I do what I do and you need to listen to it, understand why I'm doing what I do and apply it to your own style. Don't copy me word for fucking word. She says, a good thing I'm uh, strong, I'm not afraid. She goes, I'm just kidding, I'm not that bad to break hearts. Then what did I say? Then, then I asked her how old she was. I always ask how old they are. I don't know why, it's something they always seem to reply to. No matter what they say, whether it's 30 or fucking, and unless they're really young, if they're above 20, between the age of 20 and 30, if they're a teenager, I usually say, oh, you're young, I'm an old man. But if they're like whatever her age was, I don't think I've screenshot this properly. I say, that's a good age. You're old enough to have fun, yet young enough to be smart. No, no, sorry, young enough to have fun, but old enough to be smart. I always say that. Girls like that line. Because it makes them sound like, well, yeah, I'm 23. I'm old enough to be smart, but young enough to have fun. You ain't smart, bitch. You're dumb. But still, I say that. They like that shit. And I say, I'm a very old man. I'm 30. He goes, yes, I would like to stay forever at this age. Now, remember what I said earlier about 20 minutes ago in this video. We are always aiming for progression. This girl is now getting my attention. So far, this exchange has ha happened just about a minute, minute and a half long. Because once again, with women, they get bored quick. If I don't reply to her quickly, if I leave her for a couple hours and then try and message her again, she's going to, oh, she's forgot about me. She looked at my Instagram an hour and a half ago. She was a little bit intrigued. Now she's had six messages since from new guys and she's forgotten all about me. So progression, what am I aiming to do from the, what's the Instagram conversation? What's the progression? The progression is, because we're always giving our attention in, in, in exchange to progress up the ladder. I'm going to use my fucking whiteboard. Even though I don't have a green marker, you can barely see, I'm going to use it. We're progressing. We're starting here with all the other shit munchers. I don't know if you can see that. Here's where we want to be, at the top. Because with the shit munchers, there's lots of people. At the top, with their titties, there should be only one man. You. So you want to get higher up. As you get higher up, there's less and less shit munchers. Hope that makes sense. So on her Instagram, anyone can message her. There's loads and loads and loads of guys. So what we're aiming to do out of the Instagram conversation is get her WhatsApp or get her phone number. Now you're thinking, well, what's the difference between messaging her on Instagram and messaging her on her phone? The big difference is everyone can message her on Instagram, whereas only a few people can message her on her phone because not everyone has her fucking phone number, you dumb cunt. So by getting her phone number, we are progressing up and slowly limiting it to the number one dude at the top, which is you. So when you move from Instagram to phone number, you cut it down from the entire world being able to message her down to about 100 people, perhaps. That's a big jump. That is the aim of the Instagram conversation. Progression. From the phone number, we go on to the next stage, to the next stage, till eventually you end up with titties. That's how it works. So that's what we're trying to do in this conversation here is get her phone number. So where were we? That's a good age, old enough uh, to be smart and young enough to have fun. I said, I'm a very old man, I'm 30. Women like age. Women like you to be older than them. So do not be afraid to say your age. Uh, she goes, yes, I'd like to stay forever at this age. Time to make a joke because I'm so funny. I said, I can make you immortal. Jesus is my friend, I'll WhatsApp him. That's why I said. She put loads of laughing faces. She goes, if he doesn't respond, I'll give you his Instagram because he likes all my posts. And I put, I bet he does because you're beautiful and he's a pervert. Tongue face. So that's the second compliment I've given her. So she already thinks I'm funny. She's had a couple compliments. She's scrolled through my Instagram page by now. She's talking to me. This is about two minutes in. Two minutes. That's all we, I've spent two minutes of time on this girl. And what do I do? She goes, after I said she's beautiful, she goes, well, thank you. Next thing I say, WhatsApp, question mark. Straight to the point. Hello, this is who I am. You see my Instagram. You're beautiful. Ha ha ha, I'm funny. Give me your number. We ain't fucking around. We ain't playing no 
three days of messaging. Can I have your number, please? Like some fucking pussy. Two minutes. Two minutes of talk. You've seen me. You're replying to me. You know who the big G is. Give me your number. If at this point she goes, oh, I prefer to talk on Instagram. Do you know what you do? I'll tell you what you do. And you're going to hear this a lot. This is a very important pimping term. You can write this down on my board. In fact, I'm going to write this piece of paper so you understand how important it is. We're going to use this a lot. F. D. B. Which means, fuck that bitch. F. D. B. If she wants to give you bullshit, F. D. B. What you do, if she goes, I don't want to talk to you on WhatsApp, I'd rather talk to you on Instagram, you don't reply, you leave her ass on scene. Ignore her. F. D. B. I've shown you who I am, I've spoken to you, I've proved I'm fucking funny. If you're gonna give me your fucking phone number, I'll talk to someone else. F. D. B. Message a different girl. Because by not giving you her phone number, she's shit testing you. She's saying, yeah, I'll talk to you, but you don't deserve my number. And what you're doing by not replying is saying, I'll talk to someone else and fuck you. You can't say that to her because if you say it, then it shows you're emotionally upset. And if you get upset, then she wins because she's emotionally affected you. Men cannot be emotionally affected. Men are tired, can't affect us. You just don't reply because you don't care. You won't give me your number, okay, I don't care. Do not reply. And about 70% of the time, they'll still message you or say, oh, so you don't want to talk to me if you don't get my number or some shit. They'll come back at you and then you can play the game again. Just say, well, anyone can message you on, on Instagram. I'm special, so I want to WhatsApp you. Just be clear with your intention. She ain't going to give you the number, FDB. Because you're doing it. Remember, when you're talking to girls like this, you're not messaging one girl at a time. You can say Bucharest or Grand Rapids or text Houston or whatever to 100 girls. You can go on Instagram right now and message 100 girls. So you're going to be doing loads of conversations at once. So you're only interested in the ones who are going to play ball. If they ain't going to play ball and give you their number, FDB. So, in this particular case, we all know what happened. I don't know what we pretended. Fucking G got PhD. WhatsApp, yep, smiley face. What's your number? I'll put some cherries on there because I'm a G. Bang, I blocked out the phone number so none of you motherfuckers are going to be thinking about messaging my hoe. Bang, there's the number. Progression. We've moved from here to here. This can happen many, many different ways. I'll give you another example. There's another screenshot example, because this is what I do. Listen, I have too many girls, but if I want some chicks, I go on Instagram. I may, because I've got quite a few followers, I've got about 30,000. I'll scroll through girls who have already liked my pictures, because it's easier then, because then I know they definitely want dick. Bing, book or ask question mark. I'll, I'll message 10 girls, I'll get, five WhatsApps, I'll fuck two girls. That's the, the average math. So any Monday morning I can wake up and go, you know what, I want two new pussies this week. Book arrest, copy and paste, boom, 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 boom. Da, 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 WhatsApps, bang. WhatsApp, da, da, da. Me and Tristan call it Paul Cicero. We call it Ciceroing. It means Tristan, especially when our girlfriend's around, we say, I'll go, I'll go Cicero. And we do that because in, I think it's in Goodfellas. I can't remember what message, I can't remember what movie. It's one of the gangster movies. There's a guy called Paul Cicero. And he said, he doesn't move very fast because Paulie doesn't have to move for no one. Because he used to sit there and people used to come and deal with him and then leave. So me and Tristan call it, Paul, call it Ciceroing. So me and Tristan go, we're going to Cicero today. We'll go to a coffee shop at 3 o'clock. We'll have a date at 3.30, a date at 4.30, and a date at 5.30. We'll bring the girl in at 3.30 and then go, oh yeah, I've got to go now. I'm going to go in a minute. I'll just pay the bill. Okay, nice to see you. Send her away. Next, next, next. I'll do three dates in a fucking day. Narrow down the one I want. And then that's the one I take to the club at the weekend bangs game over. So you can get on that level if you get as professional as me. When you have a PhD, you literally just 10 questions on a Monday, Cicero on a Wednesday, fucking by Friday, game over. But that's just letting you know where you're going to end up if you, if you study hard enough. So next bitch, I'll give you a new example. Bucharest, question mark. This girl tried to play a bit harder with the G. She tried to play harder with the fucking... I should walk around, I should let these bitches know. I should put on my Instagram profile. PhD, so they know not to get too fresh. Bucharest, her reply was a lot less friendly than the last girl. Yes. Yes. Like I said, she probably read it. She probably has a fucking boyfriend. Or she's, even if she hasn't got a boyfriend, there is no female on this planet who's truly single. This is something that's one of the unbreakable rules. Put unbreakable rule in flashing red across the top. Unbreakable rule. There is no hot, attractive woman on the planet who is completely single. They are always at least talking to someone. 
They're always at least messaging someone or still kind of talking to their ex or fucking their ex. Or their, there's no single woman. So making a woman like you is not about making them like you. It's about making them like you more than the other people they're already talking to. Keep this in mind. So the reason this girl gave me attitude and the reason a lot of girls give you attitude is because they're already fucking someone else or they're already talking to someone else. So they're thinking, well, I already, if you're already full, you've been for dinner and you're full. Someone goes, do you want dessert? Oh, I'm already full. So that dessert has to look good for you to want to take a bite from it. So you have to look good for them to be interested in you because they're already full. They're full already. All the women are walking around with full stomachs. You got to look fucking amazing for them to want to take a bite. Keep that shit in mind. So this bitch, I found out at a later date, does have a boyfriend. Fucked her anyway. But this is why she started off so fresh. Book arrest. Yes. Same thing. Why do I never see you? Where are you hiding? That's what I said. She said, I don't go out too much. I don't like the men here. I was living in other countries or between travels, so no time or wish to be popular here. This is Romania. Oh, right. Okay. Well, I'm going to give you another example. This bitch knows me. She goes, I just followed you because uh, I saw you were very funny in an interview and you have some funny things on Insta. What did I say about having your page on point? So she, we've been messaging for 30 seconds and she's messaged me saying I had some funny things on Insta. I messaged her, she looked at my Instagram, she saw something that made her laugh or something that intrigued her. That's why it's important your five or six photos are interesting because that's your chance. If my photos were shit, I never would have got that message from her. Never would have come. It would have been game over right then and there. But she saw something she liked. So I said, where are you living now? Because she talked about how she didn't want to be in Bucharest. She goes, Bucharest at the moment. I said, good, it's the best city. I'm here also, which is important so we can meet and take over the world. I say that because women, it's authoritarian. It's authoritarian. You, uh, hi, yeah, you barely know me, but me and you are going to take over the world. It makes them think, who the fuck's this dude? He thinks he can conquer the world? Who is this guy? What do you mean, we're to conquer the world? What? It's better for a woman. It doesn't matter what emotion you evoke, as long as you evoke something. Even if they're a bit like, curious or a bit like what well, angry can work if you don't push it too far as long as they don't read it and think it's boring like i said if they read it and they don't feel instantly compelled to reply they won't reply this is your only shot so so when you say like we're going to take over the world they're like they're either going to be like what do you mean take over the world or why take over the world or what like there's something in they just go they just want to reply you've got to be careful with what you say ha ha i was thinking you already took over the world without me there's something left and the reason she said that is because my Instagram page is so fucking G with all these cars and shit. Once again, Instagram page. I said, there's a tiny, tiny bit that I need you for. There is one place I cannot go. And she said, what place? And I said, the girl's bathroom. Smiley face. How old are you? Always ask them how old they are. They like that shit. Childish joke, she put with a laughing face. But I didn't like that. That pissed me off a little bit. 22, you... 22 is probably a little bit too young to do the old enough to be smart, but you could probably get away with it. I just said, I'm an old man, 30. Now, when she said childish joke with the laughing face, that was the beginning of her trying to get a little bit fresh and I could detect it. And that's why I didn't reply with uh, uh, old enough to be smart, you know, young enough to have fun because I thought, I've been, I've been pretty funny to this girl. I made some jokes and she, I didn't like it. Now, to you, you're sitting there going, well, she just said childish joke. That's the problem. I have a PhD. I can detect instantly how a woman's thinking. So she looked, she thought I was interesting, da da da. And the main reason she's probably being this way is because she's insecure. She knows I have shitloads of chicks. She's seen my Instagram, she knows who the G is, and she's thinking, I gotta give this guy a bit of shit because he thinks he can get any girl he wants, da da da. I have this problem a lot. So then she tries to belittle me. Still a lot to learn and live for you. A real life for a man starts after 30, you'll see. So she's trying to tell me that I'm young and stupid. That's what she's trying to say. I replied. I know this, what's that? <laughs> I ain't fucking around with you, ho. Tell me about man life after 30. You're a 22 year old chick. What the fuck do you know about a man's life after 30? I know this, what's that? Because we are trying to progress. I ain't sitting here handing out attention. You've already shit tested me to a degree twice with your stupid ass answers. Telling me that I don't know anything about the world and telling them my jokes are childish. Give me your fucking number or FDB. Because I'm perfectly prepared to never talk to you ever again. I don't know you. I don't give a fuck. It's a numbers game. It's a, lo it's a loss. It's a loss. So a basis a waste. It's a waste of time for you to talk to me. But then she gave me her number. Here's my number. 
text me when you're 35. So she wanted to give me her number because she wants me, but she's trying to fucking give me shit, saying that's a waste of time. Da-da-da. I said, you think 30 is too young? She goes, I think you're into games and I don't like drama and complicate complications. So she's saying, so she's, you see, you can see now where I detected her bullshit way back at the childish joke and I started to reply less nicely. The reason I did that because if she gave me a little bit of shit and I still replied super nice, old enough to have fun, young enough to be smart, all this bullshit was, and cherries and was a nice guy all the time, she would have instinctively thought, well, I've given him some shit and he's still being nice about it. He's a pussy. When she gave me a bit of shit and I cut my replies down, I know this, what's that, that and start being a bit of a dickhead back, then she thought, okay, I can't push him too tough. Because she saw, listen to me carefully, watch this part of the video again. This is important dynamics. She tried to give me a bit of shit. I limited my attention. That's the weapon we have. That's what we do. We give attention to get sex. You fuck with us, we take our attention away. She got fresh. I limited my attention down. I still replied, but I removed the friendliness straight to the point. Teach her a lesson not to get too fresh. And then when I said, what's your WhatsApp? Even though she gave me shit, she still gave me her number. Because she knew if she didn't, I would. She knew that would be the end of it. But she still wants me. Of course she does. Who doesn't? So she's like, okay, well, I better give him my number, but I want to give him some sarcastic bullshit at the same time. She goes, you'll lose this waste of time if you talk to me. Here's my number, but text me when you're 35. So she gave me the number, but she fucking attached a bunch of shit to it. I said, you think 30 is too young? She said, I think you're into games. I don't like drama complications. So I said, so you want to judge someone who you've not even gotten to know? One second. So you want to judge someone who you've not even gotten to know? I can tell you're only 22. That's why I said. So she said, I'm young and stupid. But I said, oh, you're judging someone you don't even know. I can tell you're 22. So I'm calling her young and stupid. Flip it on the hoe. You think I'm young and stupid? You're the one making judgments. I ain't judge you, bitch. I don't know you. She replied, I don't judge you. I said, well then. You don't know if I'm drama or games. Be nice. I'll WhatsApp you. And she replied, okay, smiley face. That's the game. She tried to get fresh to me two or three times. I ended up with the WhatsApp. The bitch has been put in place. She sent me a little smiley face at the end. She now knows that she can't judge me, even though I've got girls all over my Instagram and I'm clearly a player. She ain't allowed to say it anymore. I put that bitch in her fucking place. But I didn't take her shit. When she called me childish, and I would have been like, yeah, I am childish, hello, oh, you're so pretty, here's a heart. Game would have been over. You fuck with me, I'll reduce my attention. Give me a pen. This is the Tower of Power. Attention. This is a girl behaving. I know you love my graphics. This is a girl being a dickhead. Dick. This is the attention meter. If they are a dickhead, you reduce your attention. If they behave well, you increase your attention. If they reply nice things to you, you message them lots of nice things. If they reply bullshit dickhead stuff to you, you cut your attention right down. But remember, stay emotionless. Never insult a woman. Never get angry. Because if you, if you get angry or you insult them, it shows they've emotionally affected you and then they win. It's just an attention scale. There is no emotion. There's no anger. There's no resentment. There's nothing. Even if a girl says you're fucking ugly, they can never give my number, you're too ugly. You just reduce your attention. Simple as that. Attention scale. They reply like dickheads, you give them dickhead answers. They reply nicely, you give them nice answers. Keep the shit in line to keep the bitch in check. That's how it goes. So I can show you 200 examples of this. In fact, I could go on forever because this is basically all I do. But this is just a couple examples of how you can, right here and now, after this PhD course, start talking to new girls you never spoke to before. Fix your fucking Instagram and start messaging the city you live in, and the girl. Now, if you've got a level of game like I've got, you can do other cities. So if I know I'm going to be in Kiev next week, I'll do Kiev in advance. I can do that because I'm a fucking G. For you amateurs, I'd recommend just wherever you are, stick in your own city, message, ask them where they are, blah, blah, blah. Start with there. On to the next thing after I take a piss. Right. Congratulations. You've got the girl's phone number. You've progressed from every shit muncher in the world to the exclusive club of people who have her phone number. Everything we are doing is for progression. You give attention for progression. Getting her phone number is just one step closer. You are now aiming for the next goal, which is a date with the girl. You are not getting her phone number to give the bitch unlimited attention for no reason. You're not giving her getting her phone number just to text and text away for fucking weeks on end and get nowhere. 
You're not doing that shit. You're aiming to take her on a date. That's the next stage on the Tower of Power. Date. So, texting a chick. You have to be yourself. You can't be me. There's only one me. But there's only one you. It's a motivation shit for you. So you've got to be yourself. But, the basic rules still apply. You don't take shit. You're a nice guy. But you're not a fucking pushover little piece of shit wimp. In general, generalization. In fact, it's not generalization. It's absolute truth. Everybody loves to talk about themselves. Everybody loves to talk about themselves. So although you need to get some intrigue, remember you work for Starbucks, you're a fucking Starbucks spy who's putting your fucking cousin through fucking college or some shit. You need to ask her about herself. What do you do? Do you work or study? Oh, da -da -da. so work or study is what I use a lot. Do you work or study? Oh, I'm studying economics. Ah, you like money. Who doesn't? Or, oh, I'm studying law. Perfect, you can get me out of jail. Whatever they say, add a little thing on it. Oh yeah, I can get you out of jail. Shut up, you do shit, you're useless. Still, ask them a lot about themselves. Whatever you do, every single thing has to come from a position of dominance. So for example, the I'm putting my cousin through college thing. You can't message a girl and go, oh, well, I don't have much money right now because I'm putting a girl my cousin through college. That's not dominant, that's bullshit pussy. If she were to mention something about money, you could say, or let's go here, say, oh, that's too expensive for me, I'm putting my cousin through college. Wait for her to mention something first. Or say, I'd rather put my cousin, I'm putting my cousin through college, it ain't easy, but I'd rather help family than, than spend money at the moment. Put it from a position of dominance. Like, yeah, own it. You're the fucking man. Everything you do, you're the fucking man. Do girls say to me, I've seen your Instagram page, you have all these girls, yeah? I'm the fucking man, yeah. I'm the man. Doesn't matter what it is. I'm the man. Would you work at Starbucks? Yeah, I'm fucking. I'm the head of Starbucks spy operation. MI6. I'm James fucking Bond of Starbucks. So fucking of course I work at Starbucks. I'm the best. I'm a fucking. I'm like basically an undercover agent. You gotta own that shit. There's a fine line between arrogance and owning it. Don't be too arrogant. But you gotta own that shit. Most people think girls like arrogance. They don't. They just like men who own their things. You can actually own who you are and be confident in who you are without being arrogant. That's how you get laid. Not being arrogant. Arrogant pisses them off. It's just being confident with who you are and what you do. Without being arrogant. So keep that shit in mind. You're texting her. Rules for texting her. Do not double text her. If she ignores you once, leave it maybe a day, day and a half. Then try again. Hey, how you been? Da, da, da. If she ignores you again, game over. Forget about her. In fact... I want to mention something quickly, but I was going to mention later, but I'm going to mention it now. The whole fucking time you're starting with Instagram, texting, the whole way through, there's something you have to keep in mind. There's something called external factors that you cannot control. Sometimes you just can't win. I've had girls who I've, I've tried something on and it completely ignored me. And then six months later, I tried the same thing and it worked flawlessly. Why is that? Because the first time it didn't work has nothing to do with me and my system. It's because there's external factors you cannot control. Every girl you're messaging has a life. If that girl is completely head over heels in love with someone else, she's not going to reply to you. If her granddad's just died, she ain't interested in going on a date with you. If her dog's just died or she's just fucking, or she's failing her homework, maybe she's suicidal, maybe she's overdrawn, who the fuck knows? There's a whole bunch of external shit you cannot control. So you have to keep in mind, the reason it's a numbers game is because there's too many external factors that can influence the end result. I'm talking about fucking girls. Great. Great, exactly. There's too many external factors that you cannot control that have an influence. So when I say something like, don't double text her, text her once. If she doesn't reply again, don't te text her again. If she doesn't reply, don't be one of those guys, oh, you gave me your number, don't get upset. Don't be a fucking little bitch. Don't start messaging her, why'd you give me your number? You're not gonna talk. Don't be a little fucking pussy. Don't sit there and be like, oh, I'm upset. Emotionality is not how men act. You do not care if she replies or not. Do not be a bitch because it could be an external factor. Maybe your game is flawless and on point. Maybe her granddad just died, bro. You don't know and I don't know. Nobody knows. If she doesn't want to text you, it's fine. Start again with someone else. Do not be start messaging her. Why'd you give me your number if you're not going to reply? And being a little fucking loser because then she definitely ain't going to fuck you. Then she'll reply and call you a dickhead and then the game's over. What's the point in that? Don't be a fucking idiot. So don't do that shit. So, rules to texting girls. Don't double text. Told you to double text in rules. Next, only message women at night. Do not message during the day. During the day, they're busy, they're working, and they're certainly not thinking about a relationship. Women are one-tracked. 
Women cannot do... Women can multitask. No, they fucking can't. That's a lie. Men multitask. So if a woman's at work or she's busy or she did it, she ain't sitting there thinking, I really want a boyfriend. She's thinking, I really want a boyfriend at night, at home, on the couch, in bed, unless she's with some other dude, which she might be. It's very often that she might be with another guy. Well, the girl, girl, I guarantee right now you're texting a girl who you really like and she's still banging someone else. Normal. It's the world we live in now. Ooh, and she's texting me back. Yeah, she's probably fucking some other dude. So that's the world we live in. Anyway, text girls at night. They're more susceptible to flirtatious notions at night because they're fucking sitting around thinking about a relationship or they're more at home. They're comfy. They're watching bullshit on TV. They're more susceptible to the kind of conversation you want to be having. Do not message girls during the day. It just doesn't work as well. Unless you know the girl really well or you've already met her before or she's your girlfriend or some shit. In general, with the new girls, you want to message them at night. I know you're thinking, well, if I get her number and then I don't message her all the way till the night, don't be a little pussy. When you first get her number, say, hey, it's me. Cherries, strawberry, whatever. Oh, hey, how are you? Say, yeah, I'm really good. I'm just about to drive. I'm going to message you in a bit. Say something like that, Ben. Don't explain yourself. Don't say, oh, I'm just about to do this and this and this and this. No, I'm about to drive. Or I've got a bit of work to do. Or I'm fucking, I'm going to shoot someone in the head. I'll be right back. Keep it vague and just fucking hit her up at night. That's when you text girls. When you're texting the bitch, you should be texting her for maximum two days before you arrange a date. Maximum two days. If you're texting a girl for fucking a week and a half and she still won't meet you, FDB. We do not have time to waste, gentlemen. We have PhDs. We ain't out here giving away our attention for girls who won't even meet us for a fucking coffee. Because if you're texting her for a week and she won't meet you, she's getting attention and she ain't giving you anything back. She's not allowing you to progress up the Tower of Power and she's taking all your attention for no reason, which devalues your attention. You're hyperinflating yourself. And the girl is sitting there thinking, well, he'll text me all the time whether I fucking meet him or not. My super lovely brother. Hello? Hello? Filming. Yeah. No idea. I'm filming my PhD course. Right. Leave that in there. I like it. Anyway, so you ain't giving your attention for no reason because here's why. Let me tell you a fucking amazing mind-boggling fact for most of you motherfuckers. If you've got a girl's number and you play it right, even if she ain't replying, sooner or later you might fuck her anyway. It's like build, it's like if, you, if any of you ever worked in sales, I used to work in sales. You build up leads and people go, nah, maybe next year, maybe next year. And then eventually you have all these old leads you've been talking to for, a, for ages and ages and you start just landing sales easily. Girls are the same. But that won't happen if you fuck it up. So if you're giving out all your attention too easily, the girl, you're hyper reflecting your attention and the girl will lose respect for you and she'll never fuck you. Even if she continues to text you, you think you're getting somewhere. We've been texting for three weeks and she's replying to me every time I think, we were texting for three weeks. During those three weeks, she's fucked someone else, bro. Or she's definitely been on a date with someone else. She hasn't been at home. She ain't that busy. Oh, I'm just busy. No one's that fucking busy. Don't we'll believe that shit for a second. She's probably met me, sucked on my big balls, and replies to you when I don't text her because she's upset. That's what's happening. Don't fucking fall for the tricks. She's losing respect for you. What you need to do is keep the value on your attention because even if she, if you're texting her and she doesn't want to meet you, fine, FDB. You can text her again in a few months. Oh, hey. How you been? She go, oh yeah, this is the guy. I remember this guy. Yeah, yeah. But he wouldn't, he wouldn't just text me for a whole bunch of time for no reason. He wouldn't just text me for no reason because I wouldn't meet him. Then when you say, let's go for coffee, she'll remember the last time I said no, he stopped texting me. Oh, okay, let's get a coffee. Because she knows she cannot have your attention for free. Keep your attention valuable. Do not devalue yourself for any female because you will definitely not get them. You stand a better chance getting them, keeping your attention valuable and being patient. Patience, gentlemen, is how you get to a lot of these girls. And if you're talking to enough girls, you don't care. I'm happy to wait six months to fuck a girl because I got something to fuck today and tomorrow and the day after and the rest of my fucking life. So I don't care if I bang you now or in six months. It doesn't matter. Who cares? Patience. So, text her at night. You're aiming for the day. One or two days, then you say. Now, you do not ask girls to go on dates. You tell girls to go on. If you've ever asked a woman anything, you'll know that they're pretty shit at deciding. Would you like to maybe go have some time, some... What a pussy ass are you? Would you like to maybe? Fucking losers. Listen. Who gives a fuck if she wants to or not? 
And if you say sometime, sometime opens up the fucking window for the friend zone. Like you, sometime is a fucking ticket to the friend zone. Yeah, we'll go out sometime. What, fucking 2019? 2025? Sometime? Sometime can mean we're all dead. Sometime can be the end of the fucking planet Earth. There is no sometime. You tell her. When, so you can either say, when we having coffee, which is a forceful ask, or you can say, we're going for coffee soon. That's what I always say. Talk, 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 talk. Yeah, yeah, blah, 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 blah. How you been? Da, da, da. Like I said, don't text them during the day. I text them one evening. Talk to them a bit. Da, 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 da. Say good night. Don't over text them either. Don't over text them. Fucking you text them a little bit, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, it's enough. Okay, yeah, all right, I've got something to do. Never say you're going to bed. Another thing. Like I told you with the bakery thing, I've got so much fucking knowledge in my brilliant brain, it's actually difficult for me to put it linearly. So you have to watch this video over and over again, whatever. Never say you're going to bed. Going to bed is emasculate. Cowards need sleep. Oh, I'm, oh, I'm texting you, you beautiful girl, but I'm tired. So I'm tired, I'm going go to bed. You know what I like to say at fucking quarter past one in the morning? I'm going to work. Work? At this time, money never sleeps, baby. I'm going to fucking work. Then I go to bed. It's fine. But the point is, she said, they're going, work? What do you do? I'll tell you in person. That's why I say. Just another little thing to add towards the day. So don't say you're going to sleep. So never over text a hoe. Text her for 30 minutes or so, da da da. And then you've got something to do. I've got to go to work. You work night shift? I work 24, 25 hours a day, eight days a week, bitch. I'm getting paid. So you gotta say things, I'm a G. So keep the intrigue there, that's back to the intrigue. So two nights I've been texting a girl, I'll say, we're going for coffee soon. They'll usually reply, 99% of the time, yeah, sure, or yeah, we are, or something, da, da, da. If they reply some dumb shit like, are we, and try and shit test you, you know what you say? Because you're a full grown man with clear intentions, you say, yes, we are. And she goes, what if I don't want to? You know what you reply to that? Nothing. You want to play games? We've been talking for two days. You don't want to meet me for coffee? The attention drops to zero. Fuck you. Let her sit there and look. Waiting for that reply. Doesn't come. Most of these hot bitches don't get ignored. Hot girls do not get ignored. It fucks with their brain. No one ignores hot girls because hot girls are too so valuable, they've never been ignored. Let them sit there and go to sleep and go, oh, he'll text me tomorrow. Next day, fuck, he still ain't texting me. Then you'll start to notice they start to like your Instagram pictures. So to like your pictures, like every picture. Why should she like your pictures? To try and get your attention again. Because your attention is now valuable. Your attention has gone down to zero. It's scarce. It's like gold. It's hard to find. Where's the attention gone? Start liking your Instagram pictures. Then maybe if they start, if they make that first move, like liking your Instagram pictures or they ask how you are or something, then you can talk to them again, of course. You'd be like, oh, hey, yeah, sorry, been working. Or say, hey, sorry, been busy. I was out at coffee. I like to say that one. Because they're like, well, you invited me for coffee. Did you invite another girl for coffee? Then they'll say, what, with another girl? I say, of course not, dear. Sarcastic, which, which means yes, but I also said no, so they can't complain about it. Careful with your language. So fucking flip it on the bitch. Sorry, I was out at coffee. Talk to her again, da, 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 another couple days, invite her. If she doesn't come the second time, that's the basic rules of the game. Progression. You are not texting her to be your fucking friend or to make sure her phone fucking works. Some dumb shit. Progression. Date. Now you're on the dating stage. Dating is hard for me to coach because really in reality, this is something that has to happen in person. If any of you guys out there have any kind of serious income, message me. I want to put together a, a, a three-day thing where I bring you to me, or I come to you, probably bring you to me. We hit the streets, we do the Instagram thing, we get some dates, we organize those with dates, and you can see how I do it, and you can see in real life. Then you're gonna learn a next level game. If you're interested in that, email me. But in general, on a date, these are all things you would have heard before. Be confident, not overconfident, be confident. Let her talk about herself, pretend to give a fuck. Keep the intrigue there, don't overstay. This is the most important thing. The last thing you can do to a woman is bore her. It's better to cut a date short and her at the most interesting point than bore her. Imagine you have a movie and the end of the movie is shit. Or the movie, okay, imagine you have a movie. It's an okay movie, but it's five hours long. But after an hour and a half, it's super interesting. What's gonna happen? If you cut the movie off there, the person really, really wants to see the end of that movie. 
If you let the movie play to the end, okay, it was an okay movie, but they know what happens. No, the first date should be short. And for that reason, that's why I always organize a coffee date because coffee is short. Coffee's 15, 20 minutes, max. All you're trying to do with the first date is prove you're a real person. You look like your pictures. You're not a fucking psycho. You're not gonna stab her. And to break the wall of real person from guy online. That's the only real goal of the first date. You're not trying to bang on the first date. You can bang on the first date, but that's a different kind of date. That's like, if I have loads of girls and I've, I've got to the texting stage and me and Tristan are going to the club one night, I'll text all of them. Hey, I'm in the club tonight. Uh, I know we've not met, but come, it's gonna be really fun. There's lots of people here. I say there's lots of people so they don't feel like it's creepy. And we just, and, and then you bring them to the table, get them drunk, bang. You can bang them first date that way. Me and Tristan have a little saying called, the only thing better than double booking is triple booking. And the reason we have that saying is because one time Tristan texted all those girls and two of them turned up, but we have PhDs. So he fucked them both. He fucked one and then a couple weeks later, fucked the other one anyway. So these two girls who have been texting turned up and I texted all my girls and three turned up. And when I was drunk, I turned to Tristan and said, the only thing better than double booking is triple booking. And we both laughed and we both fucked because we're Jays. So that's the club game. But if you're just doing a coffee thing, you just want a short date to introduce yourself. Short, snappy. I'm an interesting person. I'm a real person. I'm not a creep. And another thing you need to do is, especially in the modern world is, you need to fucking check for these catfish, bro. There's girls I'm talking to on Instagram who are tens, and I turn up and they're sevens. Now, I know that doesn't bother you because all you do is fuck sevens. I fuck tens. So if I'm putting energy into a ten and I turn up and she's a fucking seven, I get pissed off. You guys are probably fucking happy as hell to have a seven. I ain't. So you also got to check that the girl, the girl's got to fucking prove herself too. These girls live in catfish land. Sometimes you're sitting there texting away with your hard dick, thinking she's something special, and she turns up and she's basic anyway. Most of you guys are getting upset and worried about basic ass hoes. These chicks are basic. So the first date is good because sometimes they might be below your standard. You might want to get rid of them quickly. I've had dates before where they've turned up and go, I don't want to bang her. Coffee. Oh yeah, coffee. Oh yeah, what do you do? Yeah, work, study. Okay, yeah. Yeah, we'll see each other again. Okay, bye. If you organize a big thing, we'll go for dinner and coffee and then and we'll go for dinner and movies and then all this bullshit. How do you get rid of her? Maybe you, maybe you want to get rid of her. Maybe she's annoying. Maybe she's a vegan. Who knows? Coffee. It's quick. It's to the point. You can get rid of her quick within 15 minutes. You can stay 45 minutes if you want, make her interested in you, build her intrigue, make her want to see you again. Do not overplay it. Do not sit there and talk for hours about your job and your pets. She doesn't fucking care. She only cares about herself because she's a woman. Ask her questions about herself. Don't give her any real answers on you. Keep your shit vague, but be interesting. Be a little bit funny, a little bit smart. Be confident. 45 minutes, da da da. Okay, yeah, we'll have to meet again soon. Bang, bang, bye. That's the goal of the first date. After the first date, then the texting game goes into next level. Now I'm not saying you can message her, I'm gonna fuck you in your ass. Obviously you can't do that. But at this point, she's met you, she knows what you look like, she knows you're a real person. If she's replying to you, you can be quite, when I say direct, I don't want you fucking losers being creepy. Don't be creepy. But you're adults. There's now no reason for you to be texting unless you're gonna fuck. Why are you texting? She knows who you are, she's met you. If she's replying to you, she likes you. So it has to be going, you're progressing, you've done the date, now you've got basically, now you're basically talking about adult things. And there's no reason to be texting otherwise. If you, if, if you text her and she doesn't wanna talk about adult things, then what the fuck are you talking to her for? She's met you, she knows what you look like, and she doesn't wanna talk about adult things and she doesn't wanna fuck you, so. Simple, you're at that point now. So I'll say things like, after the first date, I'll say things like, hey, we up to, oh, I'm just in bed, da 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 Yeah, uh, yeah, I've, I've just finished work, da 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 some bullshit. Um, but you have to be careful. I'm saying this because most of you motherfuckers aren't as smooth as me. Don't, don't be creepy. You gotta be to the point with like why you're texting. You should know where I'm coming from with that. So don't say anything creepy and weird, but just be to the point. Just say, yeah, I'm out working. I'm gonna work all night tonight probably. Oh, you're gonna work all night? Yeah, I'm not gonna sleep till you're with me. Some bullshit like that, but just kind of smooth with it. LOL, might be a long time then. I'm Superman, I don't need sleep. I don't give a fuck, I'll wait. That can just be cool with it, but just make it clear. Start talking about adult themes. If she's still replying, everything's good. From there, couple days, organize second date, and from there it's game over. You should know what to do from there. Then you organize a proper date at night, Dinner's a bit formal. 
Movies is always a no because you can't talk. Movies are an easy one because you don't have to talk to the girl, but then also you don't get to really get anywhere because you don't talk to the girl. So movies are bad. Dinners, I don't really like dinners. I like drinks. And I actually like to keep it super informal. So I'm lucky I have my brother, but formal situations make things awkward. So if I'm gonna bring a girl out for drinks, I'll say, oh yeah, we're gonna get some drinks. My, my brother and some people are there, just come along. If there's other people around, they feel it's less like you and me and sitting down and we're drinking or talking. You don't need that intimate shit. You talk one-on-one -on, -one on WhatsApp all the time. You can just bring her into a fun environment. Now, if all your friends are dickheads, you can't do that because your friends need to know the game as well. Your friends have to make sure they never hit on your girl. They never interrupt or try and talk to your girl when it's your job to be talking to her. Your friends need to participate towards getting you laid. If you have good quality friends, it's easier. So I'll give you a very quick example. Like me and Tristan are fucking smooth. So if I have a girl on a bang, so I have a 10. I've met her, she's a 10, bang, 10. I say, come for some drinks. I say, Tristan, I wanna close this one tonight. We'll go, all right, cool. Tristan will bring one of his girls who he's already fucking. And his girl knows the game. So not only do I have Tristan as a wingman, I've got a female wingman. So like, for example, we go out, the girl turns up, da, 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 the girl's saying, oh yeah, I've known Andrew ages. Yeah, these brothers are so fun. She, they took me here, they took me there. My girl's listening to this girl going, what, she gets to fuck with these guys and she went there and well, her life's great. Well, I want to be like, I want these things. And then was drinking, drinking, drinking. And if I say, oh, come back to my place, it's creepy. If the girl goes, let's go back to your house. Your house is fun. Then the other girl will be like, oh, okay. The girls want to go back to, it's so easy if you have a fucking chick. So this is what I'm saying. If your friends are dickheads, it's hard. I've got a fucking support team, which are ironclad. I know if I bring Tristan and one of his female soldiers, I do not fail. Getting back to the house is going to be guaranteed by the girl. The girl is going to say how great her life is. It's just so fucking, I don't even do anything. I don't even do, I sit there on Twitter calling you all idiots. I don't do shit and I still get late. So if you have a good group of friends who aren't fucking pricks and what you have to understand is that most of you watching this are pricks yourselves. You're losers yourselves, which means your friends are losers. But if you're going to bring a girl around, you've got to be clear with your friends. They can't be like the ba like banter. For example, if my boy were to bring his friend, a girl, I would never like jokily insult him or something. Oh, well, he fucking, he, do you know, like all the dumb guy shit you do, calling a guy a loser or calling a guy this or that. You can't do that. If, if a guy's bringing a girl, he's trying to get laid. Your friends shouldn't be insulting you, even as a joke. Your friends shouldn't be trying to talk to your girl. Your friends should just be there to make some noise, to break down the monotony of a formal situation. Say hi, be polite offer her a drink or whatever, and that's it. So if your friends aren't dickheads, I'd actually recommend on the last day to make it a group kind of thing. If your friends aren't dickheads, if your friends are dickheads, they'll be detrimental. So you have to sit here and look and think, do I have good friends or idiot friends? Because if you were to come out with your girl and me and my girl, you'd be getting laid. So if your friends are good, do that. If not, if it's just you and her, it's fine. But if you've got friends around, make it informal. Yeah, we'll have some drinks, da -da -da. come out, have some drinks, have a laugh, da -da -da -da. never kiss at the end of the date on the second date. Don't kiss her at the end, because kiss, the kissing at the end, then you want to fuck her, but it's the end of the day, we've just kissed, it's a bit weird. Kiss her early on, don't be a pussy. The day, let's say she turns up eight o'clock for drinks. By 8.45, you should have at least kissed her. That's what I do. Turns up at eight, drink, gin and tonic, whatever, blah, talking shit, Tristan's there, blah, talking shit, everyone's laughing, having fun, da 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 Give her a kiss at 8.45. Then, then she's got her hand on your leg by fucking 9.30. Then by the time it's fucking 12.30, she wants dick. Because she's been comfortable with you. She's kissed you. She's hung out with you a few hours since. She's been touching you a bit. Now she's comfortable enough to fuck. If you try and kiss her at 12.30, we're about to go home now, kiss. Want to come to my place? It's too romantic model movie PS I love you bullshit. It ain't real. It's too formal. Don't do that. Kiss her in 45 minutes, have a laugh, keep drinking, have a joke, keep put her hand, hold her hand or put her hand on your leg, talk some shit, da, da 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 kiss her again, blah, blah, blah. By the time it's time to go, she'll want to fuck. And you don't ask her, you just take her. Just take her. Don't ask her if she wants to come to yours. Ask her if she wants to go home. So when the taxi turns up, I go, we're going to mine. And unless she goes, no, I want to go home. If she goes, okay, you want to go home, no problem, cool. You want to go home, all right, cool, we'll get you a taxi. Never take her in the same taxi. She doesn't get, you don't ride with me if you're not coming to my house. I ain't getting in my taxi, out of my way to drop you off. And I was like, okay, cool, I'll get you a car.
Uber, bang. Yeah, kiss. All right, yeah, see you next time, bang. Nothing wrong with that. Maybe I'll fuck her the day after. Some girls are like that. It's no problem. But if you get in my car, come into my house. We're going to mine. Oh, really? Yeah, we're going to mine. Get, get in. Okay. Women like to be led. They don't like to be asked. If you ask a woman what she wants to eat, she doesn't know. Oh, I don't know. They want to be told what to do. Come with me. If she says no, that's perfectly fine. Remember, you're not a fucking psycho. I don't want any of you motherfuckers getting rape charges and the police finding this video and coming after me for it because I ain't done nothing fucking wrong to anybody. Just saying. You're clear. I'm going, we're all going to mine. Or I'm going to mine, you're coming with me. Oh no, I really want to go home. No problem. You do not ask twice. Oh, I really think you should come to mine. That's submissive and pathetic. No, you're not pathetic. You're a fucking full grown man. I want to go to mine. No problem. And in fact, a lot of the time, they don't like that. Because sometimes women are trying to play hard to get. Oh, well, maybe I should go home. Okay, you want to go home? No problem. We'll get you a car. We'll get you a car. We'll get you a taxi. Oh, oh, oh well, I was just thinking I, I, need, I need my things. Then they'll try and back out of it with the I was just thinking. So, all right, well, we're going to mine. You don't need your things. You want to come? Okay. Done. You, you, but as soon as they say they want to go, go, yeah, give them what they want. It's the takeaway. Trump said, know when to walk away from the table, the art of the deal. Walk away from the deal. Deal is go to my house. Oh, you want to play games? All right, you're not allowed to come. Okay, we'll, we'll take you home. We'll take you home. We're going to go party. We're going to take you home. They don't want to miss out. Oh, okay. I was just thinking I don't have a phone charger. I have a phone charger. What phone you got? Samsung? Oh, I've got a Samsung charger. No, you don't. No one has a Samsung charger. Who cares? Yeah, I've got one in the house somewhere. Come on. Bang. Done. If she was, no, I really want to go home. Cool. Sort your car. Bang. All right, maybe see you again. Bang. Kiss. Bye. Do another date. Maybe it takes three or four dates. You motherfuckers aren't smooth as me. By date two, I'm fucking. I'm a G. You guys aren't smooth as me. So you need some more time. If she wants to go home, it's no problem. You haven't got FDB. It's all good. See her again. Keep texting her. Keep working it. You'll get there in the end. When you're as smooth as me, day two, game over. I don't have girls saying no to come to my house. Maybe, so I've had girls come to my house and not fuck. That happens. But they always come to the house. So that's the basic progression. So I told you in this video, I'm not going to tell you anything about getting a Lambo and getting in shape because you know all that shit. I'm telling you about things you can do right here, right now to improve your game. So, Instagram, progress, do a graphic. Instagram, progress, WhatsApp, progress, coffee date. More texting, serious date, aiming to close. That is the system. Now, tower of power here. Wipe on my King Cobra t-shirt, fuck it. Right, now we're gonna talk about, next, talk about how you're gonna get dates. We're gonna talk about, cold hard truth of these females. Truth is this. There's no such thing as a perfect woman. If you want a woman who is perfect for you, you must build her to be perfect for you. A woman who is understanding and kind and who respects you does not exist unless you force her to be that way. And when I say force, I don't mean that in a horrible way. I mean in a simple, there's no other option. Like Walter always takes the easiest path through the rocks. The woman must learn that her man is fucking an iron mountain and the easiest path is to obey. Any other kind of resistance simply doesn't work. That's how you have to be. But some women are more moldable than others. You have, I call it blueprints. You have good blueprints and bad blueprints. So you have, I, I with my skill level, can make any female do as I say. And I say that with absolute conviction. I've never met a woman who will not do the basics of what I say. Bring me coffee, turn up where I tell her to, listen to me, not talk to other men. Basic things. But some are better blueprints than others. So when you read these books, these red pill books and all this bullshit and talk about BPD and all that bollocks. Firstly, let's do a very side subject on BPD. Like I said, I'm talking about bakery masterclass. My brain is full of information. BPD ain't fucking real. And the reason it ain't real is because all these red pill guys talk about borderline personality disorder. If the girl doesn't listen to you or the girl acts this way, she's got borderline personality disorder. Every single hot chick in the world has BPD. How can you be 16 years old with 100,000 followers on Instagram and full grown men giving you unlimited attention for no reason? All the way up until you're 25 for nearly 10 years, men going out of their way, breaking down, crying in voice notes, being complete little pussies, doing anything you tell them to do. How can you live that life and not have an ego or a borderline personality disorder? 
every single hot chick, and trust me, I've fucked more than you, to a degree, has something fucked up in their head because the attention they're getting is off the fucking scale. Men have made women have BPD. Luckily, there's men like me out here who puts them back in fucking check. So BPD ain't real. So get that shit out of your head. If a girl ain't listening to you, it's either because you're game shit or because of external factors. Maybe her granddad just died. She doesn't listen to you right now. Doesn't mean she has BPD. Get that whole excuse out of your head. It ain't a real thing. So, you have good blueprints and bad blueprints. Some women are more susceptible to being molded. Some women have better values than others. I do agree with what the Red Pill books say that if a woman's fucked lots of men, she's not as good a mold as a woman who's fucked less men. That's true. And the reason for that is because if a woman's fucked lots and lots and lots of guys, they don't have a stigma attached to getting a new dick. So when times get hard, or you tell them to do something they don't want to do, they think, oh, I'll just fuck someone else then. They're, more, they're less loyal. They're more likely to run off and leave if they've slept with lots of men than if they've only slept with a few men. If you're their second guy or first guy ever, they don't want to give up on you that easy. So if you say, stop texting this dude, they're more likely to do that than if a girl slept with 20 guys. She'll go, I'll just text this dude and find a new guy to fuck. So that is true. So you have good blueprints and bad blueprints. Now I can tell you, just like I did with the, how many men they slept with, I can tell you a hundred different reasons, what makes a good blueprint, what makes a bad blueprint, da, da, da. I could waste loads of time, or I could just give you the fucking instant, easy to tell, iron breakable test. This test tells you concrete if a woman is good quality or bad quality. Here's how. Sip of coffee. The test happens after you sleep with her. Now, if you're sitting here thinking, why do I have to sleep with a woman first to see if she's good or not? Because that's how it really goes. Because that's when you really know a girl. Until you sleep with a girl, it's all just front. The games, it's all just bullshit. It's just who they want to be. It's them pretending. It's after you sleep with them, you see the real them. So you're going to have to fuck a whole bunch of girls to get a good one. If you're, let's say it's your job to find the best apple in the world. And you have three apples. And you say, this apple is the best apple in the world. And another guy has a thousand apples. And he says, this apple is the best apple in the world. Who knows more about apples? Who's more likely to have chosen an exceptional apple? The man who has more apples, the thousand apple guy knows more about apples than the three apple guy. If you want to understand women, I know what I know because I fucked so many women. I've had smart ones, stupid ones, hot ones, hot ones, no at least, but you know. I've had them all. So I know I knew through experience. So if you're sitting there going, oh, I have to fuck a whole bunch of girls to find a good one, and you're worried about that, then you're a pussy. Yeah, you're gonna fuck. In the modern world, for every five girls you fuck, one will be a good quality woman. So what? Go fuck five girls and get one. What's the problem? You're afraid to use your dick, you little pussy? Get it done. So, that's the reality. Sometimes you get lucky. You can fuck one girl and you can tell she's a good girl right away. It happens. But sometimes I fuck three, four girls in a row and they've all just been trash hoes. That's how it goes. That's how it goes. Sometimes you fuck three girls in a row and they're all fucking nice. And I know that from this ironclad test. This ironclad test tells me. So I'm telling you, you cannot tell. I don't care when you're texting some girl and you're sitting there with your little fucking penis twitching like a little bitch sitting there late at night, WhatsApping away. This girl, oh, she's so beautiful. You're looking at her Instagram. You're texting her. She seems so nice and so sweet. She ain't shit. She ain't shit. And you don't know if she's quality or not until you slept with her. So don't get emotionally attached to some girl you haven't fucked because you don't know anything about her until you sleep with her. And here is how you tell. After you sleep with a girl, your attention goes to nearly zero. Attention goes right down. Here's why. We give attention to get the sex. Like my perfect drawing. We've had the sex now. We've had it. We've had what we wanted. So the attention has to drop instantly to set a standard for the relationship. And the relationship standard is as follows. You better be nice to me. You better fuck me when I want you to. You better do as you're told to get my attention. Otherwise, it's staying down here. You have now won the game. Until you sleep with a woman, she's in charge. She's the gate. She's the lock you're trying to break. Once you've slept with her, you are now in charge. 
and what most men do after they fuck a girl, is instantly give away their position of power. You are finally, for the first time since you've messaged this girl on Instagram, in the position of power. You're above her now because you fucked her. And if you fuck her and never talk to her again, then she's a stupid slut. And she doesn't want that. She wants you to want her. So she wants to keep you. For the first, up until now, you wanted to fuck her. You wanted to get her. This is the first time she wants to get you. And most men fuck that up straight away by either saying something, oh, I really like you, oh, can I see you again? Da -da, and just fucking being submissive to the woman's whims straight away and giving them attention. You can't do that. You have to drop your attention down to absolute zero. And here's why. One, it sets a standard for the relationship. I fucked you now, I'm in charge. Oh, you wanna see me again? Do you? All right, cool. Yeah, I'm waiting for a new bank card. Let's go for coffee, but you, you know, my, my, my money's low. Just, you have to buy them, I'll pay you back. Well, I ain't buying you coffee. FTB. Cool. Well, I fucked you now, so I don't care. You don't buy me coffee, I fucked you. I'll, I'll buy some other coffee, I don't care. All right, cool, well, I'm busy. You, you have banged her. You've won. You've won, so you ain't got nothing to worry about. Who cares if you never talk to her again? Who cares? Keep that in mind. Okay, yeah, no problem. I don't mind paying this time. Turn up, get yourself some fucking carrot cake and shit. Carrot cake. You want them fucking... I'm a millionaire. I still do this. You want them fucking yogurts from Starbucks with two cappuccinos and sparkling water. Make the bitch spend like fucking 20 fucking euro on me. Buy it for me. Setting a standard. Your man told you to buy him a coffee. Buy me a fucking coffee. Because you fucked the girl fine. But if you want a relationship, a happy relationship, you need to be in control of that relationship. If you fuck it up at the beginning, it is extremely difficult to recover. But if you set the standard right at the beginning, it's much easier. So the standard from the second you fuck her, now I'm not saying you become rude. I'm not saying you become an asshole. Don't do that. I'm just saying your attention drops. You're still nice, but your attention isn't there. So we're used to text her every night. You, you barely text her. Or you text her one or two times, and then you don't. Make it clear, she has to clearly see Here's the fine line. She has to clearly see that, you, that your attention's dropped, but not enough for her to call you out on it. Not enough where she can go, oh, you fucked me, you don't want to talk anymore. She can't say that, oh, what do you mean? I'm, I'm texting you, I'm just, I'm just busy. So it's gotta be that fine line where she feels uncomfortable because she knows something's up, but she can't say anything about it. That's how you gotta do it. Make her buy you some fucking coffee. You fucked her now, you are in charge. And this is the test. A quality woman, after you sleep with her, when your attention drops, will do anything it takes to get your attention back up, to retain you as a man. So you've slept with her. You've had sex with this girl. The next day you barely text her. Then you're too busy to meet her. Then you say, then when you say, yeah, okay, yeah, you have to pay, problem my bank card, whatever, whatever excuse, or whatever. A quality woman will go, oh, okay, no problem, no problem. Because they know that fucking a guy is a big deal and they don't want to fuck you for no reason and they don't want to be a hoe. They don't want to be a number, number, another random number on your fucking book. They want to get a relationship out of it. They want to build it into something. So a quality woman will bend her normal rules. A girl who would perhaps never buy you coffee is now prepared to do something for you, will bend her normal rules to get your attention back post-sex. That's what a quality woman will do. A shit quality woman, a crap woman, when you say these things, will be like, oh, fuck this guy, eh, and she'll go fuck someone else. A girl who will rather go have a new dick than buy you a coffee is not the kind of girl you need a relationship with, guys, because that's only going to end bad sooner or later. One way or another, there's going to be an argument or something, we're going to ask her to do something she doesn't want to do, and she's going to end up fucking someone else. This is the test that proves good woman against bad woman. After you sleep with them, literally the next day, you conduct this test. You drop your attention. If they work hard, if they double text you, if they text you first, if they ask to see you, all of these are positive things. Hey, maybe we can go out. Da -da -da. That's what you want to see. That's a woman who wants to work hard to keep her man interested. You're not going to be able to conduct this test if after you fuck her, you're like, oh, I love you so much. Oh, can I see you again? Because you're too busy flooding her with attention. So there's no test involved. If you fuck her and then you drop your attention and she doesn't really care or she doesn't really try to see you again, then she's trash. 
Do not fall into the trap of going, okay, oh, I'll just give her attention again and fuck her more because I want to fuck her. That is going to end bad. Don't waste your time. I'll tell you, man, I was with Cab Club, Christian fucking McQueen, three months ago. Walked in the club. I was fucking in the zone. Walked in the club. Two girls at the bar. Said, yeah, table. Bang. Or, or got, got, got table. Christian, big money, big money Christian. Start paying, start paying for the table, whatever. Before I even sat at the table, I went up to the bar, went to this girl, hey, you're beautiful. That's why I say in person, I do a different person. I say, excuse me, said, yeah. And in person, I make them pay attention. What most people do, they fuck up in person, is that they, they talk to girls when they're not paying attention. You go up to the girl and go, hey, you're beautiful. They're like, what? I go, excuse me, excuse me. And I make them, yeah? I make them pay attention to what I'm saying. I'm a fucking full grown man talking to you, pay attention. I said, you're absolutely beautiful. You're staying with me tonight. <laughs> Drink, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, fucked her same night. Even Christian, who's a G, goes, that was smooth. Of course, it's my to take. So bang her same night. She's a fucking 10. A 10. All you motherfuckers, if you fucked this girl, would fall head over heels in love with her because of how she looks. I fucked her. Next day, I didn't text her. She didn't text me. Next day, didn't text her. She didn't text me. Third day, she likes one of my Instagram pictures. Some basic, pathetic attempt. And I thought there, you just bang some dude who you barely know. And, you knew, and you're not even going to humble yourself to text me first. You think you're so special. You're not even going to reduce yourself to text me first. If you're not going to humble yourself to text me first after you got fucked in one night, then you're never going to humble yourself for me. You're always going to have this ego. You're always going to be, so I don't want you. I never spoke to that girl again. No, that's not true. It is true. I saw her three weeks later at a different events. She ran up to me. Oh my God. Oh, how you been? Da, da, da. And I spoke to her a little bit. Da, da, da. But I could just see, and she, she talked to me a little bit. Then she walked off and tried to talk to another guy in front of me to make me jealous. Where's the proof? There, that's the proof in my lesson that she's a trash hoe. What kind of girl does that? Talks to another guy in front of a guy trying to make him jealous. Whores, that's whore shit. She was a fucking hoe and I spotted it instantly because she didn't humble herself when she was supposed to. And I'm glad I didn't waste any more time on her because she's never gonna be doing like my other girls do, living in my house, letting me fuck other women, remaining loyal and fucking bringing me coffees and doing as I say. That's what you're looking for, gentlemen. You're not looking for sex. Sex is easy. You're looking for a woman who is loyal to you fiercely. You need a woman that you can sit and say, I'm going to jail for two years, see you in two years. And you're not worried about her cheating while you're in the cell. Now this girl, the hoe who ran, tried to make me jealous and who wouldn't text me, could I trust her for two years? Or could I trust the girl who next day was like, I don't know to do that. I really want to see you again. I hope you don't think bad of me. Please can I see you again? That kind of humbling bullshit. That's what you want. That's what you want. I hope you understand the difference between those two women because there's a huge difference between those two females. I do not waste my time, even with my PhD, trying to convert a hoe into a housewife. There's a reason that old saying exists. Don't waste your time with that shit. Now, I fucked girls on the first night and the next day they were so desperate for my attention that they were quality women. It doesn't matter if you fuck them the first day. Lots of these red pill books go, you fuck her first day, she's trash. Not true. I've had amazing women who I fucked first day. Amazing. Because the next day, they pass this test. This test is extremely important. If you, this is why you cannot get feelings for a girl before you fuck her. Because you, you guys are going to end up liking a chick and she's going to fail this test. You're going to end up staying with her anyway because she's hot and you like her. You're going to end up in a fucking bullshit relationship. <laughs> Reality of the world is this, gentlemen. You're walking down the street with your woman. A man comes up and decides to rape her. You punch the guy in the face. He falls over, hits his head and dies. Very possible. You go to jail for four years. You're in a fucking jail to, to protect her. And she's fucking someone else. That's what women will do. They'll do that to you. They'll go fuck someone Well, I'm lonely. I'm lonely. I'm in jail. Yeah, but I'm lonely. Because they're selfish cunts. So do you want to be walking down the street with a girl who will do that to you? Or do you only want to walk down the street with a girl who you know will be crying her fucking eyes out, writing you letters day after day, at every single visitation, uninterested in every inbox she gets on Instagram while you do that jail time. And the only way you're gonna know that is with this fucking test. Do not waste your time with trash hoes. It only ends up in one place. I fucked a whole bunch of women and I fucked some beautiful women, but if they fail this test, I will not talk to them again because I do not have time and energy to waste on a woman who will not be loyal to me. That is the most, number one, most important thing. The most important thing is this test. People often say to me, how, Tate, how, how do you, how does, why does your girlfriend let you fuck other girls? She lets me fuck other girls because she cannot possibly leave me. She leaves me because she loves me and I love her and she loves me with all her heart and she cannot imagine her world without me. 
If I died, she would commit suicide. I am her everything. It doesn't matter if I fuck someone else because I'm her everything. She has nowhere else to go because this test was implemented and she passed it and years have passed where I haven't taken her shit and I've kept a position of authority and I've just become her idol in life. It's like trying to take God away from a Christian. They're like, well, if God doesn't exist, have you ever argued with a religious person? Well, if, and, and they'll, after you prove them wrong a bunch of times, they go, well, if God doesn't exist, well, then what's the point? They'll eventually say, what's the point in being alive? What's the point in doing good? What's the point in doing bad without God? That's how your woman has to think of you. Well, without him, what's the point in doing anything? When you get to that point, you can do whatever the fuck you want. I can fuck who I want because she ain't going to leave. She ain't going to leave. She doesn't even cry about it anymore. She's like, I know you're going to do what you do as long as you only love me. Of course I only love you. They're just stupid hoes. Okay, done. It ain't unachievable, gentlemen. It's very achievable if you keep your shit in order. Remember, all these lessons about when we're talking about getting the girls, the attention scale, it's the same when you're in a relationship. If your chick's getting fresh, I told you, man, this is the mistake, the biggest mistake I ever made in my PhD life. It's when I was young and I was grinding, I was trying to make money, trying to make money, I'd get a girlfriend and I'd text her, oh, I'm really busy today, love you. And then I wouldn't text her because I was busy working. And then she'd reply to me some fucking rude shit. And I'd end up texting her all day arguing. And I realized she gets the most attention from me when she's misbehaving. She gets constant messages when, when she misbehaves. When she acts good, I barely text her because I'm busy making money. So you're training her because females want the attention. It's what they want. It's all they want. You're training her to misbehave for your attention. Reverse it. When your girl's being nice, flutter. She ask a dick, cut that shit off only way to do it. So it's important that even the lessons we learn about how to get girls, it's the same in a relationship. Keep your attention rare, even in a relationship. I'll tell you something, man. I say this to people that don't believe it. Your girl should want sex more than you give it. I say this all the time. I've never, ever, ever wanted sex with my girlfriend and not had it in six years, ever. She's wanted sex with me and not had it unlimited times. Unlimited times. Your girl should want sex more than you give it. Because you have to do all the fucking work. And you got a bunch of other side hoes anyway. Fucking so often on the side, sometimes you just give me a massage, I'm tired. Your girl, that is a sign of a healthy relationship when your girl wants sex and you don't really even want it. That's a healthy relationship. It shouldn't be the other way around. Because that's putting her in a position of power. You cannot let these women ever be in a position of power because women are not evolutionarily designed for power and they don't want power. They think they want it, but when they get it, they just lose respect for you. And then they get harder and harder on you because they start to secretly resent you. That's what happens when a, a, a female has a position of power. They start to resent you. You gotta fucking lay it down. And the biggest weapon you have as a man is, I don't care if you're with a girl for six months and everything's going well, but she gets too fresh. You gotta just get back on Instagram and get messaging new ones. That's how it's gotta be. So I have a guy who I, co I coach on girls. He said, uh, I've been a girl, I've been with her for five months, but she has male friends and she talks to these guys and da da da. I was like, look, that's not acceptable. He was like, well, how do I stop her? I was like, bro, you cannot have your woman talking to other men. Those men are trying to fuck your girl. If you had a car, those men are trying to fuck your girl. Let's cut the bullshit. They're friends. No, they're not. If your girl was fat with no legs in a wheelchair, would they be her friend? Would they text her? No, they fucking wouldn't. So let's cut the fucking bullshit right here, right now. They're trying to fuck your chick. If you had a fucking car, would you let car thieves attempt to break into your car? No matter how good the locks are, would you let them sit there and just try and break in and just watch them do it? Or would you be like, get the fuck away from my car? It's the same as a chick, bro. You can't be letting these people attempt because no matter how good the locks are, maybe one day they'll find a weakness and they'll get in. Maybe you're arguing with your girl. You had an argument. This guy's in a particularly fucking generous mood. He decides to take her somewhere or some shit. Blah, 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 blah. Problems. You don't need it. Men should not be texting your woman's phone. Ever. So he's like, well, I agree with you, but how do I stop it? So there's only one thing you can do, man. Tell her to fucking stop texting them. Make her choose. It's like, oh yeah, but what if she chooses them? You have to be prepared to walk away from a bad relationship and from a bad chick. Trump said it, the art of the deal. You have to be prepared to walk away from the table. Here's some math for you. If you tell the girl to choose between you and her friends and she chooses her friends, She's going to fuck one of them eventually anyway. Don't you see how eventually she's going to end up banging one if she already chooses them above you? So why would you allow that dynamic to continue instead of walking away with honor and reducing your attention to zero?
putting a super high value on your attention. And then maybe after a couple days of not hearing from you, she might think, okay, now your attention's high, your attention's high value. She might reverse her decision and go, okay, I'll stop. You're right, I've taken, I've thought about it. Then, then you stand a chance. If you allow her to continue, if she says she wants to choose them, you go, okay, and stay with her anyway, it's only gonna end with her fucking one, now or later. Are you such a big a pussy? It's like ripping off a Band-Aid. Rip it off. You're gonna do it slowly? She's gonna fuck one. She's gonna do it. So you wanna be with her those extra few months and get cheated on? Or let wait for her to message you, it just isn't working. Some bullshit, because she wants to fuck someone else? You know where it's gonna end, so why are you allowing it to happen instead of walking away at a point where you can make a difference? by attaching super value to your attention and laying it down like a fucking man. You can't have that shit. As a man, we have one weapon, attention reduction, an FDB. And you have to prepare to do that in a relationship for important issues. I'm not saying if a girl won't make you a coffee, you know, never talk to her again. That's maybe a bit too much. But with things like talking to other dudes or things that are red lines, you have to be prepared to walk away. If you've been with a girl for three months and she won't do as you say, FDB. Now, obviously, if you just get with a girl, she ain't gonna get rid of all her friends, she just met you. Use your brain. But you've been with her a while, she should fucking know the score. And if she doesn't like it, get back on Instagram, start sending those messages again. It's as simple as that. I've told you how to get laid. That's what this course was about. I said how to get girls. I've told you how to retain girls. The most important thing is this test. And post-test, if they pass the test, to always make sure that your attention is within the correct parameters. Her behavior and your attention have to be explicitly linked. You cannot fuck that up in any way. You have to make sure that there's no other men or outside influences fucking with her too much. You don't want other men messaging your girl. Forget the modern world, they're just friends bullshit. That is only gonna lead to a bad relationship. Good relationships are one man, one woman. No, sorry. One man, 10 women, that's my relationship. It's not a chick with a bunch of dudes messing her. It's not acceptable. It's not acceptable in any way. And if she chooses them over you, then find someone else because it's only gonna end one way or another anyway. I've tried to be all encompassing. I know I've actually missed a whole bunch of things because like I said, I know so much shit. There's a whole bunch more I, I, I need to say. So what I'm gonna do is, this is the first video I'm gonna release for all you guys who purchased the video. I want you to go out there, start your Instagram messaging, start your WhatsApping, go on some dates, do what you need to do. In a week from now, I'm absolutely not only really welcoming all your questions, any questions you have, a specific conversation, a screenshot, or a, a scenario, or any questions or anything I've missed, email them all to me. And I'm gonna do another video in a week, completely free for you guys, answering all your specific questions, be another hour and a half of knowledge. And between this video, which is the absolute fundamental basics, how attention works, the easiest way to speak to girls, how to the progression, the tower of power, how to always progress, 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 how to test a girl after you've slept with her, and how to retain the control with your attention post sleeping with her. With this one video, your game will be 10 times what it was before. Plus, you're gonna send me a whole bunch of questions, I'm gonna do another video with specifics, another hour and a half. And with these two videos, plus a shitload of experience, because that's what life is, it doesn't matter how long you read about learning to play piano, until you get on that piano and start to play, you don't know how to play piano. Experience is extremely important. With these three hours of videos, plus experience, you should have everything you need to begin the long journey to a PhD. PhD course part two. More knowledge for you motherfuckers. I don't have a whiteboard this time. Well, I do. It's there, but I'm not moving it. So this is, as I said at the end, the first PhD. If you have any questions you wanna ask me, if there's any information you feel like you need that I didn't portray, to drop me some emails. I've had some really interesting emails with some interesting questions, so I'm gonna answer them here. I'm gonna keep all the names and everything anonymous so no one knows who asked what, and I'm gonna, obviously this email is gonna go out to everyone who bought the course. Uh, the reason I'm not answering specifically to each person who asked me the question is because maybe some of the points I'm gonna mention in these questions are valid for people who didn't particularly ask the question, so I think there's knowledge in here from everybody, so let's get started. First things first, first email I had. Hi Andrew, amazing course, of course. Of course, of course, ha, 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 anyway. I've been learning a lot from your content, of course. But there are some questions I have in mind. So, one, aside from Instagram or social media, what are your recommendation, recommended alternatives for getting girls? Social media can be distracting and not everyone wants to expose their lifestyle. Valid point. If you don't want to use social media, you have a few choices. You have in-person, which is obviously the old school way. Very doable, 
but I'd say it's a harder, it's much harder for me to teach. It's difficult for me to teach it in a course. Only a week ago, I was in New York with myself, Christian McQueen, and Goldman Unleashed. We were all together in the club with one guy who was trying to learn from us, and he learned from all three of us at once, that lucky fucker. But going up to girls and approaching them, really, and I know this is going to sound cliche, it's about confidence. It's about not being creepy. It's about a few basic tips and tricks. I'll give you some basic tips and tricks, but it's real, it's hard for me to put it into a course. If you really want to know how to approach girls on the street or approach girls in a club and have the best possible chance of them speaking to you, that's fine. Email me separately. We'll put together some training. Look, I'm a real person. I'm not some dude on the internet. If you say, look, Tate, I really want to learn how to do this. I say, okay, look, get a flight to Paris or get a flight here, get a flight, whatever, whatever. Let's meet up and let's hit the club and I'll show you how I do it. So tips and tricks for approaching girls. First things first is you have to get their attention. Now, I've seen the biggest mistake I've probably seen guys make is that they don't get a girl's attention before they try and talk to her. They go up to her and they say, oh, excuse me, you're really pretty, or excuse me, my name's Kevin, or whatever. Women are, women are female. Females are female. I mean, their mindset's female. They're distracted. They're thinking about fucking bullshit and gossip girls and sex in the city, and their brains are a mess. They're women. Or they're thinking about me because I fucked them two years ago and they can't get over it. So you have to get 100% of their attention. You can't go up to a girl in a bar while she's on her phone or while she's talking to her friends and say, excuse me, my name's Kevin. She's going to be like, what? Her saying what, or I don't understand you, or I can't hear you, is a bad first response to your approach. It's just a negative start. What? What? Uh, what? It's just negative. So you have to get their attention. And the way I do that is by being supremely confident with the fact that I want to talk to them. So I'll go up to a girl. I'll say, excuse me. I'll tap her on the shoulder. Excuse me. She'll stop, she'll look at me, and I will literally delay for a second or two. I'll wait for her to give me her full attention and fully look at me before I say something. So this is the most important thing. I've seen too many people fuck that up. You have to get the girl's attention. This is in the club, it's one thing, but on the street or somewhere else it's even more important. You go up to a girl while she's walking, oh, you're beautiful, but she's like, what the fuck, what? It's gonna be an annoyance to her. If you say, excuse me, excuse me, and you make her stop and say, sorry, I didn't, I didn't wanna stop you, but, and then you start to talk, when she has, when you have 100% of her attention, she's devoting attention to you. The compliment you're gonna give her, because that's what it effectively is, has a lot more weight and a lot more value, as opposed to just throwing it at her while she walks down the street. First things first is get their attention, make them pay attention to you. Personally, I, get, I cut straight to the point. I say to her, I say, you're absolutely beautiful. And they're usually, and if you say that, there's very little bad or wrong they can say. I mean, if they're a complete dickhead, or if they have a boyfriend, they might go, okay, thanks, and turn around. That's a fine interaction. Nothing bad's happened. You haven't been insulted. You haven't been shot down, really. So this will give you the confidence to approach any girl you want. If you get her attention, tell her she's beautiful, even if she goes, oh, okay, thanks, and turns around, then you can just walk off. What bad's happened? Nothing. But if she goes, oh, thank you, thank you, and she continues to look at you, then you know she wants you to keep talking to her. So that's my opener. People have different openers. That's my personal opener. I've seen a lot of guys who go, oh, my name's Kevin or whatever. The reason I don't do that is because I don't think she gives a fuck what your name is, bro. She doesn't even know you. Excuse me, yeah, my name's Andrew. So, who the fuck are you? Like that, that it, internally, that's what she's thinking. Whereas if you, see, saying my name's Andrew means all the, it's all about me, the attention's on me, here's who I am. She doesn't care who you are because she doesn't know you. Saying you are beautiful means the attention's all about her. And she's more likely to respond positively to a compliment which is all about her, but an introduction from some dude who she doesn't even fucking know. She doesn't care about who you are. So I say, you're absolutely beautiful. She'll say thanks. I say, uh, so she'll say, I'll say, what's your name? And she'll tell me, da da da. And now I'll start talking shit. So what do I say when I start talking shit? I don't know. I'll talk absolute garbage. It depends where I am, it depends on the situation. But like I said in the first state, the first le uh, lesson in the PhD course, we're always aiming for progression. So if, if we're in, a bar, I'll go up and say, excuse me, you're absolutely beautiful. She goes, oh, thanks. I say, I've got good news. See, I use little things like that. I'll say, if I say, if, if I say, I've got good news, blah, 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 she doesn't respond as much. I'll say, I have good news. And she'll say, good news, what? I'll start getting her to respond, and I'll do that with little breaks. So I have good news, she'll say, what? I'll say, me and you are drinking. And if she's with other girls, I'll say, all of us are drinking. We're all drinking. We're all drinking vodka, and I'll just point to her and say, vodka, bar, and I'll start ordering shit with the vodka shops. Oh, I don't drink vodka, da, da, da. you do with me. Start being assertive, drinks, told her she's beautiful, who's this dude, whoa, vodka's coming, oh, vodka, okay, cheers, everyone, cheers, bang. 
and your friends. One of the simple, another little trick I'll give, if you've been talking to, to a girl for three or four minutes before you've introduced yourself, a good trick I'll give is if you ask her her name, and she says it's Katie or whatever, leave it a second and wait to see if she asks you your name back. So let's say you've been talking to a girl, you meet her in a coffee shop, you're talking shit. Oh, the line in this coffee shop's always so long. Yeah, I know, it's too long. Did I? If I owned a coffee shop, I'd make sure my staff had to run everywhere. Otherwise, they'd all get fired, because I'm the king. <laughs> well, you should open a coffee shop then. I will, are you gonna come in? Yeah, I'll always buy coffee from you. Typical bullshit conversation I have with those, that I meet in coffee shops. Oh, da da. Talk to her a few minutes, I'll say, so what's your name? Katie. After she tells me her name, I'll pause for a second. I don't introduce myself, I pause. And I wait to see if she asks me my name. This is a huge tell. And I've heard this somewhere else before, and I can't remember where. But it's something I observed and something I used before I heard it somewhere else. And it's true. You say, what's your name? Katie. And then you wait. She goes, and you? I say, oh, my name's Andrew. Then she's interested in you. You say, what's your name? She goes, Katie. She and she doesn't give a fuck who you are after talking to you for a few minutes. That it's probably not going to go anywhere doesn't mean you have to abandon the whole procedure. It just means be aware that it's probably not going to go anywhere. So that's a few tricks. Tip, trick, tips. Fucking hell, no edits. Tips and tricks for picking up girls in person. But a lot of that shit and that charisma and stuff, that's just down to practice. I think I've talked about Luke the Man in the first video. Did I talk about Luke the Man in the first PhD video? I can't remember. I'm going to talk about Luke the Man again. So when my brother worked in a coffee shop, there was a, a black guy from the Ivory Coast Republic called Luke, and he was broke, he worked in a coffee shop, he was African, black, ugly, skinny, no money, and he used to try it on with every girl who came in that shop. If you went to buy, buy a coffee, he'd just give you the coffee and say, hey baby, you're so beautiful. This is before that whole, this is about, this is when Tristan worked in prep. So Tristan must have been about 18, was about 10, 11 years ago, before this Me Too shit. He would be fired by now for fucking sexual misconduct, probably. Hey, you're so beautiful, you're so beautiful. You say to every single girl, and he always just come, they say, what's your name? You go, Luke, like James Bond, James, James Bond. You go, Luke, Luke the man. That's what he used to call himself. <laughs> He's a G. Anyway, so he used to try with every single girl. And he was so ugly and had no money that he used to get shot down 99 times out of 100. And my brother, being young, used to say to him, why do you do that? They all say no to you. He goes, yes, but some say yes. And one day, uh, Luke came in with pictures of a Hungarian girl. Must have been like some racist Hungarian girl whose father is a strict Christian. She had some fantasy about fucking a black dude or something. I don't know, but she was a fucking nine. Hot. And Luke is as ugly and as poor as you can get. He's in a worse position than any of you. And he fucked this fucking Hungarian supermodel. And he had pictures of her naked. My brother's like, how the fuck did you do that? He goes, oh, because I'm Luke the Man. Luke the Man keeps trying. And this is an important lesson. You haven't really got to have anything. If you're prepared to do the numbers, if you're really that militant about it and you don't give a shit about getting shot down, then you're never going to fail. That's the truth. If you're that militant with your numbers. But if you're like me, I'm selective. I'm not one of them dudes who's like day game, run around the mall all day, going up to every girl I see. I'm not like that. That's not me. I'm calm, cool, and collected. I'll approach a bitch once a week, maybe. And she's got to be hot, fine. I ain't, I ain't going to no basics, sevens and shit. I have enough girls. So if I go up to a girl, it's like if I see a 10, then I'll go approach a girl. But in reality, I don't often do it. But if, if I do do it, that's how it's done. Uh, another way you can do it is Tinder. Everyone uses Tinder. Tinder is perfectly doable. You can meet good girls on Tinder. There's nothing wrong with Tinder. So Tinder, short answer, Tinder. But whether you're on Tinder or in person progression. So if I meet a girl in person, I still get the Instagram. And I get the Instagram within three to four minutes. I still do that. Or I still get the WhatsApp. Exactly the same. And if I'm talking to them on Tinder, you want to get them off Tinder ASAP. If I'm talking to a girl in the club, I'll talk to her after we've had the shots. Da -da 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 -da, so, you're, so what's your Instagram? I bet you have loads of men following you. Oh, not that many. 25,000. I follow her Insta. I get the Instagram early on, so I have her contact details to hit her up later. So I get that shit early. Same with Tinder. If you're talking to her on Tinder, then she's talking to loads of dudes on Tinder. Talk to her a little bit, just like a lesson to the first PhD course. Talk a little bit of shit, four or five minutes, bang. Try and get her Instagram or WhatsApp. Get her off Tinder. Get her into a, pro, a platform to reduce the numbers. You're always looking to reduce the numbers. If you're talking to her in real life, everyone can talk to her. 
Reduce it to our Instagram, 25,000. Reduce that to our WhatsApp, a couple hundred. Reduce that to dating, one guy. Always be looking to reduce the numbers. So whether it's Tinder or in person, progression. You're not looking to just talk shit. Get contact details and progress. Next, Big Daddy Tay. You mentioned that your girl cannot have male friends and she'd be interested in talking to you and you only. Correct. How can this be achieved without behaving like an insecure beta who is mate guarding? Attractive women often have multiple guys texting her even when she's not interested at all. What actions would you take? Very good question. And also, the person who said this is perspicacious enough to know that you don't want to look exactly like he said, an insecure beta mate guard. So mate guarding is when you're like, oh, like just super protective, pathetically protective over your girl. That's not an alpha quality. So how do you approach this from an alpha stance? Well, it depends. If it's a girl who you're just seeing and dating, there's not much you can do about it. You don't have the authority yet. If it's a girl you've been with for a while, there's a lot you can do about it. So if I'm, if I'm just dating a girl and I know she's dating dudes or talking to dudes, whatever, I do nothing. I don't give a shit. I'll fuck her, I'll progress towards banging her, I'll let her do what she's gonna do. I'll bang her and I'll, and I'll do the test we talked about in the first episode. The cut attention test. Bang, cut the attention off. And then we'll see how she reacts from there. If I fuck her and she chases me badly, then I'm gonna know the other dude she's talking to she ain't that interested in, because she's chasing me for my attention after having sex with me. If I have sex with her and I don't hear from her and she's a bit annoyed about it, by it, but she starts chasing her other dudes, then she ain't worth shit anyway. Once again, for that test, I'm not saying stop talking to the girl completely. I'm not saying that. I'm saying reduce your attention. Reduce your attention. It has to be, it's a fine line. You have to reduce your attention enough so that she can feel something's changed, but not too much so she can call you out on it. You've got to be just at that line where you can play innocent, where she can say, oh, you fucked me, you're not talking to me anymore. You don't want to be able to say that. You've got to reduce it enough so she doesn't feel comfortable. I don't feel comfortable. I don't feel like he likes me. That's how, it's, it's that fine line. I'm not saying never talk to her again. I'm saying reduce the attention. That's what I said. If it's a girl you've been with for a while, you don't fucking lay it down, bro. But what the fuck's she doing? If she, if you say to her, we've been together a few months now, I don't like these dudes texting you. If you had no legs and was fat and was in a wheelchair, they wouldn't text you. They're not texting you for your personality. They're texting you because you're attractive. I don't feel comfortable with that. If she, I'm your man. If you want to talk to a man, you can talk to me. Stop replying to these guys. And if you say that to her, she goes, no, I really like them, they're my friends. If she's gonna choose them over you, then she's gonna cheat on you in the end anyway. This is the harsh reality of the game. If you lay it down and say it's me or them, and she chooses them, then what's the possibility of her being loyal to you in the long term? It's zero. It may be a time frame, but in the end, it's zero. If her texting these dudes who wanna fuck her is more important than keeping you happy, then eventually she's gonna cheat. So the question is this, what do you do? Well, if she chooses them, it's better to end the relationship there and walk off as a hero and to upset her and destroy her heart than to let it slowly fade away while she slowly falls in love with some new dude. So you end up catching her cheating on you with some other guy. And then when you're upset, she doesn't give a fuck because women are ruthless. So let me make that clear to you one more time. You lay it down and you say, I don't like you talking to other men. I'm your man. You don't talk to other men. If you talk to other men, I'm not going to be able to take you seriously. So there's not going to be a relationship if you're going to do that. She goes, oh, no, well, I, I want to do that. So yeah, all right, cool. All right, that's all I'm, I've just told you I'm not comfortable with it. If you want to keep talking to them, then talk to them. That's all you do. And then you reduce your attention right down. Reduce it completely. Are you, are you oh, I'm a scene tonight. I'm busy. Reduce your attention right down. Oh, fine. If you're going to be upset because I'm talking to guys, fine. Fuck you then. You're never going to control me. I like to have friends. Da, da, da. If that's the kind of person she is, she's going to cheat on you eventually anyway. So your choices are you leave her and she's upset or she cheats on you and you're upset. Which one's better? Well, I'll tell you, the one that's better is upsetting her. Not just because it avoids you discomfort, but also because if you upset her, you're going to have an emotional hangover that allows you to get her back later. I've had this exact scenario with girls. Exact scenario. I said, why are you talking to this guy? Oh, I've known him since school, da, da, da. So I don't care how much long you've known him, he still wants to fuck you, so stop talking to him. Oh, but I've known him forever, we've only been together a few months. Tell him you have a boyfriend, and that you're still friends, but you, don't, you can't really meet up with him, you've got a boyfriend, and stop fucking texting him. Simple. Oh, but you know, I just think you're trying to control me. I said, all right, fucking forget it, do what you want. 
Well, I'm not taking you seriously when you're talking to a bunch of guys. I'm not taking that kind of girl seriously. Oh, yeah, well, whatever. Da, da, da. Cut my attention right down. She got fresh. I dumped her. Now, I'm telling you something. That girl, this was a long time ago. That girl, once every four to five months, to this day, likes a picture on my Instagram. Or fucking drops me some bullshit meme in my Facebook inbox. Still trying to, to this day, this was years ago. Because I'm the guy who dumped her. My attention is the most valuable. Remember the lessons from the first one. My attention is the most valuable because my attention's hard to get. She didn't do what I wanted. She didn't conform to be the way I want her to be. So, where's my piece of paper? FDB, fuck you, bye, I found another girl. You're not in the business of turning a hoe into a housewife. If someone's mentality, if a girl's mentality is I need to talk to lots of men all the time, it's not your job to fix her, bro. That's not your job. Lay it down, make it clear, and make her make a choice. It's really as simple as that. But you have to be prepared to walk away if you don't get what you want. Like Trump said, the art of the deal. And it may be, it may upset you, you may be annoyed, you may lose a girl you don't, you, may, you like, you don't really want it, da, da, da. But this is the truth. You're looking for a wife or you're looking for a girl you can be with forever. She ain't that girl. So cut your attention right now and find someone else. If she won't comply. That's, to, that's to how you handle that situation. Three. You talked about dropping attention after having sex with a woman. Will this increase the girl's the risk of a false rape accusation? E.g. the girl feeling used or manipulated. Very valid question. And this is why I said, drop the attention to a very important fine line level where she can feel that the attention's dropped, but she cannot call you out on it. It's that perfect level of, oh, I don't want to say anything. I can't say, he is texting me back, but it's not, it doesn't feel the same. It's just that perfect level. So that's something you have to do with experience. You have to cut the attention down, but she can't be able to call you out on it. So that handles that, but a very good question. Expanding on the approaching stage. This guy, sorry, next question. Will you be expanding on the approaching stage? Approaching girls, I'll give you some tips in the first question, but it's really something you have to see. If I had to break that down to three things, it would be get their attention first, it's absolutely not really a numbers game, especially when you're approaching girls. If you're going up to girls in the club, they might have done drugs, they don't want to pay attention, they might be too drunk, they might have their boyfriend in the club or an ex-boyfriend in the club, or it might be a bunch of people in the club they know and they don't want to be seen talking to guys. There's so many outside influences when you're approaching girls that you really have to be prepared to do a complete numbers game. You have to be prepared to approach, 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 approach if you want to pull same night, especially in the modern world. So it's a numbers game, absolutely. Get their attention first, and whatever you say, the first thing you say after you get their attention should be a compliment. That's, that's my advice. Right. Next question. This is a very, very long question. But it's about a guy who does his approaches um, at colleges during the week and aims to take the girls he meets during the week to bars at the weekend and, and close the deal. It's a very efficient system. I agree with that. But his question is very basically is, I can't seem to figure out the cold approaching during the day because I feel it's totally different vibe versus approaching in a club or a bar. I get a few leads during the day, but sometimes there's something I'm missing in my day game that I can't seem to figure out. I'm not hitting the level of leads I should be getting during the day versus the leads I get at night. I'll tell you what, the, I'm, and obviously I don't know the exact scenario, but I'll tell you what those things are. Pro, I probably answered a lot of this question in the, in the previous question, but the reason it's easier at night is because one, it's a more relaxed vibe. Two, girls are drinking. And they're more sociable when they're drinking. That's the reason it's easier. There's music on. They're happy. They go, no one goes out. No one really goes out when they're depressed or, or busy or stressed. They go out to be happy. They're happy. They're drinking. They're with their moron friends, talking about moron shit. They're receptive. So they're more receptive at night than they are during the day. So why are you doing better at night than during the day? Well, I do think it's easier at night. You're probably always going to do a little bit better at night than you are during the day. However, you're saying if your day game is seriously lacking, the first thing is, like I said, are you getting her attention before you talk to her? Are you doing that properly? Second thing, are you complimenting her? And third thing is, how are you getting her contact details? I find, this is why I use Instagram so much. Instagram is so useful because even I find that a girl who doesn't really want to give you her phone number will happily give you her Instagram. So, because Instagram is public. Instagram is for everyone. So if you want leads during the day, instead of trying to get the phone number, which can be a little bit awkward, and especially in the world we live in now, the Me Too era, all these girls are sketchy as fuck, they're all living on edge, they're all nervous. You talk to a girl for five minutes, say, oh, what's your phone number? They can be a bit like, oh, they don't want to give it out. 
if you say, I'll tell you what, it was really nice talking to you. You're beautiful. I want to follow you on Instagram. Not give me your Instagram. I want to follow you on Instagram. A girl doesn't say no to that because they let anyone follow them on Instagram. Anyone can follow them on Instagram. So what I'll do is I'll say, oh, it was really nice talking to you. Yeah, you're really beautiful. I'll tell you what, I want to see your face again. <laughs> I'm going to follow you on Instagram. What's your Instagram? And I'll, get, I'll give them my phone. In fact, I try to avoid doing that because a couple times I've given them my phone and like a WhatsApp's come up. Love you, baby. And all those two shit. So, um, but I'll say, oh, what's your Instagram? Then I'll type your Instagram in. But before you walk off, they'll just go, okay, bye. Follow them. Click message. And then what I'll do is, in fact, let me see if I've got it fucking right here. Because I know you guys know I don't lie. Let me see if I can find one right now. An example of what I do. I did this like two days ago. I've got so many messages in my inbox. I don't know to find it. That was New York. It was after I got back from New York. Um, no edits. You guys are just going to sit there and wait. Da -da 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 -da. Fuck knows. All right. So anyway, I got her Instagram. And then I, while she was watching me, while she was paying attention, I sent her a message of cherries. It's cherries in my thing. Choose your own fruit. So I get her Instagram and I click message and I send her something. Or you can send her a selfie. It's another good idea. Ask for her Instagram. She'll give it to you. Click follow and go, oh, I, you probably have loads of guys messaging you. Oh, no, I don't. You must do because you have loads of guys. I don't want you to forget about me. Here, wait, wait. Go camera and like get and do a selfie, a stupid picture, and send it to her message. And she'll laugh. Oh, I'll say, now you know who I am. I'm going to message you later. I'll also say I'm going to message you later to get some kind of verbal agreement. Oh, okay. And what they'll reply is instinctively, oh, okay. And then when you message them, they feel more compelled to reply. Well, I agreed to message you. Now, if, if she messages you a little bit and it doesn't go anywhere, whatever. But I'm just talking about to make it easier to get the leads. So don't ask for numbers. Ask for Instagrams. Message them while they are. Do a selfie or send some fruit or some bullshit. And say something like, I'm going to message you later. I want to talk to you. I'm super forward with what I do and say, but I'm not over the top. I'm not creepy with it. I'm just very clear about my objectives. What's your Instagram? You're beautiful. I'm going to follow you. Da, 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 da. Okay, I'm going to message you later. I want to talk to you. I'm going to talk to you later. Okay, okay. I'm very clear about what I want to happen. So that's probably the advice I'd give you. I'd have to see your approach to see if there's anything else missing. But try to ask for phone number, ask for Instagrams. Get their attention first. And the first thing you say needs to be a compliment. If you do those three things, you can't really go too wrong. Especially if you're confident with what you're saying and et cetera, et cetera, then you can't really go too wrong from there. So that's why I recommend. Right. Last question for today, gentlemen. I bet you didn't expect this free PhD video in your inbox, did you, you motherfuckers? You're all sitting there going, okay, that was a good course. Bang, more content, more fucking knowledge from Tate. Best purchase you ever made. Motherfuckers. I'm too damn nice. I'm too nice. I do a video about how nice I am. Right, I have a question. I've got this chick on lock and she's loyal to me. Congratulations. What do I say to her if I bang another chick and the main one finds out? How can I get away with having multiple girls? Right, sitting down with your girl and saying, I wanna fuck other girls, ain't really a conversation that's gonna go well. It's just an awful conversation. The truth of it is, you have to be militant. And I'm smiling because I'm laughing at how I do it. So I've got my chick who's loyal to me and she loves me. So what do I do? I fuck other girls. Sooner or later, she's going to catch me. And this is your chance. So you don't have the conversation with her. Women are not logical enough. You can't approach a woman and say, this is what's going to happen. Let's do a deal and be logical and make a deal. They, they don't work that way. you got to hit them with shock and awe of emotion. So you're going to cheat as normal. You're going to do your thing. You're going to fuck your hoes. And maybe she won't find out for a year. Maybe she won't find out for two years. Maybe she'll find out after a week. But when she finds out, that's when the pimping starts. So when I get caught cheating, I don't worry about it. I'm like, oh, okay, now we get to hammer it out. So the key things are this. I have a girl who's loyal to me and I fucking want her And I do that by, I did it as follows. I was with her for about a year and two or three months before I got caught cheating. In fact, fuck, I've got some screenshots I need to find on Facebook from my old phone. I got an old phone working and I had screenshots of that conversation when she first caught me cheating. I put them on Facebook because it was so funny. I'm going to find them and try and insert them in this video. If they're in this video in the following seconds, I did a good job and I found them for you. So anyway, 
Keys are this. You just caught your cheating. Bang. Rule one is you never, ever apologize. You are not sorry. They take that weakness and they fucking twist it and they use it against you. And this is not just for cheating. This is relationships in general. You are never sorry. Because once you admit fault, a woman doesn't sit and go, okay, he admits he's wrong. Or he admits that this is not the best situation. He admits that I'll be nice to him. They think, ah, oh, he knows he's wrong. Let me just fucking, as mu- let me squeeze as much uncomfortable inconvenience out of this as possible. So don't do that shit. You're not sorry. And another thing you don't do is you don't lie. Because lying is cowardice. So when I get caught cheating, sit up. When I get caught cheating, she'll be like, who the fuck is this? That was the girl I spot. What? What? Yeah, it's a girl I slept with, but obviously you're my girlfriend. I love you. I, I don't care about her. But, but, but why? I'm a full grown man. It's one of those things that happens, but I don't care about her, so it doesn't matter. I haven't apologized, and I haven't lied. Now, if she really loves you, and she's really loyal to you, she ain't going nowhere. Now, if she's going to leave you for that, for that small thing, fucking someone else, then she's not on lock. So you're telling me your girl's on lock. If your girl's on lock, like my girl is on lock, and all my girls are on lock, then what I'm saying to you is going to work. And that is, yeah, I fucked her. Listen, I'm a full-grown man. Sometimes I sleep with, sometimes I, you know, I do what I do, but I only love you. And one other thing I say is, I say, this is testament to how much I love you. Most dudes are out there fucking other girls, falling in love with other girls. I fuck other girls, I don't even care about them. The only girl I care about is you. I sleep with girls, and I don't, they don't even cross my mind anymore. So this shows I love you more than fucking anything. Most of these guys are out here, and if they fuck someone else, they fall in love with someone else. You know me, I fuck, I fuck 100 girls, and I'm still here with you. You're the only girl I care about. So what's, what are you worried about? What, what's the problem? And then, eventually, after this long conversation, because she's going to cry, and she's going to complain, and all this shit, all you have to do is not back down. She's going to come at you with things like, Ooh, is it going to happen again? Say, oh, I don't know, probably not. I don't, maybe not. If it really upsets you, we can talk about it. But I don't like you trying to control me and tell me what to do. Like, I, I do, I'm going to do what I feel like doing. I'm telling you that I'm loyal to you because I only love you. So I'm loyal to you just the same. What you have to do is you have to shift their perception of loyalty. A female's perception of loyalty is, is he only has sex with me. You have to change that from he only has sex with me to he only loves me. If they understand that I'm the only one he loves, but he has sex with lots of people, then you can do it. So that's the real aim of the game. And you cannot do that from a position of weakness or apology. That's done from a position of strength and never backing down. So the individual conversation you're going to have is going to be different than the individual conversations I've had. But if you're not apologetic for cheating, you don't lie, you just explain, look, it was just sex. You have a dildo. You have a vibrator. I'm not jealous. I don't care. Do you love your vibrator? No. You, you fucked it or you use it and then you don't care anymore. That's what I did. So what's the problem? Oh, but how do I know you don't love her? And that's what's going to come in. That's what's going to eventually, that's what the conversation is going to eventually lead. How do I know I'm special? That's the final hurdle. When you start hearing things like that, you've won. Because all you have to do is convince her she's still special. You can do anything. Ta-da. So, when she starts saying things like, how do I know I'm special? Like, look, I only love you. You know I only love you. Or I only live with you. Or you're the only girl I've taken on holiday. Or you're the only girl who, whatever, whatever you come up with. You're the only girl I do these things with. Yeah, I fucked some girl. I was out. I fucked some weird out. There's a load of guys. I fucked some girl. She's tried to see me since, and I didn't want to see her because I don't care about her. Or she tried to see me since. I saw her a few times, but I, I, she's boring. I don't like any girl but you. These girls are boring. All you have to do is convince her she's still special and that you're still loyal to her because you love her and you can do what you want. My girl's not allowed to say I cheat. She used to say, oh, but you're always cheating. Oh, you're going out. And she used to make a joke of it. Oh, you're going out. And I put clothes on. She goes, oh, you're dressed up. You're going cheating tonight. I say, don't tell me I cheat. I don't like that line. She goes, why? I said, because I don't cheat because I love you. And I only love you. Oh, fuck something. They ain't, it's not cheating because I'm loyal to you. I got to the point now where she doesn't even think I cheat. I'm a fucking girl. She doesn't even call it cheating. She goes, oh, you're going out. I said, yeah, you're going to be back tonight. I said, don't know. Okay. She doesn't, she doesn't even call it cheating because <laughs> the camera got to shake his head because <laughs> he knows it's true. <laughs> but, because my loyalty is not defined by who I have sex with. My loyalty is defined by who I love. So by convincing her she's special and she's the only one I love, then I'm allowed to do what I want. Now, if you're going to try and have multiple girlfriends, then that's going to be harder because she's going to think, oh, well, you care about them and you care about me. 
If you're gonna try and have different girls living in the same house, in the same bed, like I've done, that's gonna be harder. That's a new level. But the basic level, the base level is, you've got your girl who you care about and you can fuck who you want. And as long as she's getting attention, she feels like she's special, and she understands that she, she, she's the only one you love, and that's where loyalty is. Loyalty is through love, it's not through sex. Then you're gonna be able to do what you want. So that's the main aim of the game. I hope I've answered that question. There's no very specific formula, but that's the basis of it. Have your girl unlocked, do your thing, wait for her to catch you, do not apologize, do not back down, change her perception, shift her thinking to understand that love is about loyalty. Lo loyal loyalty is about love, loyalty is not about who you have sex with. For the same reason she'll fuck a toy or whatever, you'll fuck a girl you don't care about, and it's nothing more than that, and she needs to get over it. Uh, and, and usually you're gonna have questions like, well, people, girls are gonna laugh at me. Say, these girls don't laugh at you, these girls are jealous of you. This is the number one question I used to get. Well, girls are gonna laugh at me if they know you're fucking other girls. Say, no, they're not. Every single girl I fuck is desperate to be in your position. Every girl I fuck is desperate to be my girlfriend. They're all super jealous of you. They all wanna be you. You're the only one I'm going on holiday with. You're the only one I'm in love with. You're the only one I put on my Instagram page. They're all completely jealous of you. And girls like me. Girls like girls being jealous of them. So they, they don't show it in time. They think about it. Maybe the girls are jealous of me. Maybe if you start shifting it like, oh, these girls aren't hating on you. These girls are super jealous. You're the best. You get to be the fucking queen who I treat nicely. I treat these other girls like hoes and they're jealous of you. You're the only one I love because I'm loyal to you. They're just stupid. You're not stupid. They're stupid. Shift the thinking and then you'll get away with it. That sounds fun. That's enough for this course. I've got more questions to answer before we get this video out there. Once again, if you watch these answers and you have any more questions, email them to me. This is the best fucking money you guys ever spend. You get hours and hours of fucking content. You're probably gonna get another video at a later date. So, if you have any further questions, feel free to drop me an email and we might have another video coming out for you guys free soon. Right, PhD course, gentlemen. Have some questions here. Let me go through them. Question one. Tate, how do you handle mo how do you how do you no edit. Leave it. How do you handle multiple girlfriends? Do you explicitly tell them about others? What's the process in finding this out? Right. You can't get a girl, make her love you, and then go out for dinner and sit her there and go, by the way, I got loads of girls. Because it just makes you look like a dick. So what you do is you do you hide it the best you can, basically. You hide it. Until she finds out. And then when she finds out, you just super downplay it. So actually, last night, last night, one of my girls, Arena, found out, found a, she's dark haired, she found a blonde hair in my bed. She goes, who's been staying in this bed? I said, well, me. She goes, well, whose hair is this? I said, I don't know, I'm not always in the house. People sit on beds, maybe they didn't sleep in the bed. I don't know, I'm not gonna, it's, it's one o'clock in the morning, I'm not sitting here and talking about hair in a bed. Well, how do I know you don't have other girls? I say, don't, just shut up, you're being juvenile. We're going to sleep. And we went to sleep. So basically the exchange was, she knows I fucked a girl. I said it doesn't matter. Everything's fine. We're going to bed. It's very, it's about playing off as nothing. So when she catches you, who's this other girl? Blah, blah, blah. Oh, it's some girl I talked to. Well, she says you're her boyfriend. Oh yeah, I fucked her a few times, but it's not a big deal. You know, I'm with you. What? You're cheating on me. I'm not cheating on you because I love you. It's not cheating if I only love you. It's only cheating if it's emotional. It's not emotional with her. So just fucking calm down. If she says she wants to leave and she tries to leave you, FDB. Because what happens is, when drama kicks off, girls want attention. The girls just found out you're cheating. She wants a big episode. She wants you to apologize. She wants sorries. She wants all this shit going on. If you don't give a fuck, then she's gonna be like, well, you don't even seem to care. It's like, well, I don't care because I don't feel bad because it wasn't a big deal. I don't, and she'll be like, well, why don't you feel bad? It's because I didn't have any emotion. I don't feel bad because I don't feel like I did anything wrong because to me it was nothing. It's like, you're using a dildo, who gives a shit? Just completely trivialize their emotionality and tell them they're juvenile to give a fuck. And eventually, you'll get away with having two. Now, they might not be happy about it. They might cry about it, they might moan about it, they might be like, oh, you're always with that bitch, da -da. but they ain't gonna leave. And that's how you have two girlfriends. That's how you start with it. And a lot of it's experience, it depends on the actual girl who you're talking about, who the first girl is, who the second girl is. Like, everything is experience. It's like me telling you how to punch someone in the face. It's experience, it depends who they are, how big they are, if they move, whatever. But that's the basis of it. You don't sit down and, and just try and explain it. With women, you never just try and do, a, I say a business deal, a business deal. You don't sit down and appeal to their logic. If you appeal to their logic, you'll fail. If you sit down and go, hi, I'm gonna have other girls, here's why, here's why it doesn't bother you, it's okay. It ain't gonna work, it ain't gonna work. You cannot appeal to their common sense. You just have to wait for them to find out and handle the emotionality correctly. 
limit your attention in the correct way so that she understands that if she leaves, you're just going to go back to fucking the other girl. That's it. You can just say, look, I really like you. I want us to be together. If you leave, then I'm just going to, you know, I'll have to be single, won't I? But it's not a big deal. Don't worry about it. Just don't piss me off. And just be super, just completely trivialize her feelings. That's what you have to do. That's how you play it. Like I did last night. Oh, you found some hair in the bed. It's two o'clock in the fucking morning. Are we going to sleep or what? Oh, but you cheated. It's two o'clock. I'm going to sleep. It's hair. Who gives a fuck? You have hair. I have hair. It's hair. As in, it's not even a thing. Today, she hasn't even mentioned it because she knows she fuck. She ain't fucking dumb. She's seen me with blonde girls all over my Instagram. She knows I'm fucking one of them. She ain't that stupid. She just doesn't want to know. So now she's willfully ignorant, which is fine by me. How to play it properly when a girl you like is a virgin? Well, lucky gentlemen, you have to play it a lot slower. Same basic principles, attention, blah, 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 blah. Play it slower. Let her get away with more. Take your time. You can't be expecting to bang a virgin on her second date. That's crazy. Next, can you elaborate more on compliance after she passed the test? Well, if she passes the test, then you're starting the relationship in a position of power, aren't you? You're now in a position of power. You fucked her. She's chased you, which is good. She wants your attention. She's actively shown that. You're now starting to give her a little bit of attention. But if she fucks up, you cut the attention quick. And she should cave quickly because she knows this is not a guy who I can fuck with because he'll take all of his attention away. So after that, it's just a matter of managing the relationship. I mean, if she's completely honest and open, I've had girls after they pass the test say to me, I really love you. I'm completely, I know I shouldn't say this. I'm completely in love with you. Da, da, da. If someone's going to be that honest and open, you don't, you don't have to be a dickhead to them. You'd be like, okay, good. I love you. You love me. Everything's fine. Obviously, you don't take shit. You haven't got to be a dickhead in any way. Then you get the girls who still want to play the games. If they still want to play the games even after they paid the test, then okay, cool, FDB them. It's just a repeating cycle. It, it, the, the PhD system and relationships, it never ends. You never get to a point where it's like, okay, she's now programmed as a robot slave. I'm done. I've been with my girl six years and still to this day, I use game. Otherwise, she gets out of control. If I'm too nice to my girl now, after six years, she still gets out of control. So it's a never-ending philosophy. Sometimes hoes need to be ignored, to, no matter how long you've been with them. Sometimes you have to FDB them. Sometimes you have to show them you don't take shit. No matter how long you be with them, that is a universal truth. So you start a relationship in a dominant position, which of course is important. From the position of dominance, you maintain it. Very much like a poker game or a chess game. You have the advantage, you just play your advantage. It's as simple as that. Next question. How do you manage hierarchies, let's say with two girls? Does the first girl have seniority over the second girl? No. Girls won't take that. If you have one girl who's clearly better than the other one, you're gonna struggle massively. The second girl is just not gonna stick around for very long. I've had it where I've had girls who say, oh, I know you're with Vivian. I know you've been with her a long time. I don't mind, I'll stay out tonight. You two stay alone, all that shit, but it never lasts long. Because the ones who are really in love with you won't do that. So the only girls who do that aren't really in love with you. You have to be such an imposing, dominating force that there's no room for hierarchy underneath you. You have to be like, when I say imposing and dominating, I'm not talking about being a psycho. I just mean your personality has to be so large that you're in charge of everything. There is no hierarchy. How can it be a hierarchy? You just have to be like, okay, I need a coffee. You make me a coffee and you cook me something. If you send one to make the coffee, then there's a hierarchy. E either way, if you send one to make the coffee, it can, either be, it can either be seen as you trust her more and want her more, or she's lower than the other one because she's a slave. Women will always just make up a reason. So it doesn't matter which one you choose, they'll decide it's negative. So you have to send them both. Go make me a coffee. Who? Both of you, go. You have to be like that. You have to be dominant to a point where there's no room for hierarchy. It's just you and everyone else. Now that's easy for my personality. For other people it can be slightly harder, but there's a whole bunch of stupid, fiddly shit you need to learn to do if you want to truly have two girls in the long term. You gotta to learn to sleep on your back. You can't sleep on your side. If you sleep on your right side, I'm telling you now, whichever girl you're looking at when you're sleeping, the other one's gonna be pissed. Maybe not the first night, but by night 10 she will. Well, you're always facing her and you're hugging her and I'm on my own and da, da, da. This is a little dumb shit you're gonna have to deal with. But basically you have to be big, large enough personality that you handle it. There is no hierarchy. You can't clearly have women below women. They don't like that shit. What you do when you're in my situation where you have a girlfriend of six years and you try and bring a new girl in, 
You actually have to downplay your relationship with the girl of six years, which is difficult. And I only get away with that because the girl of six years plays along. So Vivian's been with me six years. She's completely head over heels in love with me. She wants kids with me, everything, everything, everything. And we met and we fell, whatever, we're in love. But when a new girl comes, she'll go, oh yeah, I started off working for him and you know, it's just how it worked out. She'll super downplay us so that the new girl feels like, ah, oh, well, they're just kind of working sex and now I'm here and he likes me and, and, and she can believe in her mind that she can be equal. If you were on, if, if Vivian was completely honest, well, he's been with me six years and we're gonna be together forever, so you're just a side bitch, then it's not gonna ever work. So it also depends how much control you have over your bottom bitch because you have to be able to have her on side playing the game. That's super important. So the key is it's you and everyone else. There is no hierarchy below you. Can you break down your own situation? So I got two main bitches. I'm gonna deal with my fire, gentlemen. I got two main girls. I got Melissa and Vivian. Now Melissa and Vivian started off together. After two years of slamming them every day together, tensions were getting a bit crazy. I mean, I could have held it together forever, but it was just to a point where it's just like, oh, shut up. So everyone made a happy agreement that they'd be separate. I'd still be with both of them, but they don't want to live together anymore. That's fine. When I bring on new girls, I usually pair them with Vivian. Because Vivian's younger. Melissa's like 28. Vivian's like 21. Vivian's younger. She's more fun, more outgoing. Melissa's really quite, not in a bad way. She's more homey, boring, sits at home. So it's, if you're going to pair a girl with a girl, it's much easier if the girl's fun. Well, let's all go to the club. Let's all drink champagne. Let's all do this. Let's go here. Let's go here. That's what it does. So since I've had Vivian, I've had five other girlfriends who I've shared with Vivian. Some last a couple weeks, some last a couple months, one lasted a year. So I've had Jenny, the dark haired one. I've had Andrada, the other one. I've, these are all on my Instagrams or my Twitter. You would have seen them at some point. I've had loads of hot girls who come in. Vivian's already there. They join, like I said, Vivian downplays it, blah, 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 blah. And for, and for different reasons, it, it breaks up. Like you've seen some of my threads about the dark haired girl who tried to give me an ultimatum or, or Jenny who went to the festival against the rules. Sometimes they rebel, I have to FDB them. But that's basically how it works. I've got my main bitch, my bottom bitch, Vivian. I could do it with Melissa too, but she's, you know, I just do it with Vivian for some reason, that's how it's worked out. My main bitch, Vivian, and I bring in new girlfriends and they're temporary. If I get one that sticks forever, whatever, good. I had one recently that stayed for a very long time. But um, if they leave, they leave, who gives a shit? I found a new one. That's my basic situation. I've got a girl calling me right now. I'm gonna hang up on her because I'm filming. Right. So a description of your relationship process with Vivian. So yeah, that's how it started. I met Vivian in, in Slovakia. We had a long-term relationship thing. I was living in England. It's a really long story. I don't want to tell you the whole story. I moved her to England to be with me to start doing my webcam company, which I started. If you don't have a webcam company, you need to look into it. Because as soon as you have a couple girls in love with you, it's the fucking easiest money in the world. No, I take that back. It's not easy money. You gotta build it up. But once you get girls built up, then it's free money. Like every other business, you gotta build it up. But I decided I, want, I decided I want to start a webcam business. Vivian's beautiful. I said, look, stop being a waitress, come here, live with me. She came. Everything was fine for a couple weeks. Melissa obviously lived in England. They didn't know about each other. They found out. They tried to have a big argument with me. I did exactly as I said, downplayed it, didn't give a shit. Everyone moved in together. Everyone started doing webcam. I was making loads of money. Then we agreed to the split, like we said. And that's basically been it. Since then, new girls have come along. Vivian understands that I'm fucking these hoes, but I don't care about these hoes. I've seen, I've done it. When I do it, I prove it to her. This is another important thing, guys. If you're gonna say to one girl, like you're the only one I care about, and she's gonna see you fucking these other girls, when those other girls eventually leave or you FDB them, you gotta use that to your advantage. So I'll come home sometimes to Vivian and say, Jenny's gone. She'll go, what? What do you mean Jenny's gone? Oh, she annoyed me, so I'm getting rid of her. What do you mean she annoyed you? Oh, she just something small, but she annoyed me, so bye. And they like that. She's like, well, you got rid of her over nothing? I was like, oh yeah, she annoyed me, FDB. And that makes her feel secure that these other girls, he really doesn't give a fuck. Like he'll just get rid of them for no reason. So you gotta use that to your advantage as well. And that's the basic dynamic of my relationship with Vivian. She now knows what I do. Last night, I just put in the war room telegram. If you're not in the war room as well, motherfuckers, you gotta get in on there. There's too much shit happening you're missing out on. I just put in the war room telegram, my text conversation with her last night. She goes, are you coming home? I said, no. She goes, what girl are you staying with? Vivian now is just nosy. She isn't jealous, she's just nosy. She's curious. 
Trust me, I'm staying with Ellen, Alina, or Elena, or whoever. Okay, all right, see you tomorrow. So it's, there's no secrets, no hiding. She knows I'm fucking all these girls. She doesn't care. So and if, if I want to fuck her with a girl, I'll say, look, we're going out. I'll just introduce booze. So like the first time I threw some, a lot of girls, I'll say, oh yeah, we're going out. Some other girls are coming. What girls? Girls I know. And Viv will turn up and we'll just be there. We're going to be drinking. I'll just say, I'll just say, I'm going to fuck you both. No, you're not. So I'm going to fuck you both. And Vivian will just like laugh. Just play it off. Ha ha ha. Very funny. All get in the taxi at the end. We're we going to my house. Just fucking just own it. Oh, I don't want to see you both. Okay, bye. See ya. I'll fuck Vivian then. What? Who's this? I thought she just worked for you. Who's this girl? You're supposed to be my boyfriend. Look, stop being fucking boring. We're going to my house. Shut up. Shh. I say, you just got to fucking own it. Say, come. Suck dick. Go on. All right. I'm not saying be a rapist. I feel like I always have to fucking clarify myself because to me it's super obvious, but there's some weirdos out there that don't fucking think. You cannot force a girl to do anything. You just have to make it clear of your objective. You're a train. A train stays on the track. I'm a train on this track. You either get on the train and go to the destination or you get off the train and you don't. Trains don't go off tracks. It's that simple. I'm fucking Vivian tonight. You're coming with me and you're helping me fuck Vivian or you're not. But this is where the train's headed. That's how you have to be. Don't be a creepy weirdo, please. Right. One more question I'm going to do for this video. I have a lot of questions I need to handle, but I'm going to do one more for this. Do I believe in negging girls? Negging girls is calling them names or saying something negative to them. That's some pickup artist bullshit that the red pill guys do. No, I don't believe in that. I believe you need to tease them, have a joke with them. Like, you know, everyone knows how to tease a girl like she's your kid sister, have a joke, but don't be negative, don't be aggressive. I've seen loads of dudes on dates just talking to a girl like shit, like it's super, like they're the man and it, it's not cool. You don't look cool, you look like a cunt. If you're deaf, if you're genuinely an alpha, you don't need to impose your superiority by insulting her. So. What you're trying to do by insulting her is bring her down a peg. Well, if you're already above her, you don't need to bring her down. So I don't think it's alpha to be out there insulting girls. But obviously you can tease her and make fun of her a little bit, of course. But once again, this comes to experience. This is down to experience. It depends on the girl you're talking to. You have to gauge the conversation, gauge who she is, and play it accordingly. So that's it for this episode. Another video coming soon. Right, questions. I can't build a high senior PhD course, blah, you're the man, blah, blah, blah. I can't build a very interesting Instagram. What should I do? Well, you need to build an interesting one, but you don't need to have that many pictures. If you were to take one day out of your life and get a good camera and put on a, some good clothes and take four or five good pictures, that's enough. Put them at the top. And even if a girl ever says to you, oh, you don't have much on Instagram, just say, yeah, I don't use social media very much. It's not really my thing. And if she tries to shit test you, She'll say, well, why'd you message me then? So, oh, I thought you were beautiful, so I thought I'd message you. But I don't, it doesn't mean I have to post on Instagram all the time. Just play it off. Like, I'm a cool cat. I'm not an Instagram dude. You know, I'm just a Mr. Normal dude. I'm not a fucking Mr. Show Off. So you haven't got to do, you haven't got to have, like me, pages and pages of supercars. You just need to have four or five good pictures. If you can't find four or five good pictures, well, there's something wrong with you. It ain't that hard. I'm sure you've been on holiday once in your life. Take some good pictures on the beach. Done. Get a picture of you in the gym. Get it from far away so you look muscly or some shit. It ain't that difficult. Make it happen. I, I shouldn't have explained this to you. Like, this is common sense stuff. Don't be stupid. Five or six good pictures, you can make it happen. Next, do you answer texts whenever you want or do you have rules for when you respond? I answer texts in real time. I don't believe in making girls wait. Message me, I message back. If they start making you wait, well, then it's different. Then you're going to have to, you know, return the favor or FDB them or whatever. But if a girl's messaging me, yeah, message them. What the fuck is normal? A lot of these little dominance tricks that people are taught, make her wait and all this bullshit, are just trying to feign dominance. If you have genuine dominance, you don't need to do that. You message me, I message you, everything's fine, da -da -da, yeah, let's go for coffee, okay, yeah, I'll message you later, da -da -da. everything's normal. There's no need for any of those things. If I have a girl who ignores me every time I message her, and that eventually decides to message me, well then yeah, I'm going to take my time on her. If she does message me first, I will reply, but I'll probably wait the same amount of time she made me wait. But in general, no. Do you have a call to set up dates? This is actually interesting. What I do when I'm texting girls on WhatsApp is, you, okay, tower of power, you're progressing. So you met her on the street or Tinder or Instagram, wherever. You got their WhatsApp, now you're WhatsApping them. 
after a day or after a day or even an hour, depending how long you spoke to them of WhatsApping them, I go on to voice notes because voice notes are that little bit more personal because they get to hear your voice. So I'll move from texting into voice notes. It's that tiny bit upgrade of personality. I don't do phone calls. If you see my Tate speech videos, I don't like phone calls, but I'll move into voice notes. The good thing about voice notes is as well, they don't have to answer it. If you call her, she might ignore the call. I'm, I'm busy or whatever. I'm driving. She'll ignore you. If you give her a voice note, she'll listen to it. So I actually do recommend after a little bit of texting to upgrade to voice notes. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Smoke a cigar, drink a little bit of whiskey, get your voice deep, sound like a G, and send her some voice notes. Because once again, it's a tiny bit more personal. And she might start sending them back to you. If she starts sending you voice notes back, 100% she wants to bang. 100%. So do I call the set updates? No, I use voice notes or I don't know. I, I, sometimes I organize a date by text. It doesn't really matter. But in general, I use voice notes. I, that's just something that came to my mind that I haven't mentioned before. You can use voice notes. It's really good. Um, or send pictures. What you do and she'll be like, oh, hey, how are you? Instead of just saying, I'm fine, you. I'll take a picture of my coffee. Picture of Dang. Yeah, I'm good, thanks. How are you? Just more, here's where I am. Here's who I am. Just to break the ice that little bit more to try and get her to agree to me. All about the tower of power. Remember, progression at all times. So don't do it as soon as you get her number. Don't get her number and be like, hey, hey, hi, how are you? Duh. Talk to her a little bit first. Don't be a weirdo. But after you spoke to her a little bit, then you can hit her with it. Next question. Tips for trying to close a deal once you got the girl alone at your place. Now, this is actually a really interesting question because if the girls come to your place alone, she knows what's going down. Like... She's not stupid. Unless she's really stupid, she knows what's going down. So the only reason it's not going to happen is if she changes her mind, which might happen. She might change her mind. So you have to be prepared for that. But if a girl comes to my house, one second. Yo. Hello? This is why I don't do phone calls. I fucking hate phone calls. Hello? Fuck sake. I don't do phone calls. Anyway. Um, if a girl comes to your house, she wants to bang. So she might change her mind. So if a girl comes to my house, my routine is very simple. What I do is I go up to my cinema. You may not have a cinema, I made a TV. I put on a movie. I always put on a horror movie. Don't put on music. I've seen a lot of people go, well, let's put on music. If you put on music and the girl's drinking and drunk, she wants to party, she wants to have fun, yay, she wants to stay up. You don't want her to stay up. You want her in bed. So after the club, if we come home, we got girls, and they come in, they go, let's put music on. I say, no, 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 not music, put on a movie. Because I've noticed before, you start putting music on, you get a bottle of all gout, it's another three hours of partying. It's just like, oh, please, just, I want to bang, this is boring. So no music. You can't put on an action movie, it's the wrong vibe. You can't put on a rom-com, you're not gay. So it's got to be a horror movie. Horror movies, you're quiet during, you sit, you're quiet. Horror movie. So we come in, I put on a horror movie, offer a drink, get some wine, whatever, whatever, pour a couple glasses of wine. Usually I come downstairs to pour it. I usually pour her wine and I pour myself water. Because I don't like being, I don't like having sex when I'm super drunk. If I've been drinking all night in the club and then we go back, I don't want to be like getting to get really hammered and be sloppy. So I'm just, I, by then I know what's going to happen. I just start drinking water, give them wine, whatever, whatever. Sit upstairs, I'll watch the movie for five to six minutes before I start to kiss her on the couch. That's it, because she doesn't give a fuck. She can come to my house to watch no movie. She ain't stupid. Five to six minutes, we'll start kissing for a minute or so. I'll stand up, get her hand, and walk towards the bedroom. And she either follows me or she doesn't. She comes with me, she wants to bang. She goes, oh no, I can't, I can't. I say, oh, you wanna watch a horror movie? Oh yeah, so you're not gonna be scared. I'll make a joke out of it, I'll play it down. Well, not if you're here. I was like, all right, well, I'll watch it for a little bit. Sit down, more wine, kiss her again, then say, look, I'm going to bed. You want to go home or do you want to come to bed? Oh, I'm going to leave. Okay, no problem. Get a taxi, go. I'm playing games. The whole, the whole thing's about 20 minutes, 30 minutes. I'm very clear with my intention. She ain't stupid. She's an adult. She came to my house at four in the morning. The fuck we dare to do? Play chess? Even though I enjoy that, none of these bitches are good in that. So no, we're not there to play chess. We're there to fuck. So that's basically it. I mean, I don't think it's difficult to close a deal. If they come to your house, they should know what's going down. Unless you're in the friend zone. If you're in the friend zone or some bullshit, then it's hard. Let me get some more wood for my fire. 
But if you're in the friend zone, hold that. If you're in the friend zone and you can't close the deal, and then you're, then you're asking these stupid questions. Because if you're in the friend zone, you fucked up already. You already haven't been doing the tower of power. You already haven't been doing your progression. And now you're asking me, well, how are you going to fuck your friends? Well, you can't. That's why the friend zone's so toxic. That's why you cut off your attention if they don't want to ban. But if you meet a girl, you get her number, you meet a girl on Instagram. You get her WhatsApp. You start WhatsApping her. Then you start voice noting her. You agree to go for coffee. You go for coffee. You agree to go for dinner. You go for dinner. You say, come over, chill at mine. She comes over to chill. She knows what's going down. Now, maybe she may not want to fuck you the first night she comes over to chill. Maybe the first night she'll want to go home. Cool. But the second night she will. It's not a big rush. Just cool it. You, haven't, you don't want to come across needy. You don't want to come across desperate. So if a girl ever says to you, oh, no, not tonight. The instant answer is, yeah, all right, cool. You don't try. Do not be the guy like, oh, stay. Uh, uh. It's super unattractive. It's super desperate. Never do that. If a girl goes to me, oh, I can't stay with you tonight. Cool. And then they get pissed off that you don't care. It's like, well, it's, it's a subtle form of FDB. What do you mean, cool? I thought you'd come in. In her head, she's thinking, I came here thinking I was going to bang and I wasn't sure. And now I told him I don't want to bang and he doesn't give a fuck. Does he even like me? I'll flip it on him. Flip it on him. Like I told you in the first, the first course. Get a taxi, come to mine. No, I'm going to go home. All right, cool. I'll get you a taxi. Instantly, bang. Flip it on him. Give them what they want and watch them lose their minds. So you don't try. Then maybe the second time you'll fuck her, whatever. But just be clear with your intention. And she's coming over for a reason, so it ain't that difficult. There. Hello. My name is Tristan Tate. Now you've purchased the Andrew Tate How to Be a G course, so I imagine many of you know who I am. I'm Andrew's younger brother and a very good friend of Christian's. Now there are very few things about game that you could teach a man like Christian McQueen. However, when guys like us get together, we talk, we exchange tips, and I hit him with the genius way I organize the contacts in my phone. He's now using the same system, and as people who have bought the How To Be A G course, he thought I should share it with you. The way I organize my phone is very complex, because I'm a man who does a lot of different approaches, I use a lot of dating apps, I meet a lot of women. So I need a way of filing them in a way that I don't lose track. I first developed the system some years ago. What happened was I had approached a beautiful girl. I got her number and I was messaging her very hard on WhatsApp for a day or two. I was then messaging too many other girls, too many other people, and I lost track of her. Nine days later, she hit me with a message. I guess you don't really want to meet up then. No matter how I tried to explain my way out of it and say, baby, it's okay, let's still go out. She said, you've been on WhatsApp for nine days online every day and you haven't written me once. You're obviously a player. I'm tired of guys like you and I never met her again. The way I organize my phone is based on three different elements. One, the priority of the girl in question, how important she is to me. Now, this is either based on looks or her commitment level to you. Your main chick and your girlfriends, for example, are more important than the girls you'll call late night after the club. The second element is the name. Now the name isn't just what their name is. For example, here in Romania, Andrea is a very popular name. My phone has seven Andreas in it, so you need a way of knowing which Andrea is which. The third is the location. It's good to know where the girls in your phone are located. For example, if you go to a city once every six months or once every three months, it's good to know who you have in that city that you could potentially meet up with. If I were to store a contact in my phone, this is how it's done. First, a number between one and three. The number between one and three is the girl's priority. For example, when I wake up every morning, I press one in my phone book and all the girls that appear with the number one next to their name are the ones I message first thing. The, hey baby, I was, had a dream about you last night. I hope to see you real soon. Now these are your main chicks, your girlfriends, the girls that you really love banging and you see three or four times a week. These are your ones. Your twos are the girls that you care about, but not as much as your number ones. The girls who think you're busier than you are, but you see once every 10 days, every two weeks. There's something about her you really appreciate and you really like, but she's never gonna be a main chick. When a two sends you a message, you reply to a two immediately, but you don't necessarily have to message her every morning when you wake up.
You have to take care of your twos because you don't want to lose them because they matter to you somewhat, but you don't have to maintain them constantly like you do with your most important girls. Your threes are the kind of girls that you call after a night out. It's five o'clock, you're in the club, you're bored, that's when you message your threes. If they message you at a time like that, reply. But a three is not so important that when she messages you, she can instantly demand your time. You manage your threes on your own terms. When you get bored and you're sitting on your phone for three hours waiting at the airport, message your ones, twos, and threes. Keep all your girls entertained, keep all of them interested. Now this priority system would have stopped me from making the mistake that I made with that girl. I would have saved her as a one because she was stunningly hot. I was actively pursuing her and trying to bang her. So for those nine days that I ignored her, she would have got a good morning message every single morning. Saving a girl's name is very important to do correctly. And there are many girls who have the same name. If you do a lot of approaches and you're trying to meet lots of different women, you're going to encounter some girls that you don't even remember meeting, especially when you're out in clubs drunk. So when you save their contact details, make it as clear as you like. What I like to do is her name followed by her Instagram handle so I can always check how hot she is and follow up on how good she looks to make sure that my eyes weren't deceiving me after 20 bottles of vodka. The girl's name is Andrea, for example, her Instagram tag, or Andrea the blonde I met in this club. That's the way to save your girl's names. That way you can't make a mistake and you can't do what I've done, Christian has done, and Andrew have done many times before, which is confuse a girl for somebody else. You instantly lose them. The third most important thing to put when you're saving a contact in your phone is the city name. Now this takes a very long time for it to actually become useful, but as you slowly build up your contacts list as a man who travels and does approaches worldwide like me, you slowly accumulate a list of girls in various cities. So if there are cities you visit once every six months or once every three months, me, Marbella, for example, I can go to Marbella, type Marbella into my phone book, and the six or seven numbers I have in Marbella will appear. You can then hit that girl with a, hey babe, just came to Marbella, you're the first person I thought of. She'll reply, oh my God, I didn't know you still remembered me. Doesn't matter if you remembered her. You know she lives in Marbella because the contact is saved as Marbella. So to recap, every time you save a girl's number in your phone, if I'm in New York City and I approach a beautiful brunette named Samantha, she's not that good looking, but I definitely want to see her if I'm there, I'd save her as three Samantha, her Instagram handle, and New York City. When I'm in New York six months down the line and I type, type New York City, I can see Samantha's number is there. If Samantha was a 10 out of 10 gorgeous girl who lived here in my city of Bucharest, I'd save her as one Samantha Bucharest. That way, every day when I wake up, I type number one in my phone, Samantha appears along with my other priority girls, the girls I have, the girls I badly want, and she gets messaged every single day. There's no chance I'll forget her. Disclaimer, the one, two, and three, depending on the operating system of your phone, you have to be careful. With my phone, the Tonino Lamborghini, typing the number one comes up with my contacts that start with one. I do realize that with some phones, if you press one, it will start to dial a number one or show every number with a one in it, in which case you simply save it as O-N-E, phonetically spell the number one, two, and three, but it is the same system. Whether you're new to the game of approaching and dating multiple women, or it's something you already do, I hope you find this system useful. Thanks for listening. Welcome to the six week Iron Mind training. If you bought this course, you may have seen one of my first videos. If not, the link is gonna be below here where I explain the secrets to having an Iron Mindset. So I'm gonna preach the virtues of an Iron Mindset. I know all of you bought, bought this because you understand how important it is to have a mindset of iron, but I'm gonna sit here and once again explain to you how different the world is when you have a mind which isn't warped and affected easily by outside influences. You are never gonna become a robot. This has nothing to do with not feeling emotions. This has nothing to do with just becoming an empty, emotionless void of a person. That's not what this is. This is about understanding that you're a human being. You're going to feel emotions. This is a beautiful thing. And making sure that you use them in the correct way. A. And B, you do not ever let them stop you doing what you're supposed to do. I say to people often, I haven't felt like going to the gym in two years. I'm wearing my gym clothes right now. I just finished training. 
I haven't felt like training in two years. I, after 10 years of professional fighting, after giving my life to exercise, genuinely, I have not woke up and felt like, oh, I really want to train. I haven't felt that way in a long time. That's why I retired from fighting. But I have still gone and I have still trained regardless of how I feel. So this is one of the tenets, and there's going to be a lot of things you're going to learn, of an iron mindset. It's the ability to not let your feelings affect you and sometimes to do the complete opposite of how you feel. Because you're not going to very often feel like working hard. You're not going to always feel like doing the right thing. You're not always going to be motivated. The idea that you need to be constantly motivated shows how weak your mindset is. I don't need motivation to go to the gym. I cannot want to go with every fiber of my being and I will still be there because I use my cerebral ability, I use my mind and I logically decide what I'm going to do with my day regardless of how I feel, regardless of whether I'm motivated or not. This course is going to be six weeks that's going to teach you how to put together a mindset that allows you to get things done because that's all life is and that's all the world is. Life is just getting things done doing the right things, doing the important things, making sure they're done efficiently and thoroughly so that you live the best possible life. It's as simple as that. It's not particularly complicated. A lot of the lessons that you would need to learn, I gave out in my free video. So if you've not seen that video, once again, the link is below, watch that video for a start because that teaches you some very, very important things about where your mind should be to begin. And this six week training is gonna be about exercises you can do to teach yourself slowly over time to put together a mindset that prevents you from failure. Because if you have a mindset that doesn't allow you to fail, then you're simply going to win. There's no other option. So that's what this is all about. So in the first week, we're going to learn something which is extremely basic, but it's extremely important. I'm not going to be, and I don't want to be one of those guys who's like motivation, inspirational. Da -da. I've never been one of them people. I don't believe in motivation, inspiration. I don't believe in that crap. I don't believe that you need motivation to get things done. I'm not going to sit here and just talk a whole bunch of motivational things to make you feel good. What I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you the things I always did that allowed me to put together the mindset I currently have. So if you look at any story, literally any story with a hero in it, they all have one thing in common. And that thing is that there's always a villain. You cannot have a hero without a villain. It doesn't matter. You can think of any superhero, any comic book, any, any book you can think of, any movie. There's always a good guy and there's a bad guy. So for the good guy to exist, there has to be a bad guy. There's no other way for the duality of the universe to continue without this basic tenet. So you want to be the good guy in your story. You want, and in every, I've said this before actually, as a man, life is going to be difficult. It's more difficult than being a woman. It's more difficult than anything else. So it's very easy to see yourself. Life is actually easier as a whole if you see yourself as a hero. Because in every single hero story, the hero suffers. He has a hard time. And if you understand that you're suffering because you're a hero, then the suffering begins to make sense. So you can be sitting here right now and go, my woman doesn't respect me. I have no money in the bank. This is difficult. I, I'm struggling here. I'm struggling there. You can feel sorry for yourself. Or you can say, yeah, my woman doesn't respect me. I'm struggling. I can't make money. But you know what? That's because that's I'm a fucking superhero. And my life's going to be hard because I'm a man. And as a hero, it's going to be difficult. These are the tests and the trials and the tribulations I have to go through to become someone. Every single male superhero went through a whole ton of shit before he became superhero. You've seen the Batman movies. He was, his parents died. He was, he was locked up in jail. All these bad things happen, and then they emerge as the hero. And this is done for a reason, because it's the reality of life, especially as a man. So right now, you have to understand that you're the hero in this movie. And if you're struggling, you're struggling for a very important reason. And how you handle these struggles and how you deal with these struggles is going to de decide the kind of person you're going to be afterwards. You're either going to be a superhero or you're going to succumb to them and you're going to fail. So be happy that you're struggling because that's important. That's the first thing. Second thing is there has to be a villain. Now, most people think their villain is someone else. You see this all the time. The villain's the opposite of the hero. So if you're sitting at home and you haven't got much money and you're, and you're broke and you're pissed off and you're depressed and you look at me and I have four supercars and all these girls, I'm traveling the world, I go everywhere I want, you may think I'm your villain. People look at other people and think, oh, that guy has this, this guy has this, and they become envious and they think that's the villain. That's not true. That's not the case because every single person has different circumstances. There are things you have that I don't have and there's things I have that you don't have. So I may have had a genetic gift over you, for example, because I'm, I'm a fantastic kickboxer. But you may have been born more wealthy than me. I was born in a very, very poor family. So I had advantages and disadvantages. You had adva advantages and disadvantages. So comparing yourself to other people is, is asinine, and it's inane because it's not a level fair playing ground. There are some people who are born to millionaire parents who are gorgeous, model, good looking, and have six packs without trying. Some people are lucky like that. That's just how it is. So comparing yourself to these people is not going to help you. Your villain is nobody else. Your villain is someone you're going to create. And you're going to create your villain because he's going to motivate you to be the most powerful hero you can possibly be. So you're going to create your villain. And this is the task 
for the first week. This is a six week training course and over each week you have a very important task. And the task for this week is to create your villain. To make sure that there was no disadvantages involved, your villain is going to be a clone of you. But what your villain is going to have is he's going to have some things you don't have. And your villain is going to be the person who basically, without requirement for motivation, without requirement, without being, no matter how he feels that day, no matter how stressed he is from work, regardless of what happens to him, your villain is going to be the guy who always does exactly what he wants to do. So your villain is going to be the guy who goes to the gym regardless of how he feels. Your villain is going to be the guy who approaches every beautiful girl he ever sees and says, hey, I, I really think you're beautiful. He goes over to him and talks to them. Your villain is going to be the guy who asks for a raise at work. Your villain is going to be the guy who does everything he wants, regardless of how he feels, regardless if he's not motivated or not, regardless if he's shy to talk to that girl or people are watching or his ankle hurts, he doesn't want to go to the gym, whatever. Or his boss is, he thinks his boss is going to fire him. Your villain is that dude who does anything he wants to do. So for this week, you have to sit and you have to make a list of all the things. You have to sit there and say, if I did everything I wanted to do, if I were to be the best version of myself possible, what would I do? Okay, well, I'd go to the gym every day. I'd get up at 6 a.m. and I'd go to the gym every day. You write that down. I'd approach every beautiful girl I ever see and I'd introduce myself and try and get their Instagram or their number. You'd write that down. For example, I'd start a side business. Even though I don't know anything about it, I'd learn how to make websites. My villain's the kind of guy who would sit there and he'd learn how to do it by himself and he'd start his own online business. Write that down. My villain's the kind of guy who reads really important books. I'm, I, I say I don't have time. But my enemy, this villain, he reads books. He finds time. He doesn't watch TV ever. He doesn't waste time ever. He doesn't eat junk food. He reads books. Writes it down. And you have to make a list. Now, this list at first should be easy for you. But then you're going to get to about seven or eight things and you're going to stop. No, this list needs to be 25 to 30 points long, minimum. This guy you're building, your arch nemesis, you have to write down every single quality about this guy. What he does. He goes to the gym every day, 6 a.m. He doesn't watch TV. He doesn't eat junk food. He goes up to beautiful girls, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 25 or 30 points long because this is going to become your enemy for the next six weeks of training. You want to become a hero. You need someone to battle against. This is who you're battling against. You're battling against a better version of yourself, a version of yourself that doesn't succumb to how he feels but does what he's supposed to do anyway. So this is who your villain is going to be. And when you're writing down this list, all the qualities your villain has, imagine what this person looks like. You have to put genuine effort into this. You have to imagine what he looks like, imagine how he walks, imagine how he talks, imagine what people think when they see him. Imagine how different you would be if you had been going to the gym every single day for an hour and a half, every single day for the last two, three, four years. Imagine it. Imagine how differently people would look at you. Imagine how differently females would, would treat you if you were jacked like that guy would be. You have to sit and you have to put down all these qualities and then once the qualities are there, 25 or 30 minimum, then you have to imagine what kind of person this is. You have to imagine what he looks like, what he talks like, what he thinks like. Imagine how he views the world because this is who you're going to be battling against. So you have to put genuine effort into constructing this person and understanding this person. The reason I'm saying do this is because this is what motivates me every single day. When I was training for a fight, the reason I'd always go train is because I knew my enemy was training. But when I stopped fighting professionally, I thought, well, I don't what enemy do I have? And I realized I had to create my own. So when I don't feel like going to the gym, I imagine I've built my own enemy. I won't even list all the things that my enemy has. He has a whole bunch of shit I don't have. And he's a, a, he would be an impossible, nearly impossible person to be. But when I sit and I don't feel like going to the gym, I know my enemy's training because he trains no matter what, regardless of how he feels, regardless if he's pissed off or if there's traffic or it's raining or he's tired, my enemy trains. When I see a girl and she's beautiful, but all her friends are there, I'm afraid they're going to laugh at me, my enemy wouldn't give a fuck. He'd go over there anyway. That's who he is. He's a man. So when I understood who I was truly battling against, then you have two choices. You either rise up to try and take him on or you become a little pussy. You have the choice. Do I want to lose to this man, this man I've created and I've built? Do I want to lose to him or do I want to beat him or compete with him? And you have to make a choice and you sit there and go, well, I know that the person I created in my mind, my, my arch nemesis would go over there and he'd talk to all the girls and he'd fuck two of them let alone one. This is an extremely important facet. And for the next six weeks, we're going to be doing lots of things that are going to revert back to the enemy that you've created. So you'd have to put genuine effort into putting together this person. You have to imagine everything about them from start to finish. You have to imagine standing next to them. If you were standing next to this guy right now with no shirt on, who would girls want to fuck? Who would people respect? And the crazy thing about all of this is that this person is you. This person is you. It's just you with a little bit of a different 
path or a different take on life. It's you who's the person who does whatever he's supposed to do regardless of how he feels. It's you with an iron mind. This is the exact point of it. The reason creating this enemy is so important and the reason viewing how he, viewing him and seeing how he sees the world and, and understanding how important and powerful this person is, is important is because that person is you. That person is you who does what he's supposed to do without fail. That's all it is. And when you truly, truly put this person together and you truly, truly understand him and you find out what you could be and you find out what you're battling against, you're going to become far more difficult to demotivate. It's going to be much harder for someone to say to you, don't go to the gym because you're going to know, well, my, my enemy, this guy, give him a name, whatever. This dude's going to the gym. That's why he looks how he looks. And that's who I'm being compared to. So I have to go to the gym. Oh yeah, but you know, I'm tired. Well, you don't go then. My training partner doesn't want to go. Fine, you don't go. I am going. I'm not the guy who's going to let this man beat me. And you have to start comparing yourself to this guy in every single facet. I still do it to this day. I compare my bank balance to this guy's and he's killing me. I compare my body to this guy's, he's killing me. I compare so many things about myself. You guys may look at me and go, oh, take millionaire, girls, this, that, that, that. I'm still comparing myself to this person I've created. And I know that I'm losing. And that's what drives me forward. That's why I don't miss the gym. That's how I find a way to make money. That's how I do whatever it takes to succeed because I know who I'm battling against. Most of you guys have no enemy. You have no enemy. Or you have an enemy which is somebody else. You're looking at Justin Bieber or Drake or some shit. That, that's not going to motivate you. That's pointless. It's not going to help you. Or you have no enemy at all. You have a support structure around you and you have people who say, oh, you're great just the way you are. You know, you're beautiful just the way you are. And you're sitting there and living in your little comfort zone like a little bitch. Bullshit. Put this enemy together from start to finish. Feel free to email me the list. Email me the list. I'll see if there's anything you've missed out. My email address is at the bottom of the screen. Feel free to email me your list. I'll compare it to my list and we'll see if there's anything you've missed out. But this is going to be the most important thing across the next six weeks we're going to keep referring back to. And when you truly put this list together, you truly create this person and truly understand that it could be you, it's going to be far more difficult to stop you doing what you need to do in the future. So, you fashioned your enemy. Your enemy is the version of you which doesn't take shit. Your enemy is the version of you which goes to the gym every single day. And if you've done this correctly, then what you should be doing by now is thinking of him permanently. Every single time you go to the gym and you haven't done that one extra rep, he did. Every single time you don't feel like doing something, you have to think, yeah, but he would do it. If you truly constructed him the way you should, he should be crossing your mind with every single thing you do. And this is why it's important to develop an ego. This is lesson two of the Iron Mind course, is to develop an ego. Egos are extremely important. Egos have always existed. Throughout ancient history, men, kings, went to war and millions of people died because someone insulted him because of his ego. Egos are a natural human thing and they're extremely important. And the modern world tells men to not have an ego. And they do that because it makes you weak and easy to control. You can only have an iron mind if you are so sure of yourself, so egotistical that nobody can break it. So an ego is extremely important. Now, for the first lesson we built your enemy and we built this perfect person you're going to be battling against and there's a very specific reason we did it based on a version of you. One, because it shows who you could be. But the other reason is also because if your ego is based around beating this person, you get to go through life and be a nice guy to everyone else. People say don't have an ego because if you, they think that if you, they give you an ego or you have an ego, you're going to be egotistical to the people you meet. I'm a nice guy to everyone I meet because they're not my enemy. I'm not combating against them. I'm a nice guy to every person. I'm a nice guy to every woman. I say please and thank you. I'm a nice person. But I do have a massive ego. But my ego comes into play when I'm fighting against my enemy. Listen, did you fuck your wife yesterday? Maybe you did. So imagine this guy fucked your wife. He would have fucked her better than you did. And this should inspire your ego. The person you're battling against is beating you. And this person is who you could be. That's what's the most annoying thing about it. This person's outlifting you in the gym. They're making more money. They're fucking their wife better. They've got more girls. They're rolling around a nicer car. This could be you, but it's not you. Only because you don't have the motivation to do what this individual does. Nothing to do with genetics. Nothing to do with luck. This person is you and they're beating you. And this should inspire your ego. Most people's egos work against them. And the way it works against them is they feel entitled. They wake up and they think, oh, I deserve a nice car. I'm a special person. I deserve a nice car. And then when they don't get a nice car, they get disheartened and annoyed. That is not the right way to use an ego. An ego should be used as in, I deserve a nice car, so I'm gonna go fucking get one. That's an ego. So this person who you've built, your enemy, he has a nice car because he has worked harder than you have. 
So he has a nice car and you don't have one. Whose fault is it? There should be no reason, no excuse for you to not do everything that you believe you need to do to be the best person you can be if you've properly created this enemy. You've looked at this list, 25 to 30 points long of everything this guy does. And you should look at that list and think, fuck, this is who I'm competing against. I need to start getting my shit together. And, and your ego should stop you from wanting to lose. Otherwise, day after day after day, you are losing to this individual. This individual is beating you day after day after day. You can't let that happen. Your ego is ex extremely important. And you only have one person you're competing against. And it's the person you created, which is nothing more than a better version of yourself. So day by day, you're losing this battle. And that should make you uncomfortable, it should make you nervous, it should make you anxious. So you start to feel that way, because this is the truth. If you've truly imagined who your enemy is, and you truly imagine them beating you, you should not be able to relax. The fact that you can still sit and watch TV means you need to go back to the first video of this course and start again, and do it properly, and do it well enough so that you can no longer sit still. You look at yourself in the mirror and go, okay, yeah, I've got some muscle, but this guy, he's got real muscle. I've got a little bit of money. This guy, he, he hustles nonstop. He's on Twitter nonstop. He's started businesses. He's learned how to make websites. He's trading crypto. He's, he's got all of Tate's programs. He's got this, he's got that. You need to get your shit together. And if you do that properly, you'll start to feel nervous. You'll imagine the version of you that is as amazing as they could be. And then you look at yourself and realize that you're failing. This is the reality. And you'll sit there and go, fuck. Now, when you feel anxious, there's only one thing you can do. You can either sit there and be anxious like a little girl and be worried about it, or you can put some things in action. I was nervous before every single fight, and that's when I fought the best, because I was afraid. I was afraid of losing. And you need to be afraid of losing day by day throughout your life. You know your enemy, you know what he's doing, and you're losing day by day. Now, if you go to the gym and you beat your personal best, let's say the most you've ever benched is 100 kilo, you go there, you bench 105 kilo. The days you beat your personal best are the days you've beaten this individual. That's the only day you're allowed to claim a victory. If you beat your personal best, you can claim a victory. I went there, I did more than I've ever done, I beat this guy. But if you're not beating your personal best, he is beating you. And that should inspire you to try and smash through your own records day after day after day. The most money you've ever made in a month. The most weight you've ever lifted. The most girls you've ever spoke to. It doesn't matter what goals you set. You have to understand that you're gonna spend a lot of time losing. And all this time you're spending losing is gonna damage your ego and that's gonna make you anxious and unhappy and nervous and you're gonna put all that nervous energy into smashing your personal records so you have those days of victory. Everything compounds. What most people don't understand is they think that life just changed overnight. Everything compounds. People say to me, oh Tay, how did you become successful? I can't tell you the one thing that made me successful. I was always driven, motivated. I understood how to make good connections. I looked after the people who looked after me. I always knew what the right thing to do was. I didn't drink for many years of my life. I didn't do this, I didn't do that, but I did do this. And it all comes together to success. It's not about one thing. A lot of people go through life with a very average attitude to life and they wait for their one big break. Yeah, maybe you'll get it, but that's not the reality. If you're hoping for a big break, you may as well just keep buying the lottery tickets. You have to build your big break. And you're gonna do that with a, a thousand tiny victories. It's a change of mindset that's gonna allow you to put together a thousand tiny victories. And the change of mindset is simply understanding that there is a version of you that exists somewhere in the multiverse, which is much better than you are right now. They have the same start, the same genetic composition, but they are destroying you in every measurable metric purely because they don't get lazy, don't get tired, don't watch TV, don't waste their time. They have an iron mind. And that person is gonna become you now. That is who you are fighting against. In this lesson of the Iron Mind course, is gonna be a happy lesson. All of our previous lessons were about creating enemies and understanding that you have to fight a battle against the enemy you create and how difficult life can be. And in this lesson, we're gonna do something that's a little bit more positive so you can smile. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about gratitude. I have learned the hard way that it is impossible to be grateful for things that you have in abundance. Everybody knows this. I, I'm stating the obvious here. Everyone talks about how if you were born a millionaire kid, you wouldn't appreciate money. It's absolutely the same with absolutely everything else. And no matter how hard you try, no matter how hard you try and check yourself and appreciate your current situation, you're never gonna appreciate it if you have it in abundance. The easiest way to be grateful for your life and appreciate things is to self-censor. Now, this takes self-control, but we've already discussed how your enemy has self-control and how if you're gonna compete against him, you're gonna need self-control. So for this reason, you now have self-control. I'm gonna tell you something. By reducing your time spent or money spent or energy spent on the things you like, not only do you become a more productive worker and you get more stuff done, 
But two, you appreciate those things more and you end up genuinely happier. So I'll give you some examples. It's a sunny day today. On sunny days, I like driving my Lamborghini around and showing off. And sometimes when I really feel like driving it, I don't allow myself. I'll take a bike and I'll go pedal my bike instead or I'll train extra hours in the gym or I'll do some work. So when I really want to drive it, even though I have the time to drive it, even though I could drive it, I do not drive it. And the reason I do that is I deliberately prevent myself from doing something I want. So when I get back in that car the next day or a couple days later, I appreciate it. If I drove the car anytime I wanted to, I might still even like it, I might still enjoy it, but I will never appreciate it. Now when I get in that car, I appreciate my car. And that's because I stop myself from using it as often as I want to use it. Humans were never built for the abundance we live in today. We live in an abundance which we were never designed to have. We were designed to barely, barely scrape enough calories from the surroundings to survive and sit around in the dirt wishing for more than what we had. We were not designed to be able to get food anytime we wanted. That's why people are fat. To get satisfaction and entertainment anytime we wanted. That's why people can't pay attention anymore. The human mind is not evolved to live the life we're living. So you have two choices. You either cave to that completely and you give in to consumerism and you end up obese and have attention deficit disorder because you're too busy watching YouTube videos to concentrate on anything important. Or you censor yourself and you prevent yourself from having as much as you want and that's how you build an iron mindset. So I'm gonna give you a few examples of things you can do because now I know not all of you have Lamborghinis. That was a pretty first world example, but I'll give you some other examples of things that I have done. Now, I actually developed this and learned this tactic when I was fighting because fighting makes you sense yourself. When you're training for a fight, you can't drink alcohol. You have to eat correctly. You have to sleep correctly. So when my fight camp would be over, the idea of staying up late and having a beer and eating an ice cream was amazing. To most people, that's every fucking day and they don't give a shit. But to me, the idea of just cracking open a beer and drinking it and not thinking about it as anything other than, oh, I want a beer. When I did that after a fight camp, I was smiling ear to ear, genuinely, because I hadn't touched alcohol for eight weeks. So by preventing myself from having alcohol, not only was I more grateful in the end, like people had beer all the time, that doesn't make them happy, it's just something they do. Not only was I more grateful in the end, not only was I happier, I was also in better physical condition. I also didn't spend money on beer. And this is the exact point. If you restrict yourself from the things you want, not only do you enjoy them more in the end, not only do you end up happier, you usually end up in better physical and financial shape for it. So there's a whole bunch of stuff you do right now that you enjoy. Everyone has things they enjoy and that's fine. You absolutely should have things you enjoy. You've made your list of, of your enemy. Obviously he's a machine, he's a robot. He doesn't waste much time, but we're all humans. You're competing with him, but there's still some things you enjoy which aren't completely essential. You need to learn to restrict those things or delay those things so that you appreciate them more. Happiness and gratefulness are basically the same thing. If you're grateful for what you have, you're gonna be a pretty happy person. And a happy mind is an iron mind. The idea of being a robot and being, I've got an iron mind, nothing affects me, that's not, that's not a good life. A good life is a happy person who, when the struggles of life come, they can just glide over the bumps. That's the kind of person you wanna be. And you're going to do that by making yourself more grateful and you're going to make yourself more grateful through scarcity. So across the next couple of days, here's what I want you to do. I want you to choose each day if you're going to allow yourself to eat or to drink. You have to make a choice. Because these are things you do every day. You eat some food, you drink some water, and you don't care about it. And you're not grateful for either one. So each day you're going to wake up and you're going to decide. I'm either going to drink whatever I want today. Coffee, water, orange juice, smoothie, whatever. Or I'm going to eat whatever I want today and I'm gonna be thirsty. At the end of either one of those days, you're gonna be pissed off you made the choice you made and you would wish you made the other one. And you'll be grateful for all the times you've had a meal with a nice cold glass of water with it, or all the times you had a cold glass of water with a nice meal with it. For the next three or four days, you have to make a choice each morning. Stick to it, don't be a pussy. You've had enough of the other lessons. If you're struggling to stick to it, watch the other videos. Don't be a pussy and choose. Next three or four days, choose food or war. At the end of the four days, you can allow yourself to have both together. And you will feel a whole new appreciation for the most basic thing in the world, a meal and a cold glass of water, I guarantee you. Because for three or four days, it was always a choice. You're waking up in the morning, you wake up, your mouth's dry, but you're hungry as fuck from yesterday. So which one is it? You have to make the choice. So when you get to a situation where you can have two things together, two very basic, simple things together, you're gonna appreciate both of them more. So this is the first exercise you're gonna do across the next three or four days. The idea being is you need to learn how to remember that feeling. 
Now, I know this sounds stupid, but feelings can be remembered. If you listen to a sad song, or if you think of a sad event, the feeling comes back. You remember the feeling. People very rarely remember gratefulness. They don't remember feeling content with something. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna put yourself in a position of stress, you're gonna relieve that stress, you're gonna feel content, and then you're gonna try and remember that feeling. Everything about it. Remember how you're sitting, remember where you are, remember that feeling and give yourself a memory that you can resort, revert back to any time in the future and you will automatically feel grateful. So I have this from fighting. I can literally right now, I can think back to that time when I just lost 10 kilos and been in the sauna for two days and hadn't had a drop of water and lost all that weight and then I had my first glass of water. I can remember that and I'm smiling already, literally. Genuinely, I can remember how that felt. Because I've had these extreme situations, super extreme situations, whereas when they were relieved, I remember how thankful I was. So I have countless memories in my life that I can revert back to that allow me to instantly feel grateful for what I have right now, for the most basic things in the world. Money is another fantastic thing to do this with. Right now, check your bank account. Hopefully you're broke. If you're broke, this is going to be really easy. Check your bank right now. You're broke. Okay, good. When you get some money in your bank and you smile, remember that feeling. This video is a short video, but this is very, very important. You can email me now after watching this video and tell me what you're going to do to put yourself in a position of stress, how you're going to relieve it, and then once you've relieved it, once you are sitting there and you're feeling content and happy, you need to remember that feeling and I want you to email it to me and describe it to me. Now this isn't going to work if you don't put yourself in a situation of extreme stress. If you're thirsty for 30 minutes then have a glass of water, you're not going to be happy enough to be able to hack your brain to truly remember that feeling. You need to suffer. Gentlemen, you need to be two hours sleep a night for two days in a row. Or the no food, no water, back and forth. I don't care if it takes a week, two weeks, until you literally can't handle it anymore. And when you're on absolute edge, that's when you give in, because only then you'll be able to hack your brain to remember that memory. You need a plethora of memories in your mind that you can revert to that will instantly make you happy and grateful and feel gratitude for what you have. If you have those things that you can revert to anytime you want, it's almost like being a... Uh, like Popeye, you can bust out the spinach anytime you need it. And that's genuinely the way I live my life. If I, I, I'm a happy person, but if I'm ever pissed off or really, really stressed or I'm, I'm work ain't going right and my Lamborghini won't start and girl, one of my girlfriends is being a dick and, the, and the, well, the, got an electricity bill that's six grand and whatever, 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 I can sit there and go, yeah, but at least I'm not broke. Because when I was broke, and I can think about that exact memory. Or I can sit and go, well, at least I have war. I can think about that exact memory and I will smile, regardless, for water. I can be in the most fucked up situation in the world and I can have a glass of water and I'll be happy. And that's what you're gonna to learn to do. So, put together your scenarios. I've given you the scenario with sleep, that's an easy one. I've given you the one with food and water, that's another easy one. In general, this is a good habit to learn, to restrict yourself from doing the things you really wanna do because you're gonna appreciate them more and you're also gonna be financially and probably healthier. So you should also look at what you're doing with your spare time in general and reduce it. Next time you want to do something, next time you want to watch a YouTube video or you want to do something stupid, go, no, I'm not going to do that today, I'm going to do it tomorrow. Make yourself wait because you'll appreciate it more when you do it. And I want you to put yourself in a situation of extreme stress. Gentlemen, it has to be extreme. When you lay in bed after being that tired for that long and you feel completely just, you don't give a shit about anything else, you're so happy to just be in bed. Remember that feeling because that's a memory you're going to be able to go back to anytime. Feel free to email me your ideas. Feel free to email me. And what I want you to do is email me how it feels. If you email me how it feels when you finally get that relief, when you finally feel that gratitude, email that to me. Because if you write out an email and explain it to me, then you're going to do far better at memorizing the memory. You're going to do far better at hacking your brain. And it's going to be a far better attempt at having something you can revert to at any time that will instantly lighten your mood. Now we're going to talk about rewards. Because... People have this impression that to have an iron mind, you need to be in constant God mode and that life needs to be struggle permanently and you need to be able to deal with that struggle permanently and it's all just doom and gloom, which is not the case at all. You need to have goals. You've obviously, you've created your enemy. You know who you're battling against, but life should be a happy experience. So making sure that completing your goals makes your life better and more positive, makes you feel more happy, is certainly going to encourage you to set larger goals and to complete them. So what I do when it comes to rewarding myself, because every single one of us needs to reward ourselves is, I very simply pin my rewards to an objective. So what people normally do is they go through life and they go, ah, oh, I feel like having an ice cream. 
and then they buy an ice cream. Then they eat the ice cream, the end. Even on such a small level, what they're saying is, I do what I want, I do what I feel like at the time, and I don't feel like I have to earn that treat, for example. So even on a very, very small level, let's say I'm walking down the street and I feel like having an ice cream. I will sit and think, I really want an ice cream, but I'm not gonna have one. Tomorrow, I'm gonna do X amount extra in the gym. I'm gonna do an extra 100 burpees, or I'm gonna do an extra set of bench press, just one extra, and tomorrow afternoon, I'm gonna have an ice cream. And it, even something small like that, this is a genuine example. You spend the whole day thinking about ice cream. You end up getting, anticipating ice cream, getting excited for ice cream. You go to the gym, you do extra, you earn the ice cream. And then, you know what the crazy thing is? The ice cream tastes better after going through that process than if I would have just bought it when I kind of wanted one the first time. And it's the same with absolutely everything. If I had some money in my bank and I decided to buy a Lambo, sure, it'd be a fun, happy day. But if I set myself a series of objectives I had to complete first, not even just to be able to afford the Lambo. Sure, you can say, once I make X amount of money, I'm gonna treat myself to this. That's fine. But you can also pin to a bunch of other objectives. So I had the money for a Lambo, but I wouldn't allow myself to buy one until I completed other things. In the gym, for example. Gym is the one I use all the time. If I wanna do something which I know is stupid, but makes me happy, like booze, like uh, eat some bad food, like buy something I shouldn't buy, et cetera, et cetera, I make myself work for it. And I do that to alleviate the guilt of having it because what's gonna happen is if you've done the first two parts of this correctly and you understand the enemy you're combating, you're gonna know that that person doesn't give in to those kind of desires, doesn't give in to urges. If he wants ice cream, he just goes without. Well, that, that's who you're battling against, but it's fine for you to have an ice cream because you're gonna work extra hard. So the next thing you need to do is you need to put together a list of objectives. You need two lists. You need a list of things you can already do and afford and a list of things you can't do and afford. So the first list, things you can do and afford, you need to sit there and think, even basic shit, junk food. I wanna have a cheat day of junk food. To allow myself to have that cheat day of junk food on the seventh day of the week, on the six days of the week, I'm gonna get up at six o'clock, I'm gonna go to the gym and I'm gonna train for an hour and a half. I'm not gonna leave the gym until 7.30. I'm gonna be there at six o'clock every day. And unless you complete those six days, unless you complete the objectives, you're not gonna give in and allow yourself to seven. And I'm telling you, the seventh day, if you finally do complete the objectives and then you sit in there eating the junk food, it will be so much better once you've earned it. The greatest thing about this is it, the, the, the reward is actually better. Not only do you work harder, but the reward is so much better knowing you worked for it. So that's one example, junk food, for example. Or let's say you want new shoes. Basic shit. All the shit you're doing anyway now without thinking. You go to a mall, you'll buy yourself something. You'll want it for 10 minutes. By the time you get home and take out the bag, you don't want it anymore. That's because you haven't trained yourself to earn it. You're gonna be a happier person when you look at something you want and go, all right, I'm gonna come back and get that in two days. And in the next two days, I'm gonna do X. And you're gonna do that X that you don't wanna do, and it's gonna be difficult, and you're gonna achieve it, and then you're gonna get what you want. And you're gonna be happier that you got the thing. That's the first thing. And the second thing is, all these small little objectives, these small little missions, you're setting yourself around a compound, especially when it comes to physical fitness. Physical fitness is the easiest one, because you can say, I'll do 500 press-ups, and then I'll get it. Done. So this list of things you can already easily afford, you're gonna do, you're gonna write it out, and you're gonna set an objective for each one. So if right now you're thinking of going on holiday, you need to set an objective for completing that holiday. If you wanna have a day of junk food, if you wanna buy something cheap, et cetera, et cetera. That's the first list. The second list is a list of things you cannot yet afford or things you do not yet have. And that's very easy because what you're doing is the, the punishment or the mission you're trying to complete is actually necessary, it's vital to having the objective. So if you want a Ferrari, you write down Ferrari, well then you have to make the money first, don't you? Of course. If you want to have a six pack, well then you've got to do the work. A separate list of things with the objectives yet to be completed, which you will need to finish before you can even purchase them. So you have two lists, things you can do right now, and you're going to delay gratification on purpose to, to train your mind to earn things. So you're going to train your mind to earn things with the first list, and the second list is obviously going to be all your life goals, all the things you're aiming to get. The first list is actually the most important. The second list is just going to be a general motivation. Everyone wants to have a Ferrari and a mansion, of course. It's good to write those things down. You may never even get them. It's the reality of the world. You know, you may get halfway there and still be a very happy, contented person. So this is a dream list, but that, that, that's good to have. But the first list is the most important because you're going to learn to delay gratification. You're going to learn to train yourself to make yourself work for the things you want. Things you already can do, you're going to start putting an objective. You're going to start putting a goal in the way. So people say to me often, oh, how do you find the motivation to do this? It's like, well, if I don't do that, I won't allow myself to do it. And why? How do you find the motivation to do X? If I don't do X, I won't allow myself to do Y. So for example, I train seven days a week. 
Some days I wake up and I cannot be asked. I ache, I'm tired, I've got a super busy day, I don't want to go to the gym, my phone's already going off, I've got shit to do. But if I don't go to the gym, I will not allow myself to drive my fast cars around, which I enjoy doing. And I've, I've set that in stone. If I don't gym, I'm not driving the cars. So I'll end up, you know what, well, fuck it, the Lambo's looking nice, it's sunny, okay, I have to go to the gym. You have to learn to put objectives in the way of the things you want. And if you complete the objectives, then you can have what you want. Now, the most important thing about this list is also you need to write down all the times you fail. So let's say you've decided that on, this, on one of these days, I'm using very simple examples. You can think of the examples you do for yourself. You need to go through your life over the next couple of days and realize how often you actually give in to your impulses. You're driving, you see McDonald's, fuck it, I'll McDonald's. Or you see junk food, fuck it. You see some shoes you want, fuck it. You're watching TV, you want to watch Game of Thrones, fuck it, fuck it, fuck it. You give in tons more than you realize. And if you actually be conscious about it, you'll realize, oh shit, I want to watch a new series of Game of Thrones. That's effectively wasting my time, purely for entertainment. If I'm going to do that, I need to do X amount of work first. So you can always find an objective. You can always find an objective to put in before. So it should be very easy for you over the next couple of days to look at all the times you give in to impulses and do things which your opponent wouldn't be doing. Your opponent would not waste time on Game of Thrones. He would not sit in a McDonald's drive through He would not buy those shoes just for the sake of because he saw them and he liked them. So all the things your opponent wouldn't do over the next couple of days you can write down. You need to set an objective in front of each one. And you also need to realize and you need to keep track of how often you fail the objective. So let's say we've chose Game of Thrones. You want to watch Game of Thrones on Sunday and you've decided you're going to go to the gym six days from Monday to Saturday every single day before you'll allow yourself to watch Game of Thrones. And for some reason on Thursday you fuck it up and you don't go. You need to write down next to that objective, yeah, I fucked up. And you need to try the week after. If you give in and just watch Game of Thrones anyway, then, then everything's thrown out the window. But if you truly listen to the first two lessons we've laid out, then you should feel too guilty to watch Game of Thrones. I couldn't sit there knowing I failed the task and give myself the reward. I wouldn't enjoy the reward. I'd feel genuinely guilty. Genuinely. If I was supposed to go to the gym and I didn't go to the gym and I had the ice cream anyway, I wouldn't enjoy the ice cream because I'd feel guilty. You have to learn to take yourself accountable. Make yourself accountable. And if you make this list, like I said, over the next couple of days, keep track of all the times you give in, put an objective in front of each one, and you shouldn't be able to do, you shouldn't be able to give in and do these things because you should feel guilty if you don't complete the objective. Which means the only way to do it is to complete the objective. And before you know it, you're going to have a shitload more work done than you could have ever imagined. Especially when it comes to physical fitness, this is the easiest one. What will happen when you truly implement this mindset is you'll start, this is what will happen, this is what happens to me, you'll start realizing and you'll start noticing how much other people give in. So I'll be sitting there at dinner and I'll eat my dinner and so will the person I'm with and they'll go, oh, I want dessert. Oh, I want to diet. Ah, oh, fuck it. Yeah, fuck it. Dessert menu. And you'll start realizing how quickly and how easily other people give in to impulses. They'll be in the mall. They'll look at something. I want it. Yeah, I'll buy it. Okay, yeah, fuck it. Da -da. And you'll also notice how, how it doesn't fulfill them whatsoever. The first thing that happens when you take this step back and put these objectives in place is one, you notice how people give in so easily. And two, you notice how much it doesn't actually fulfill them. They want the dessert, they eat the dessert. Are they happy afterwards? Are they smiling? Are they ecstatic? Or do they feel the same as you do? Except they've got a fucking stomach full of sugar and you don't. Most people, because they give into their impulses so easily, they're not even happy with them. This is the reality of the world. People buy shit they don't want, do shit that they don't even fucking like doing, eat crap, they go, oh, I really want that, and they eat it and they feel like shit afterwards. It's all asinine. It's all inane. When you truly implement this system, you're going to start noticing how easily others give in. And what it's going to start to do is it should motivate you further. When I'm walking through the mall and someone gives in and does some dumb shit they shouldn't do, it motivates me to make sure I'm never like that. Literally, when they buy that t-shirt and then they go home, by the time they get home, they start on the couch and throw the bag on the couch, throw it in the wardrobe, and just carry on playing video games or whatever they're doing. And then what a waste of money. They don't give a fuck, they don't give a fuck about that t-shirt. It made them happy for maybe six minutes. Maybe. If, if, if you only got six minutes of happiness out of a t-shirt, but it inspired you to go to the gym beforehand, then it's worthwhile. Then the t-shirt now has a purpose, but just to buy it for the sake of feeling a little bit happier for a few minutes to throw it in a wardrobe, absolutely not worthwhile. So there's a huge difference between the two. So the second part of this objective, after you've done everything we've discussed with the two lists and your understanding after a couple days of analyzing all the things your opponent wouldn't do to realize how often you give them yourself, is to also become super perspicacious and pay attention to how often other people give in to their whims. Because that should motivate you more than anything. Make your list. Put all your objectives down. It doesn't matter what your objectives are. Objectives can be super simple. And they can be super basic to start. You know, I want to make my first $50 online. I've never made money online before. I want to find a way to get someone to PayPal me $50. and make my first $50 online. And after I do that, I'm going to allow myself to go and blow it 
or go blow $200, doesn't matter. It's just the principle that I managed to make money online and if I do that, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna go shopping on Sunday. And then you're gonna sit there on Twitter and you're sitting there and they're going, how the fuck can I make some money? Because I wanna go shopping, I wanna go shopping, but if I don't do this, I can't go shopping. And you're gonna see how quickly this compounds to a complete change of lifestyle. These are some small mind hacks. This will be a quick video, but these are some small mind hacks you can do that'll change your entire perspective near instantly. And the first one, I alluded to a couple of these on Twitter, but this is the first one. The first one is a very, very important one. It's probably the most important one. And it's changing I have to, the sentence I have to, or the saying I have to, into I get to. A lot of people are extremely stressed about things that they have to do. And because they have to do them, or they understand the importance of doing them, they forget that it's actually a blessing to do them in the first place. Because they're obligated, when you're obligated to do something, you forget that it's actually a good thing. If I, like for example, going to the gym is something people can enjoy. When I was a fighter and I had to go to the gym twice a day, every day, like anything in life, once you're obligated, once you have to, a lot of the fun disappears. So I have to implicates an obligation, whereas I get to implicates a choice. So I'll give you an example. If you wake up and you're really busy and you think I have to take the kids to school, I have to go to work, I have to take the car to be repaired. Those are three things which are not necessarily fun to do. They're not necessarily, they're everyday activities. They're things that you can be stressed about. You're low on time. You've got to get the kids ready for school. You've got to get to work and there's a problem with the car. If you change, I have to do those three things into I get to do those three things, the mentality around the actions change. So I get to take the kids to school. A lot of people don't have kids. A lot of people want kids and can't get them. There's a lot of kids who can't go to school. You get to take your children to school. Which is, which, is, which is a blessing in itself. Forget, I have to take the kids to school. You get to take them to school. Aren't you lucky? I have to go to work. Well, you get to go to work. Imagine you didn't have a job. Imagine right now you lost your job. If you lost your job right now overnight and you had no income, your whole life would be up, upside down. You'd be in turmoil. And you'd miss your job very much and you wish you had your job back. So you get to go to work. You don't have to go to work. You get to go to work. That's once again a good thing. Even something as annoying as a car breaking, I have to take the car to the mechanics. Well, at least you get to take the car to the mechanics. Imagine you didn't have a car. Imagine there was no mechanic. So next time you're sitting there looking at your day or looking at a list of things or jobs you have to complete or you're stressed or you're low on time and all these things are happening, I have to do this, I've got to get this done, I have to do this, I have to do this. Change the language. I get to do X, Y, Z. And I guarantee you'll feel better about the activities near instantly. And this is something you can do very, very quickly. This is the first thing you need to do. And this is the second little mind hack, and this video is short because I want you to implement these. I want you to take time to genuinely make sure you implement these two things. Change I have to, to I get to. And the second one is, and then I can. So when you have to do something difficult, add a, and then I can on the end. For example, with me, with the gym. I, I, I'm being honest with you, I don't like the gym anymore. I've been doing it for too long, but I understand its importance and I don't want to miss it. So I think, you know what, I'm going to go train, I'm going to train hard because then I can relax. So adding and then I get to onto the end of basically anything can give you a lot of motivation. So even the simple activities we labeled earlier, the I have two things, I have to get the kids ready for school, I have to go to work, I have to fix the car. If you change it to I get to take the kids to school, I get to go to work, I get to get the car fixed, and then I can relax. Or and then I'm gonna give my, I'm gonna treat myself, I'm gonna allow myself to have a glass of wine or some ice cream, whatever. Add and then onto the end of every single difficult task and change I have to to I get to. Try that for a week and you'll see exactly how your entire world changes. Language. Body language is how people communicate without speaking. Since the dawn of human time, people have always communicated without speaking and a man's role, and I'm assuming you're a man because I doubt a female would have bought this, a man's role is very, very specific in his body language. In this uh, course, you're going to see a video where I kind of do an overview on body language and I basically say, be combative, but I'm going, to, I'm going to go into that into more detail in this video. The reason I say be combative is because being combative is the most important body language which exists, which you can portray to other men and to women, because this is the only body language which was important for millennia, for human ex in human existence. The only important body language was the body language that you were not an easy target. It attracted women and it made men respect you. So we're going to talk about the broad basics of body language and then we're going to go into some little tips and tricks overall. So the first thing I want you to understand is combative does not mean walking around swaying your shoulders like this. Combative means looking alert. 
I think Jordan Peterson says something about this, but I don't think his body language is particularly alpha. In fact, I don't think the world has many alpha role models. Jordan, if you name the right wing role models like Milo and Jordan Peterson, and all these people are just weirdos. None of them are particularly overtly alpha besides Trump himself. But Trump is a great guy to study body language wise. You want a body language lesson, watch Trump. He doesn't play games. Anyway, you have to look combative. So to look combative, it's basic things. It means be ready for a fight. That does not mean project aggression. It means be ready for a fight. So if you were walking down the road, you're walking down the road, are you more ready for a fight with your hands in your pockets or your hands outside of your pockets? Are you more ready for a fight if you're staring at your phone with your head down or with your head up, with your shoulders back, with your posture correct? What I'm going to teach you in this course is not just going to be do this, do this, do this. It's how to think about body language so that you're, overt, you're overtly aware of how you're acting. You need to be aware of how you act. So you need to have a correct posture. You need to sit up straight, sit properly. You need to have your hands out of your pockets. You need to look where you're going and not look down. Not be distracted. Not look like a victim. This is extremely important when projecting to men and it's also important when projecting to women. So we're going to go in that in detail in this course. So, I know I just mentioned Trump, but we also can't forget about Putin because Putin's a G. He was KGB trained. He knows exactly how to act. So when someone's talking to him and he wants to make it clear he doesn't give a fuck what they say, he will, for example, lean back in his chair. So Putin will sit there and you'll start talking to him and he'll sit like this. This is Putin's I don't give a fuck. This is Putin's I'm not listening. Many traditional body language courses will teach you Ah, uh, if you cross your arms, you're not receptive. This is true. You know, like this shows you're not open, you're not receptive, you're crossing your arms, etc. But there's much more subtle moves like leaning back in your chair. Leaning back in your chair is a great one. I use it all the time. Someone will sit there, they'll start talking to me. If I don't like what they have to say, I'll lean back in my chair. I'll still look at them while I'll lean back in my chair, but I'll look directly at them. And they'll know, oh fuck, sort of upset him somehow. So I'll make that clear. So we're going to go over a few things. The first thing we're going to talk about is being trusted and listened to. Now, if you've bought my other courses, you know that my brain is a mega hive of unlimited potential. Petrobytes of... Is petrobyte even a thing? No. Okay. We'll go back then. If you've bought my other courses, you'll know that my brain is unrivaled by anyone else on this planet. Terabytes upon terabytes of information from fuck knows where. I'm just a genius. So like all my other videos, I'm just going to be talking. Skip, bang, information is just going to be coming at you. You need to sit there, slow it down, watch it over and over again, decipher it, and put some things in action. Because I guarantee there's a lot you're doing wrong already. Right now, don't move. Your posture right now, where are your hands? Are you sitting up straight? Do you even look? Are you sitting correctly? Or are you all like in your chair? Maybe you're already making mistakes, you don't know. So the first things we're going to talk about is how to be listened to and trustworthy. I have been to court six times and every time I've walked and I've never used a lawyer and I've represented myself. And the reason for that is because I, one, I speak very clearly, very precisely, and I know exactly how to use the human language. But secondly is my body language. So sometimes in court, you need to look believable. You need to look innocent. And to do this, you make yourself appear less aggressive. Big men have this problem. Small men are very concerned about looking big. Whereas a big man, in many situations, you need to look less intimidating. If my car breaks down and I want to knock on someone's door to use the phone, I know that's super old school. And I know that's how people get murdered in every single movie. But it's just an example. But if I knock on a door, people don't answer the door to me. When me and Tristan knock on doors, they look outside and go, what the fuck? Who the fuck is two six foot five dudes at the door? No, no chick is opening that door. Me and my brother used to have a job where we used to do door-to-door -door sales a long time ago. And we had to quit the job because no one would answer the door to us. <laughs> just fucking these two massive guys. Just, just, we were like, what the fuck? And no one answered out the window. What? Can I sell you? Nah, get the fuck away from my house. So it, 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 you, have, you have to try and change your body language to appear less aggressive. So we'd actively slunk or, or hold a clipboard or something to just make yourself seem smaller. So when I was in court and they were accusing me of things I didn't fucking do. But even though I was innocent, of course, you have to look innocent. So you don't look innocent by looking aggressive. You look innocent by looking smaller. You make yourself seem smaller. You'd add in stammering to your language. So I, I never say um and ah, ever. 
I'm like, oh, yeah, well, I don't think it's fair. Uh, uh, uh. And you almost, in many ways, see yourself appear less intelligent. Not less intelligent in a stupid, he's dumb, he did it way. In a very, like, I couldn't hurt anyone. Women are experts at this. Women do this the best. Watch a female get pulled over by the police. Watch her just start going, oh, oh, really? Uh, playing stupid is a great way to play innocent. And it's very, very effective. But what you'll find in body language, sometimes the biggest results is when you can juxtapose them against each other. So while I was in court, they'd ask me questions. I'd be like, oh no, I don't even really know how that works, to be honest with them. I don't, don't really know. I'd add in these little delays. I'd deliberately slow my speech down. But then when I had to make a point, I'd completely flip it. And I'd be very adamant and direct with my words. Even now, and even in all my tape speech videos, you'll notice how I use my hands. If I have a point to make, I use my hands to make the point. I direct the point with my hands. You're going to notice me doing it all the time now. Something I do on accident. But if I want to make a point, I'll say something like, and the reason for this, the reason your mom has a big ass is because she eats too much. I'll do things like this. I'll explain the reason, I'll get your attention with my hands, and then I'll directly give you the reason. And I'll, I'll put it into your brain. I'll put it in with my hands. This is something I do completely by natural. I don't even have to think about it anymore, but it's something I did learn. And it's amazing with women. It's great with women when you're arguing with them. And they'd sit there and be like, blah, 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 blah. I didn't fucking fuck her. Be quiet. I haven't hit her, but the, the physical action makes them sit there and go, oh, okay. Just be, be very aware and very avert with your hands. Like I said, this course is just going to be knowledge flying at you. So when you talk, where are your hands? Where are they? How do you use them? Your hands, you should be extremely expressive with your hands, especially if you're a man. When I, before I was a kickboxing world champion, I worked in sales. And I had the best sales record in the fucking company, obviously. And a lot of that was down to body language. I would sit there in front of somebody. I sold TV advertising. I'd sit there and say, you need TV advertising. They go, oh, we do pretty good. I said, yeah, you do good now. But in the future, you're going to need, you're going to need TV advertising. It's the future of advertising. You're going to need it. I'll tell people, you, you ain't got a choice. You better buy it today. You need this. I said, they're going, okay, well, let me look at your current strategy and then maybe I can improve it. Da, da, da. No, fuck that garbage. If you're a salesman, you're watching this now, you better start telling people they need it. You can't live without this. You need this today. I, I understand my industry. No disrespect. You're a diaper company or you're a fucking water company. You understand water. You know more about water than me. I understand advertising. See what I've done there. You understand water. That's your thing. Advertising is my thing. You don't tell me about your advertising strategy because I don't fucking care. Advertising is my thing. It's mine. I own it. And if I say you need something, you better buy it. So you understand war. War is your industry. Advertising is my industry. I've been in this industry for a long time. I'm telling you, with your current strategy, you're having success now, but you won't have success in the future. And you're going to need a different form of advertising. That's exactly how I'd be. People would be sitting there going, oh, okay. Sign. So you have to be very, very careful with your hands and how you use things. I am, I am very good at that. You, me, this. All these things are learned. You have to adapt your own style. But you need to sit there and think consciously. When you speak, what are you doing with your hands? If you're going to sit there and talk with your hands in your pockets, you're not going to be nearly as convincing. If, you, if I want to sit there and I want to come across as, there's the old mafia boss, you know, you can sit and be like with your hands in one place and just use your eyes instead. That works. But that's a far more, that's the kind of body language you use when you don't really want to talk anymore. If I'm, about to, if I'm about to have someone shot and they come in to apologize to me before I have them shot in the head, I won't be moving my hands. I'll be listening to them like this. Because I don't want to listen to them and I don't want to talk. This is, I don't really give a fuck anymore. Like, like this, same. Your hands are crossed, you don't really care. When I met Donald Trump Jr. in Trump Tower, I was super aware of his body language. What Trump did is something I've never seen before, Trump Jr. We sat down and we started talking. He sat like this, with his hands open on the table. I don't know where he learned that from, but I'm sure he was taught. But we were having a normal conversation. We had coffees. We sat down at the table. It was a round table, not like this. And he sat down and he sat like this, which I thought was quite interesting. I've actually never seen anyone else do that before. So it kind of threw me a bit. And I thought maybe the reason he was taught that is because it's so unusual. Because I read people's body language in every other position, this, that you've seen it all. I've never seen this really ever. So that was interesting. So first thing you have to do is be very overtly aware of how you use your hands when you speak. If you want to direct something, if you want to be believed, if you want to be convincing, your hands have to be involved in that process. 
when I was in my police interviews, once again, I would use my hands overtly. And I would sit there and say, I actually said this in my police tapes. And when I get them back, when I'm finally cleared of all charges, even though it's been going on for four years, I get the tapes back. I'm going to release them on Twitter. It's going to be the best thing ever because I made these police look like fucking fools. But I would say to them in the tape, I would say, very hard. I said on the tape, I said, do you have a camera in here? And they'd be like, oh, yeah, we do. I said, okay, I want this for the camera. I don't want this for the tape. I want this for the camera. I am innocent. I am innocent. Me, I've done nothing wrong. Say innocent with your hands up. I'm innocent. I'm innocent. They're different things. I'm innocent. I want this on camera. For the tape, reference the time. What time is it? Point at someone when you need something. Uh, 5.15. 5.15. Look at the day. 5.15, 24th of November. Look, I've done nothing wrong. I said that shit directly to the camera. I'd reference it off the tape. Body language makes a huge, huge difference. And basically, if you want to be believed or trusted, in my experience, which is fucking vast, you need to use your hands effectively. I've given you some tips on how I do it. You have to adapt your own style. Like everything in the world, if you completely replicate someone else's style, it comes across as unnatural and it doesn't work. You need your own style. You can't be exactly the same as me, and I can't be exactly the same as you. Same as boxing or fighting. I can teach you how to do jab cross, but everyone does it a little bit different. Everyone has a slightly different style. So you have to adapt your own style. But what you need to do is be overtly aware. If you're aware of things, you'll pick up on things and you'll change things. So the first thing is you need to use your hands more effectively, especially to be trusted and listened to. All right, next. How to speak convincingly. To speak convincingly, a lot of you probably already know these things. You have to talk loud, you have to talk clear. And this is another thing you need to learn. I'm, I'm, in, I'm actually tempted to do a course specifically on oration, but you need to learn to speak effectively. The way you interact with the world outside of your little digital keyboard and your Twitter bullshit is with your voice. I know you're paying attention to my hands now. Is with your voice. If your voice is meek, or if your words aren't clear, or if you don't say what you mean effectively, then you're not gonna be taken seriously. People take me seriously because when I speak, I speak with a conviction. They sit there and go, this motherfucker knows. The way he's talking, he knows what he's talking about. And I do. Let's sit here and go, oh, okay, well, um, so for, um, fuck that. Um and ah is something that you need to forget instantly. I don't care if you have to train yourself. I don't care if you have to look in the mirror. Get rid of um, get rid of ah, get rid of gaps. It just completely destroys your entire image. That shit needs to go. And it's something that can be learned. And, I, and when I sit there and listen to people, oh, well, yeah, uh, well, yesterday we went out and then, um, it's like, what the fuck do you mean, um? I went out and then, um, well, you don't remember what you did yesterday? How slow is your fucking brain? You look like a moron. 99% of people look like idiots because they don't pay attention to how they speak. So with oration, it's extremely important. You get rid of ums, you get rid of ahs, you get rid of this bullshit. This is one of the first things you have to do to speak convincingly. Second thing is with the hands, the body language. The third thing is you have to be, if you're standing or you're sitting regardless, you have to have a presence as a person. Nobody believes a nobody. So if you're sitting in a room, you need to be overtly taking up space as a man, especially. They call it mansplaining. That's what all the feminists call it. He's mansplaining. He's taking up space. I'm a man. I'm a fucking man. I've got space. My space. It's mine. And I have something to say and you're going to listen. You want to be believed. It's a combination of things. But a lot of people just want to sit in their little chair. Uh, well, I was thinking that for the progress report, maybe. It's garbage. Also, there's nothing wrong with talking too loud. Outside of shouting, fucking talk loud. Conquer the room. You're going to piss some people off, but guess who you're going to piss off? You're going to piss off the betas. You're never going to piss off the boss. Like I said, when I used to have a job. The boss loved me. I'd sit in a meeting and just be like, look, here's how I sell. I was half yelling. I don't know about what the other guys are doing, but what I do is I tell them they better buy it today. The boss will sit there and go, this fucking guy. But I had the best sales record. If I sit there and go, oh, well, I don't know how you do it, but what, what I uh, sometimes do is, uh, it's just bullshit. Fucking scream at people. Sit there and go, no, this, that, bang, direct. Don't be afraid of the attention you're going to get. If you have alpha body language, if you have serious body language and you project, you're going to attract a whole bunch of attention. If you're shy, you're not going to want the attention. It's going to impact your psyche. It's going to impact how you portray yourself. Forget the attention. Don't worry about it. It's coming. There's no other way to project yourself. Project yourself in a way where you attract attention. Be loud. Fuck all wrong with it. Be loud. It's exactly the same with lying. 
Learning how to be convincing and how to be believable is the same when you lie. Now, people say when you lie, people look away from the eyes. In my experience, what happens when people lie is they actually know this, that everyone's been told they look away, and they look at you more trying to prove they're not lying. The easiest way to lie is to not change your body language in any way from when you're telling the truth. A polygraph test, does only, how does a polygraph test work? You can't just plug yourself in and say lie or true. It only knows by comparing you to a baseline. First, they ask you your name. They ask you questions you tell the truth to, and then they compare it when you lie, and they see the difference. Well, body language is no fucking different. If you know you're going to have to lie to somebody, you need to sit there before the conversation even starts and talk about something which is easy for you to talk about and be smart enough to be speaking with one side of your brain and with the other side of your brain, measuring where are my eyes, where are my hands, how am I standing, how am I sitting? And then when it starts coming to lie, you don't alter shit. If you're already looking them in the eyes, continue to look them in the eyes. If you're not looking at them, don't. If your hands are a certain way, keep them there. You only get detected on lies when you alter your body language. It doesn't matter what body language you have. You can be like I am now, alpha, projecting, trying to make a point, ultra convincing, or you can sit there like a meek little, uh, it doesn't matter. If that is the, the default and you retain the default when you're telling the lie, then you have nothing to lose. So when you tell a lie, it's not about, well, how do I act when I tell a lie? It's not changing how you acted before. This is the most important thing. But most of you guys are so unaware of your body language, you're so unaware of where your hands go, unaware of where you're looking. Think of your last conversation with someone. Where were you looking? Think about it. Uh, at them, I guess. I guess. Uh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. You're going to like ignorant. You don't fucking know. If you learn your own shit and you adapt your own shit to have a style which is favorable to you and favorable to your outcomes, this is going to be very, very easy for you to lie because you can replicate your own style. So that's how you fucking lie. I will pass any lie detector test there is. In fact, I'm writing that down for a tape speech. We're getting a lie detector company in here. I'm going to fucking do it. I'm going to pass it. And the reason I'm going to pass it is because I don't give a fuck. Ask me a question. Take me the greatest man alive. Yes. True. That's the baseline question because everyone knows it's fucking true. Take. Do you give a shit about these hoes? No. True. They're going to ask me a lie. Like, Take, is Meghan Markle a good princess? I'm going to say yes. Which is obviously a fucking lie. It's still going to come up as true. Hope that bitch doesn't get hold of that piece of paper and uses it as proof. Daddy Tate validated me. Fucking hate that hoe. When we're talking about the correct way to be, when I talk about things like hands, seat positioning, etc., this is universal across sexes. The same way you can make a man like you and you can sell products in a business meeting, it's the same way you can make a girl fuck you. It's no different. All of it is based around primary evolutionary human instincts, around confidence, competence, trustworthiness. These are things that this is the dawn of time. They look at a dude and go, this is a competent guy. If a man looks at you and thinks this is a competent guy, they want to be your friend. In a business relationship, if they look at you and think this is a competent guy, they want to give you money. And if a girl looks at you and thinks this is a competent guy, she wants to suck your dick. It's the same. There's no difference in your body language for a woman or for a man or for business or for anything else. It's, proje it's projecting competence and confidence and combat ability in all of the situations. You need to learn to walk into a room like I am the baddest motherfucker in the room. I'm the baddest motherfucker on earth. You gotta walk in like that. Just walk in like a fucking G. Doesn't matter what you're doing. Doesn't matter if you're about to fuck a bitch or fucking sell a, sell a fucking window. Who gives a shit? You walk in like I'm the shit. Yeah, sit down. Yeah, coffee please, thanks. The fucking man's here. The fuck, the man's here. You sucking dick? Well, obviously. You gotta be like that. So I know a lot of you guys are gonna come back to me and go, okay, thanks for the course. But what do I do with this girl? You do with the girl the same shit you do with the guys. It's the same thing. Because it's the same general attributes which are seen as attractive. Keep that in mind. How to intimidate. Well, I don't really like the idea of intimidating unless I mean what I say. The easiest way to intimidate someone is to mean what you say. But just like lying, in most of my personal experiences... You intimidate by changing your body language. Humans are amazing at detecting change. If something stays still, it's not nearly as attractive to the human eye as if something moves. If something's out your corner of your eye and it's still, it's fine. When it moves, you're like, what the fuck? 
Humans detect changes in velocities, changes in speeds. So how the human eye works is detecting changes. And it's very similar with body language. So let's say I'm out and let's say three guys are gonna attack me. And I don't want to fight the guys because I might lose. So I want to intimidate them. So let's say at first I'm like, hey, get the fuck, fuck off. Da, 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 da. And we go outside and they go, you're gonna you, you, you fucking do it. And I go, and I, I've been overtly, I've been aggressive. I've been the big man. I'm like, look, get the fuck away from me. Da, da, da. And they come out and they want to fight me anyway. I'll change my body language completely. I'll say, okay, okay, we're gonna fight now, okay. And then they'll be a bit like, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna fight now. I've tried to tell you not to and you wanna fight. So I've tried to be reasonable. It's done, so we're gonna fight now. So let's go. And I'll start walking towards them. And that sudden change in body language is what makes people think, whoa, what the fuck? You have to change your body language. Typically, people intimidate by screaming because they start low and then they go high to intimidate. So they'll start like trying to be sensible and reasonable and the person doesn't listen and they'll go, you know what? Fucking did it. And they'll change it. But it's not the shouting which is intimidating. It's the change in body language. But everyone's accustomed to that. I do it the other way around. And the other way around for me is far more effective. Let's say you're arguing with your girl. You're a stupid bitch. Blah, blah, blah. I'm tired of your shit. You're always fucking these hoes. Blah, blah. So yeah, fuck hoes. What? Shut the fuck up. Cook. Blah, blah, blah. Arguing, arguing, arguing. Eventually, she wants to shut up you at the point and go, you know what? You know what? We've argued enough. We've argued enough. And you get your, get your keys. She goes, where are you going? Just go, oh, no, I'm just going to go out. Don't worry. No, I don't want to argue with you. I'm just going to go out. I'm just going to go out. I take your keys. She's going to be more worried about you being sensible and calm and nice than if, than if you shout it anymore. Because it's the change in body language. You have to understand, body language isn't about do this to be this way. It's about being able to flip it. And it's having that sudden deceleration, that massive change suddenly is what makes people think. When I've been attacked before, that story I just told you is a completely true story. This was only one guy. I had a guy who was talking shit from the other side of the fucking room. I said, bro, stay the fuck over there. He was talking shit. He goes, oh, 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 you ain't nothing, you ain't nothing. I said, bro, I'm not trying to fight you. If you come around, I'll fucking hurt you. Talking shit, da, 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 da. Anyway, he gets up. Carl starts walking over. And I stand up and say, okay, we're going to fight. Let's, let's, at least, let's at least do it outside. He goes, yeah, we're going to go outside. I said, no problem. Okay, let's go. He walked downstairs. He's like, you know what? And fucking do it. He's trying to get me to argue again because that's how he felt comfortable. Because Tate, you know, I'm just sick of your shit, Tate. Da, da, da. I said, no, it's fine. You're sick. We're going outside. I'm, I'm done shouting. I'm not a girl. I don't shout. Ain't my thing. I don't shout like females. We, we spoke. I told you to stay away from me. You didn't want to listen. So let's go. I wasn't being intimidating in any way. I wasn't acting intimidating. It's the change in body language that made him think, what the fuck is this guy? He didn't want to fight anymore because I became nicer. All of a sudden, he's like, this guy's too calm. Motherfucker's going to shoot me or some shit. <laughs> this guy's crazy. So it's not about being a certain way. It's about being overtly aware of your body language in a way that allows you to switch it on people. Most of you are so unaware of your own body language, you can't effectively change it. Okay, you can go from happy to angry. Or from normal to shouting. Those are basic things. A kid can do that. But you can't do it on a very conscious level with tiny details. You can't flip reverse it and go from angry to nice. You can't mix it up. Nobody in this world has dealt with someone, a full grown man, going from crazy screaming to nice inside of two seconds. That comes across as psychopath. That scares people. When you come across as, you, you fucking did a fuck. You know what? It's okay. It's okay, I agree. We should, we should hurt each other. That's what makes people think, what the fuck is God's fucking nuts? That's how you intimidate someone. The sudden fucking change. Everyone's dealt with it from happy to angry or normal to angry. No one's dealt with it the other way fucking around. I reverse on people. I start shouting. You come near my car, I fucking start shouting. But then we've, if I, once I know it's violence time, I, I drop the whole shouting act. I go straight into the nicest man in the world. I'll smash your fucking face in. So you have to be aware of your body language and able to change it. This is extremely important. A lot of people talk about mirrored body language. I don't like this shit. People go, oh, if you mirror someone's body language, they like you more. Nah, fuck that. That's pussy shit. Oh, so someone crosses their arms. What's this, Simon Says? It's a little fucking punk. I sit how I want to sit. I come, I come into the other room. I sit like this. What? I sit like this. If everyone changes their body language, I don't fucking care. This is how I sit. Because I'm in charge. Alphas don't change their body language. Look at orangutans. Look at fucking apes. They're the closest relative we've got. The alpha doesn't change for shit. Everyone else changes when he's around. 
So don't believe that mirroring crap. Well, if you go out with a girl and you mirror her body language, shut the fuck up, man. I'm going to sit there with a girl. She crossed her arms and I crossed my arms and then she sucked my dick. Never. Never. I sat down and I was the fucking man. That's why she sucked this dick. Nothing to do with fucking me crossing my arms when she did. Fuck that shit. It's garbage. Forget that mirroring. Now, we're going to move on. Smiling. Smiling is effective, but it's only effective if it's used selectively. People tell me, Tate, you never smile. That's not true. I do smile. I smile selectively. My smile has a value. If you guys are watching this, I'm trusting you've seen the PhD course. How do you give your attention a value? By making it rare. Why is gold valuable? Because it's scarce. My smile has a value because I rarely smile. If you walk through life, you, one, you look a fucking moron, one, and two, who gives a fuck if you're smiling or not? If I smile, my smile has value, has weight, has currency. I've had girl, my girl, been six years. She'll message me, I made you smile today. She's happy that she made me smile because it's hard to do. There's achievement in it. Oh my God, I made him smile. He woke up and I'd already cooked dinner and, uh, he woke up and I'd cooked him breakfast and I had coffee in his favorite mug and I brought it to him and I told him I loved him and he smiled a little bit. She got her reward, which is my smile. If she woke up and I was always, hey baby, hey, 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 what the fuck, she didn't give a fuck if I smile or not. I smile when it's deserved. And you're a fucking full grown man. You should be walking through life smiling. You need to smile at people when something of merit happens. I'm not saying come across as a miserable fuck. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying you're sitting there looking like you're gonna fucking kill yourself. You're not Eeyore. I'm saying you need to smile selectively. Once again, you need to adapt your own body language style. You need to decide when you're going to use your smile and when you're not. You don't say trying to hold it in. I'm saying you've probably learned to smile instinctively. You're smiling at things that don't really make you smile. And you're smiling at things that you don't find funny to be polite. But let me tell you what smiling is. Smiling is a sign of submission. Look at apes, our, our, old, our closest relatives. Apes smile to submit. When the alpha appears, the beta males, they show their teeth. They go, it's, a, it's like, don't hurt me. It's, this is what this is natural. You can study this today. Google it, YouTube right now. They show their teeth in a sign of submission. That's what smiling is. If you're going through life and every person you meet, you're like, hey, 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 hey. You're basically saying to the world, no one hurt me. Please, please, hey, I'm a nice guy. How are you? Fine. You get yeah, good. Does Trump smile at every motherfucker he sees? No. It's Trump. Fuck it. Yeah. Yeah, all right. Okay. Yeah. Fucking then someone who actually, like a real G turns up. Someone who's done a fantastic job that week. He'll give him a little bit of a smile. He'll go, smile. And they'll be like, oh, Trump smiled. Why does Trump smile matter? Because he doesn't walk through life looking like a fucking happy clown. And neither should you. Your smile is a selective tool. It must be rare. It must be used effectively. If you smile at a girl, she needs to fucking deserve that shit. You smile at a guy, he needs to deserve that shit. You're going to walk through life fucking smiling. Life's not all about just being as happy as possible. This is the bullshit the media is trying to sell you. They're purporting this idea. If you're happy, smile, be nice. Everyone who's happy all the time, smiling all the time, nice all the time is a fucking loser. You know it and I know it. So you don't want to be that guy. You haven't got to be fucking smiling. Use your smile selectively. I use my smile selectively, especially in dates with girls. If I'm sitting there, it's a little bit frosty, whatever, whatever. I don't allow awkward silences because I'm too efficient for those things. I've got a PhD, a pimp and hose degree. But if uh, we're talking and the talk's just very general, I'm, I'm very neutral. I'm like this, oh yeah, blah, 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 blah. When she starts to flirt with me a little bit, or if she starts to be a little bit more open, or I know for sure she's gonna get dick, then I might smile a little bit. I'll be like, bitch, you crazy. I'll smile. She'll say something and I'll smile before I answer. Saying, oh, the, I didn't expect you to be like this. I thought you'd be more arrogant. I'd be like, why? I'll smile. But she says that at the beginning. I didn't expect you to be like this. I expect you to be more arrogant. I'd be like, why? I'm very different. I decide to smile when she's receptive to me. If you're receptive to me, and you're going to fucking do what I want, you can have a smile in return. Smile is a weapon. Like, like your attention is a weapon. Like, everything you have is a weapon. You're a walking bag of weapons. That's what most of you men don't understand. Your attention has a value. Your smile has a value. You're, you're replying to someone. It all has value. And you guys are just running through life throwing it away. Every single chick giving them attention for no reason, even though they don't suck dick. Messaging girls all the time. Friend zoning yourself. Smiling at everyone. Just throwing your weapons away. Then how the fuck are you going to do something exclusive? 
How do you show me I've made you happy if you're already smiling at every dickhead you've ever met? It's stupid. Now you don't have to come across as a horrible person. I don't have to, I don't, I don't smile often at all. But let's say I'm in a, in a store and I'm buying something and the guy goes, I say, yeah, this much, I'm like, thank you, thanks. I'll nod a lot. If, I, if I'm walking past a security guard who looks at me, I won't smile, I'll nod. A nod is a, you and I both know who the, men, the bad men in the room are. All the big men know the big men nod. All the big men know. If you're not a big man and you're watching this show, what's he talking about? If you're a big guy right now, you know. When big men walk in the club and there's another big man in the club, you instantly, human instinct, you catch eyes like, okay, he's the only person in this club who can match me physically. If there's going to be a fight, it's the only guy I have to worry about. And you always link eyes. And you always kind of do this thing. This like, yeah, all right, cool. We've, we've clocked each other. We've decided we're cool. It's done. The big man nod. It's a thing. Big men nod. But a nod is far more effective than a smile. You want to be polite, nod at somebody. Yeah, thank you. Cheers, thanks. Thanks, thanks, thanks. What the fuck are you happy about? You just bought fucking skills. You happy over skills? You little bitch. You're full of my man. You're fucking smiling over skills. What the fuck's wrong with you? If I have to tell you to give a firm handshake, then I don't know what the fuck you're doing here because you should know that already. If I have to tell you that fidgeting makes you appear bored, you should know that already. If you want to look bored, this is all be a shit. You know this one. If a girl, if you're sitting with a girl and she crosses her legs, she's basically saying, you're going nowhere near my pussy. That's like an anti-rape fucking instant reaction. You know how to read these things. You know these things because you know how to read them instinctively. If you sit with a girl and she does this, and she does this, you know you ain't bad. You know it and I know it. All those pickup artist dudes, they teach what they call a keno or some fucking gay shit. I hate pickup artists. I hate pickup artists because I know I'm the baddest. I'm the best. So what annoys me. There's all these guys, Red Pill, Mr. Lucario, Bad Boy, The Dating Game, all these, all these dudes... And every time I see the girls are fucking, I'm like, what the fuck is this, bro? These guys are fucking girls. I wouldn't even fuck. I wouldn't even touch their girls. And they're bragging about them. Like, yeah, I went out and I gamed this chick. She's a fucking five. Your nine is my five. You call her a nine? She's a fucking five. My girls look like fucking Playboy bunnies. My girls got two million followers on Insta. My girls have billionaire exes. My guess is my girls are actually hot. Your girls are basic. I hate pickup artists. Anyway, they're all, they're all fucking idiots. All of them. None of them are good for me. But they talk about this Kino thing where you need to do some touching on the girl. And I agree that, that I do that myself. That can help. I have two things I do. One is when I first meet, uh, it depends. I don't really do the hug and kiss kiss thing when I first meet a girl. I don't really do that unless I know her quite well. But once we're talking shit, one of the things I get to do is I, I say I'm a kickboxer. I go, oh, you're a kickboxer. Dude. I say, yeah, I'm going to teach you. I'm going to train you. I'm going to make you a little ninja because you're beautiful. No one's going to expect you to kill them. And I give that compliment there. And they're like, oh, <laughs> like, yeah, you're, you're going to work for me. She goes, really? Who do I have to kill? I say, well, are you strong enough? And they'll always go, yeah. And I'll say, go on, let me see. And then they'll tense their shit muscles. I'll go, mm, got work to do. That's how I first do my, the Kino, break the ice, touch them thing. I do the feeling their arms thing. But that only works because I have huge arms. If I did that and she looked at my skinny ass arms back and goes, well, where's your fucking muscle? Well, it doesn't work then, does it? So you have to choose your own style. But yeah, if they're all crossing off and they don't want you to touch them, whatever, whatever, then that's obviously a bad sign. You know these things already. I don't have to tell you super fucking obvious stuff. If you've watched it to this point and you haven't taken any notes, I doubt it. Because I've definitely told you some shit you should fucking, you probably don't know yet. Especially changing it from, from angry to calm. I know none of you fuckers do that because I've never seen anyone else pull it off on me. Eyes. Eye contact. A lot of you are very unaware where you're looking, especially when you're talking to somebody. I look in people's eyes. I do that very, very specifically. Not in a creepy way. I don't want none of you fuckers to take my videos. Sometimes I say things which are so nuanced and I'm worried that people are going to be like, okay, Tate said this, so I have to do this. And you're going to go sit there with a girl and be like, hi. You look like a fucking psycho. Like you have to keep things into perspective. But especially if you want to drive a point home, you look in someone's eyes. Like I said before, the biggest theme behind this bug language course is the ability to change your language. It's the change of language that people perceive more than the language itself. So if I'm talking to a girl and I'm like, blah, 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 doesn't matter what I'm saying, let me think of a sentence, it doesn't matter what I'm saying, but when I want to drive the point home, only then will I look in her eyes. Yeah, actually, I'm, I'm really glad I met you because you are beautiful. I'll say the beautiful part and look in her eyes. Before I say that, I'm looking away. And that's what makes it more effective. It's more effective because I've gone from looking away to looking at her. 
If I just looked at her and said, I'm glad I met you because I really think you're beautiful. It's not, for me, it's, it's far more effective for me to say, yeah, well, I'm glad I met you because I really think you're beautiful. I'll look away and I'll look at them when I say something I mean. And that change in body language is what they perceive and that makes you far more convincing. You see where I'm coming from? You know, tell a girl she's beautiful, we'll make sure you're not looking at her and then look her in the eyes directly as you say it like a fucking man. Eye contact. Eye contact needs to be used as punctuation. This is punctuation. Everything is punctuation make them understand a point. That's how your eye contact should be used. I'm not saying you have to lock eyes at every motherfucker you meet, but it needs to be used as punctuation. Same with men. Blah, 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 blah. Dude, get the fuck away from me. Get the fuck away from me. When I look in his eyes, it's when I mean it. When you're saying it, you're not looking in his eyes, you don't mean it. Say I look in his eyes, I mean it. And if you guys have watched any of my other videos, you understand how important it is to never say something you don't mean. If you've not watched my video on Tate speech, it's completely free, Tricks on Depression, it's about 25 minutes long, watch that one. I talk about how important it is to say what you mean and mean what you say. Don't tell someone you're gonna knock them out unless you're gonna do it. Don't be one of those people who walk through the earth talking shit. Unless they look, bro, you don't got my face. I'm gonna knock you the fuck out. The first time I look in his eyes, I say I'm gonna knock him out. He knows. It's the first time I've looked at him. He knows I'm gonna mean it. That's how eye contact should be used. Power poses is a thing. I had a lot of people send me lots of emails about this course, asking me questions. So I got asked about power poses. They say like if you sit there and you do the Superman pose, you start to get more. You naturally release more testosterone. You start to feel stronger. I believe that's true. I do think that works. That is definitely a thing. You know, that's certainly a thing. Do I walk through life with the Superman pose? No. Should you? No. When you look in the mirror, you look in the mirror like, yeah, I'm a fucking man. Yeah, you need to do that, of course. But that's more here than a power pose. So I'm only answering this thing now because I know some of the fuckers are going to come back and go, what about my power pose? If you want to walk through life doing this and it makes you feel a little bit stronger, go for it. How about you just get strong as fuck anyway and you ain't going to worry about walking around looking like a fucking superhero, like a dork. So that's that shit. I've told you a lot about being domineering and conquering. However, a lot of you guys will know one of the 48 rules of power is never to outshine the master. So a lot of you may have a boss and you can't act that way because it's gonna piss your boss off too much if you're too overpowering. I managed to be overpowering in my sales meetings because I was such a fucking fantastic salesman, the boss wouldn't say shit to me because I made him so much fucking money. But if you're middle of the road or something, you can't come across that way, you're gonna annoy people too much if you haven't got the results to back it up. So one of the key things you can do if you wanna make people like you, two things you wanna make people like you. One's a body language trick, one's not a body language. One is, if you want to make people like you, ask them lots of questions. Because everyone loves to talk about themselves. If, I have, if I'm meeting someone extremely important, which happens all the fucking time, from Trump Jr. to anyone else, and I think, okay, I need this person to like me. I don't sit there and try and impress them. I don't sit there and go, okay, Andrew Tate, son of a chess grand master, genius IQ, four-time kickboxing world champion, I've got lots of girls, lots of pussy, and money, and a Lambo. They don't care. Nobody cares. I sit there and go, yeah, okay, it's really good to meet you. Yeah, I've always, I've always been interested in ask them things. Because if you ask people questions, then they have, to talk, they have to answer them. And they have to answer them by talking about themselves. And everyone loves themselves. So if you sit there with someone and they only talk about themselves for an hour, they're going to love the conversation. Yeah, it was really good to talk to you. Because I, I got to brag for an hour. This is especially effective with women. Women love this shit. If you sit there and try and make a woman impress her, I'm this, I'm that, blah, blah, blah. Nah. Sit there and go... You're different than I expect. So what do you do? I'm a hairdresser. Hairdresser. Don't you get bored of like talking to people all the time? Well, no, actually, I don't mind because some of the people are really nice and some of the people are my best customers. Da, da, da. Oh, oh, really? Okay, yeah. Well, I don't even go to hairdresser, as you can tell. I'm already beautiful. So how long have you been a hairdresser for? I've been a hairdresser for this long. I went to college and da, da, da. Add in little bits of your own dialogue. But basically, just ask them questions. I took one guy on uh, pickup coaching. I don't normally do this, but I had one guy who paid me money to go out with him for a weekend and pick up girls. And he said to me, oh, I'm really nervous, I'm really nervous. I was like, bro, ask them questions. Say hello, here's how you introduce yourself, here's how you say hello, ask them questions. And if you do that, you're 75% there. Because they're just gonna talk about themselves. You, it doesn't matter what they reply, who gives a fuck? You're a hairdresser, you're a nurse, you're a stripper. It's all the same shit, who cares? Oh really, that's interesting. Same answer to them all. Ask them, let them talk shit about themselves. This is super effective to make people like you. Super effective because everyone loves to talk about themselves. So keep that in mind. And then the body language trick is to really look like you're listening. Most people don't look like they're listening. If I want someone to like me, I really look like I'm listening. So if I need a boss to like me or a girl to like me, I'll make sure it's clear I'm paying attention. So if you've ever been in like a group 
of people and there's one girl you want to fuck and everyone's kind of talking amongst themselves. Da, 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 da. But when that girl's talking, people are half listening. But when that girl's talking, not nuance. Don't look like a fucking creep. But make it clear you're listening. If other people are all talking to you and she starts talking to you, go, okay, yeah. Look at her. I'm listening to you. Because then, they, oh, he thinks I'm important. He thinks what I say matters. And the boss is the same. He, he listens when I talk to him. He thinks I'm important. He thinks what I say matters. In a corporate situation, what I used to do, I used to do this all the time. Bosses love this shit. I used to walk around with a little notepad and pen. So if I got called to the boss's office, I'd go in there with a notepad and pen and sit there. And when they were talking to me, I'd just randomly write things down. And a few of them said, why you got that? She said, I don't want to miss any key points. And they sit there and go, this motherfucker takes everything. But they like that shit. Like, I'm talking, and he's writing it down to not miss my key points. Yeah, well, Mr. Andrew, you are the best salesman. You have sold three times more than everybody else. But I'm a greedy CEO, cunt. So I want you to sell more. So I was just wondering if you could possibly do this, or if you tried doing this, because you're my cash cow, and I want to milk you for all you're worth. Yeah, you're right. I did try that, actually. I did try that, but I'm going I'm to find the email. I'm going to send it to you. Let me, okay, yeah. You sit there, and you, I'm listening to you, sir. What you have to say matters. I'm writing it down. They're going to fucking love you. They're going to love you. They're like, who the fuck this guy? And then they call the fucking jackass salesman in. Hi, where's your sales? Yeah, I've tried. Uh, that's how you be liked. Making people, make it clear you listen to people. Most of you don't make it clear you're listening to someone. Make it clear you are listening to them. The notepad and pen example is fantastic with a the boss. They fucking love that shit. They're sitting there going, this dude is fucking, this takes his shit seriously. Because a boss hires you to make them money. They're always going to pay you less than they make out of you. Otherwise, they wouldn't have a business. So if you're sitting there taking them seriously, you're taking their money seriously. Wouldn't you love it if you had someone who came into your house with a pen and paper and goes, how can I make you more money? Tell me what to do. You'd be like, I fucking like this guy. Who wouldn't? So you just make it clear you're listening to people and ask lots of questions all the time. Especially, once again, with the boss, they love to ask questions. So even if I knew the correct answer, I'd ask them a question. So I'd say uh, something like, you know, I have my pen and my paper, I'm sitting there. Oh, fucking, I'm almost tempted to get a job again because it was so easy. You know, I never failed a job interview ever. I'd go for jobs that, were, that required a degree and I didn't even have a degree. I just walk in there. Go, oh, so Mr. Tate, uh, your degree? I haven't got a degree. Didn't need one. I didn't need one because I'm the best. I'm prepared to prove I'm the best. I'll work for a week for free and I guarantee within six months I'm going to smash any sales target you set me. I don't have time to go to university and sit there for four years. I'm here to get paid. I'm here to get you rich. I'm here to make me rich. I'm the best there's ever been. And they said, I'm going, what the fuck is this dude? Well, he's going to work for free. Let's at least try him out. I never failed a job interview. Ever. Ever, ever. I got every fucking job. I'm tempted to go back because it was so fun. But I'd sit there with my pen and paper and I'd ask him questions knowing the answers already. I'd be like, okay, sir, well, I've been trying two different types of proposal emails. One of them is getting about 20% more responses than the other. So it's the one I think is the best. But I want to send both to you so if you have time, I know you're busy. If you could just read them and just confirm that's the process I should be going. That's the path I should be going down. That's the process of the emails I'm going to be sending. he would be like, okay, yeah, send them across to me. As if he's going to say no, the other one, where it's not as effective. Of course he's going to choose the effective one. If he's, if he's a clever cat, which he probably is because he's a CEO, he's going to come back with the odd amendment to try and make it look like he knows something. So come back and go, yeah, that's really good. That's good, Andrew. Try and add this and this, and I think you'll be about there. And I'll pretend I didn't think of that. Good idea. So I didn't think of that. I'm going to add it right away. We'll update you shortly. I'll pretend I didn't fucking know and pretend it's important, even though it doesn't matter. He, he'll think he tricked me. Ah, that Andrew, he's a fucking smart fucker, but I'm still the smartest. I'm the boss. Bam! That's how they like you. Then when you walk in there and go, excuse me, sir, I've been working really, really hard for you and I do my very, very best for this company, this corporation, I respect you absolutely, but I'm unfortunately in a situation where I need to get paid more money. So what's it going to be? That's what I used to do. I used to smash sales records and then they were sitting there like, this tech guy's going to make the company rich. I'd walk in there three months later and say, unfortunately, I'm in a situation where I need more money. Not, could you please consider, not, duh, 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 no. Unfortunately, I'm in a situation where I need more money. And their answer would be, okay, uh, well, we have a quarterly review coming up, and we need to make sure your sales stay on track. They try and delay it. 
and say, okay, I'll wait for the quarterly review, no problem. I'm very, very excited about smashing records. I'm no longer interested in sales targets. I'm interested in beating the company's sales records. I know they're already mine, but I'm gonna beat them again. I'd say that. And the reason I'd say all that, knowing that the quarterly review is two, three weeks away, is because basically I've said, you better give me a pay rise in that review or I'm leaving. And the CEO is sitting there and go, fuck, this fucker, I can't let him go, he's the best we got. I have to put his money up. The, and when the quarterly review comes, say, oh yeah, hi sir, they all of a sudden they're doing fantastic, da, 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 da. Sometimes I had a couple of them try it. Unfortunately, we're not gonna increase your pay at this time. Da, da, da. I'd say, okay, no problem, I, I appreciate that. I just wanna make it clear with you, I'm gonna do my utmost, I'm gonna continue doing my job effectively. I believe if I'm gonna do something, I'm gonna do it properly, but I am in a position where I unfortunately do require more money, so I'm gonna start looking for another term of employment. I'm gonna leave then. Every time I got an email within two days, some fucking offer. Even if I didn't need the money, take the money. Who the fuck? Even if it's only a little bit of money, who cares? Take it. Thanks. It's a principal thing. You're going to fucking reward me, motherfucker. What deserve? I got a company car that exact same way. I came and I sat down and I said, Excuse me, sir. Da, 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 da. Unfortunately, I'm in a position where I can no longer use my own personal vehicle. He said, Well, we don't do company cars. I said, I understand that. And I know you're paying me 20 cents per mile. But the car I have, it's been damaged on the car. Also, my brother needs to use the car. I am a very good salesman. I, can, I intend to continue to sell effectively. I guarantee I will continue to break every single company record, but I can no longer do it in my vehicle. I need to be provided with a vehicle or I can no longer work for this company. Boom, give me a car. Most of you fuckers are afraid to say shit. Walk in there. Give me a car. What car? Literally, me and my brother were sitting in our apartment one day. He said, oh, I need the car tomorrow. I was like, I need that. I'll go to a meeting. Da, da, da. And I thought, oh, fuck this. They can give me a fucking car. Next day, had a car. We don't do company cars. Yeah, you do renting a fucking car because your number one salesman makes you all your money fucking said so. I guarantee you do that, don't you? Went down to Hertz and picked me up a fucking nice car. Of course you did. BMW 3 Series. Thanks. I spilled coffee all over the fucking seats. Ain't mine. I don't give a fuck. So you got to be. Mean your shit. But with CEOs, sometimes you have to pretend you're listening, but pretend you're listening to people. They like that shit. Give you a little notepad. Get your shit together. This can also work with women. Sometimes when one of my girlfriends, I say one of, because all you real Gs know how us real Gs live. They're like, oh, I've really got a problem. I need your time. And they're complaining at me. I say, look, listen, I'm busy right now. But I'm going to come around later and we're going to sort it out. If I say, okay, tell me what's the matter. And I have to listen. No, no, I'm going to come around later and sort it out. Turn up later. Okay, you have all my attention. What's the problem? Blah, 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 blah. Okay, all right. Okay, I'm going to do something about it. Yeah, but do what? Listen, I'm a fucking man. I know what to do. Just shh. Go. And then you do nothing, and then they forget about it because they're winning. No big deal. But just giving someone your undivided attention in a short burst can be extremely effective. Extremely effective. Leaning forward implies you're paying attention. Keep that in mind. As opposed to leaning back, we've already discussed this already. I've got a long list of questions for you motherfuckers. Leaning forward implies you're paying attention. Someone goes, how do I make it sh clear that I'm paying attention to them? We'll make it clear you're listening to them. We just discussed all this, but also lean forward. You can lean forward sometimes. Yes, tell me. It matters so much. I don't actually recommend this for women, but it is something you can do. Also, when we're talking about women. There's a lot of body language with pictures of women that people talk about. Like, don't lean in towards the girl. Well, we just talked about leaning in. Because leaning in shows that you're listening, shows you're attentive. They have every single picture is of you leaning into your girlfriend. Then it shows that basically she's in charge because you listen to her. As opposed to her leaning into you. So it is a sign of submission. For the same reason it's a sign of listening, it's a sign of submission. So keep that in mind. If you want to have a picture of you and your girl, you want to put it on Instagram, whatever, whatever. It needs to be a picture of you. I'm the man. I am the, I am the oak tree. She's hugging the oak tree. The oak tree doesn't bend over to the people who hugs it. I'm the fucking G. She enters your world. You don't enter hers. Most of you guys already know this stuff, so it's not that complicated. But yeah, you know, it hasn't got to be conscious. It, the reason body language is so effective is because it's unconscious. That's why it's effective. That's why people read it, because it happens by accident. So you have to consciously alter yours, but when you're going through life, you can't be sitting there going, how do I do this, how do I do that? You've got to just start thinking about it and practice a little bit and it become natural with your hands, etc., etc. So body language with women is never appear submissive. Women don't want to fuck a man they don't respect. Women don't have to like you to fuck you. They have to respect you. Do you know how many times I've retweeted, check my Twitter, I've retweeted a girl saying, I can't stand this Tate speech guy, but something about him, I have to follow him. Or on my YouTube video, I hate you, you're such a dickhead, I almost want to meet you. Or I retweeted a girl today, I, I almost want to slap, I, I kind of want to slap him, kind of want to fuck him. And that's because they don't like me, but they respect me. 
But like this fucking asshole. But yeah, I guess that's true. Well, yeah, I guess that's true. They respect me. Women don't gotta like you, they gotta respect you. So I, I fuck loads of girls who hate me. In fact, every day some girl's telling me she hates me. Every fucking day, I fucking hate you. Dick comes along and she's happy to take it. So you have to act in a way that's respected. And women don't respect men who are submissive to them. Women respect men who are in control. That's what happens. Women try to take control because it's natural for them to attempt it. And if you let them succeed, they'll just become worse and worse down a spiral of just becoming a bigger and bigger dickhead because they're waiting for you to take control back. That's what happens. So it's the same with your body language. So if you're always leaning in and she's the boss, she's not going to be happy with those photos. She wants a photo where you look in control and basically uninterested in her. If you look at photos, I recommend go to at Cobra Tate. We'll put a few examples in this video, but go to at Cobra Tate and find pictures of me with girls. There's one of me with a cigar and a girl either side. Am I staring at the girls? Do I give a fuck they even exist? I'm having a cigar, bro. I'm busy. I'm smoking. These are just some hoes, what, natural. Because I don't care about the girls. So who's in control there? Me. By not showing them attention. The number, the most important body language for a picture with a girl is basically to come across like, I don't give a fuck. Someone goes, you're about to take a picture with a girl. How do you come across as an alpha? You don't give a shit about the girl. Simple. You don't care about the girl. That's how you come across as an alpha. Take the picture like you take it. She wasn't even fucking there. Bang, smoking. Oh, there's a hoe there, there's a hoe there. Take life, whatever. That's one. It's another one of me with sunglasses on with two blondes on the side. And in this one, I'm smiling. Why am I smiling? I'm smiling because the one I'm looking at just agreed to get fucked with the other one. Two seconds before that, said, you're both staying with me tonight. She goes, oh, I don't know. I'm nervous. I said, look, we're going to go drinking. She goes, oh, well, oh, maybe. And I smiled. I was like, all right, good. We're going to go out. I was smiling because she agreed. Like I said earlier, positive reinforcement. I'm miserable. You said what I wanted you to say. Now I'll smile. Well, I just smiled at her because I knew she was about to be licking the other one's pussy in about four hours' time. That's what that one was. But in general, I'm sitting there. I wasn't looking at her and smiling. and I was looking forward. I don't give a fuck. I'm a dude who doesn't care. Women are always attracted to assholes. People go, why do girls like assholes? They don't like assholes. They like men who, overt, who display overtly masculine qualities. Men who don't succumb to their wishes. Men who don't bend to their will. Men who are in charge, men who retain control, men who can't be influenced or complained at or nagged at. And those kind of men are assholes. It's not about the fact that he's an asshole. It's about the fact that they can't control him. It's about the fact that they're trying to take a picture with him. He doesn't give a fuck if she's there or not. And those are overtly masculine, overtly attractive qualities to a woman. Even she doesn't understand why, but that's the reality of it. So if you're sitting there going, how do I take a picture with a girl? Take a picture with a girl if she doesn't exist. I'll put up another picture here of me and my girlfriend in Thailand, the last picture of me taken. There, you've just seen it. Do I look like I give a fuck that she's there? Now I am looking at her. A lot of body language, every pill guys go, don't even look at the girl, don't look at the girl, that's bad body language. Come on, you're a human, you look at things, it's not the fuck I'm gonna do. I look away all the time, like an idiot. But you can tell by my body language, I don't give a fuck. Her hand's on my knee, she's smiling, I'm not. You can tell by that body language who the fucking boss is. So. A lot of the red pill stuff is super specific. Like I've told you guys when I'm teaching in the PhD course, there's no such thing as an exact formula. There's no such thing as an exact specific thing. It's understanding general rules, general themes, and implementing them. That's why everything I teach is quite generalized. I'm waiting for you guys to see it, ingest it, understand it, and implement it in your own unique style. Because then it comes, across as, it comes across as authentic. If I say, do this with your hands exactly, do this, you look like little fucking robots. No, I'm telling you to be aware of certain things. Like chess, you know the rules and you make your own moves based on the rules to win. You have to develop your own style. But in general, the key for women is to just make it clear you don't give a shit. Because women like that. And also, what's actually super beneficial is if you genuinely don't give a shit, then it's super easy. Why you have to act like you don't give a shit if you actually don't give a shit? I actually don't care. I've been around so many shits. That picture of me with a cigar and there's two girls hanging off me. I was, when I was smoking a cigar, you can look carefully and you'll see my eyes. My eyes are down. I'm looking at some guy and the guy's face was literally, he was literally like his world was blown because he saw me with two tens. Not these other pickup artist versions of tens. Actual tens. Two smoking hot, big booty, big titty, hot ass, young 20 year old chicks. 
And he was there just like, who the fuck is this guy? Mr. Cigar just walked up and his chits are hanging all over him. Is he a pimp? Is he famous? Who is he? He's, he was just blown away. I didn't give a fuck. He gave a fuck. That's the difference. Don't give a shit. FDB. We talked about smiling a little bit. When we talked about smiling, we said how it's a sign of submission. Also, you guys will know on Twitter, soy face. That's a sign of submission as well. If you're not comfortable within your own skin, you see a lot of people, they take pictures and they pull stupid faces. They'll go like, or, or when they're with someone, they'll be like, all that shit is submission. All that shit is evolutionary, primate, submissional. You're just broadcasting to the world that you're a fucking loser. Don't do that. You either smile in a picture because you're happy or you just look at the camera. Done. Uh, uh, you're not fucking clown and you're not fucking 15. You're making stupid ass fucking faces. It's dumb. Don't do that. Ever. Especially not with a chick. Sometimes chicks do that a lot. <laughs> and you're next to her. <laughs> I guarantee you're not fucking her to do that shit. I've had girls do that next to me. <laughs> I'm just like, look at them like the moron they are. Because I don't give a fuck. What the fuck are you making stupid ass faces for? Fuck off. Suck this. So don't do that shit. So if you're pulling weird faces in photographs, that's because you're insecure. And you're trying to broadcast to the world that you're a little liberal coward. And you're hoping that no one destroys you. You're hoping Big Daddy Tate doesn't come along and squash you in the palm of this awesomely huge hand. Don't be like that shit. I fucking hate that shit. I don't hang around with people who do that shit. Don't do that. Ever. I'm going to put up a picture of my brother now with his girl. Bang, you just saw it. That girl there is called Bianca Dragashana. She has a million followers, or near a million, on Instagram. You look her up. You can Google her. She's the most famous girl in Romania. She's like, oh, she had her own TV show. Legitimately A-list in Romania. Very rich as well. Most men would be intimidated by a famous woman who's that hot, who's rich. Tristan went up to her in a fucking petrol station. Went up to her. Started talking shit. Just the way me and him do it. Got her number. Progression. PhD guys. Tower of power. Introduced himself. Blah, blah, blah. Confident. Bang, bang, bang. He didn't get her number. He got her Instagram. Messaged her there on the spot so she saw it. Even amongst a million messages. Ended up getting her number. Da, da. Anyway, he ends up fucking this chick. She's married. She's fucking married. Whole thing comes out in the papers. Me and Tristan end up A-list stars in Romania because we're the guy who fucked Bianca. I'm the brother, but he's the guy who fucked Bianca when she's married. Got everything. Complete craziness. Anyway, the point of this picture is this. Most men, when they get a girl like that, they're all over her. She's famous. She's rich. She's important. She's special. <laughs> look at Tristan's body language in that picture. Does he look like he gives one fuck about that chick? He doesn't give a fuck about that hoe. He doesn't care. He doesn't care. Some hoe. Mm. How many hoes have I fucked? Mm. Who cares? You dudes are out here caring too damn much. It's garbage. Like all of my courses, what I'm going to do is I'm going to update them forever for free. So if you've bought the PhD course, you've bought the webcam course, you've bought this course, your money has been well spent because you're going to be getting new videos every couple of weeks for free forever. So this is the basis of my theory on body language. If you've I've missed anything or is there anything you want me to talk about, send me an email because guess what? Another video will come out and I'll answer your questions specifically. So if you've watched this, and you feel like you haven't learned anything, you're fucking lying. Because I guarantee you don't have everything I've said to you. I guarantee you don't have under control, understood, analyzed, and implemented. You haven't. So fucking go away and do that shit. Get your things together. Put your hands in the right fucking place. Look like a G. Get your shit right. Learn how to go from fucking crazy to calm. Not from calm to crazy. Put your shit together. If you have any further questions, email them to me. Because there will be another body language video in the next week or so. And I'll answer some more. Right, we've been over the mindset. The mindset, the four tenets of the mindset are believe you can do absolutely anything. Two, be pissed off you haven't done it yet. Three, absolutely nobody is coming to save you. And four, your word has to be iron-willed and use that for unlimited motivation. This is about body language. I like to look at humans from an evolutionary standpoint. I like to look at us as a species because like I said, I'm an atheist. I do not believe that God put us here. We're, no special. we're not special. We're no different than any other animal here. Okay, we're more intelligent, but there's always going to be a smartest, you know, we're not the fastest or the strongest or anything else. So we're an animal species. And if you look at humans uh, 
from that perspective and you look at men, males, and I'm assuming, like I said previously, most of you are men, males for a very long period of time had a very physical role. Our role was combatants. Our role was a combative role. Our role was to protect or to destroy or to dominate or to conquer. This was a male's role. So in the modern society where we pretend physicality isn't important and we deny physicality and people say it doesn't matter, it absolutely does matter for, because since the dawn of human time, my favorite saying that everyone mocks me for, since the dawn of human time, for 95% of our existence, a man's role was primarily a physical role. So physicality is extremely important. And when you're looking at body language, it's quite difficult to have the body language of an alpha. What is an alpha? Let me diverse quickly. What is an alpha? If you look in the, a lion's pride, who's the alpha? The alpha is the biggest, strongest lion. This is, this is the alpha. The alpha is the badass. So can you mimic the body language of a biggest, longest, strongest lion? Yeah, of course. But if you're not the biggest, strongest lion, you know, it's not as easy to pull off and someone might call your bluff. So this is actually a very easy video. Body language is down to your physicality as a whole. Uh, the body language of a G is a combative body language. I'm not saying you walk through life like this, like looking for a fight, not at all. But you have to have a presence about you, whereas you're not an easy target. It's quite funny, actually, because when you're a fighter, you can spot other fighters a mile off. Like, and it's not just big, muscly guys. Like, you can put me in a room with, and 30 guys who go to the gym, who are fitness experts, can come in and walk through. And if one of them is a high-level combatant, if one of them is a, a professional fighter like me, I can, I can tell by the way he moves, probably the same way a dancer can sense another dancer. I can sense another fighter. And it's something instinctual. It's something I can't even tell you how I do it. I can just tell by the way someone moves if they can fight or if they can't fight. It doesn't matter. They can have the best body in the world. They can be ripped. Da, da, da. But it's the way they move. I know, I've seen guys who don't have a body like that and I can sense it. And I've seen guys who are built like that and I can just tell it. they would crumble. It really is an amazing thing. And I think this is something that you become more tuned into, more honed on when you're a fighter yourself, but it's obviously something that humans naturally possess. We naturally possess the ability to spot another male and think, that guy's a dangerous guy. So I can tell you tips and tricks in an attempt to mimic the body language of a dangerous person, or you can become a dangerous person. This course is not a shortcut course. This is not tips and tricks. This is not bullshit. This is about how to become a G, how to become a genuine ass, a genuine male of substance. And to become a genuine male of substance, you need to know how to fight. It's very difficult to be a G if you're going through life and you crumble at, at, at physical confrontation. Because when you get to a certain point in your life, you will encounter physical confrontations. If you're gonna go and travel the world and drive fast cars and wear expensive things and attempt to fuck beautiful women all over this planet, Sooner or later, you're going to attract negative intention from either jealous men or an ex-boyfriend or a brother or who fu a fucking robber who wants your car. Who knows? Are you really a G if you mimic every single as aspect of a high-quality man and then when that situation happens, you, you fold? No, of course you're not. You need to learn how to fight. I don't need to teach you how to fight. I don't need to sit here in this course and say, do this, do that. I don't need to teach you any of that because you can go, and it doesn't matter what city you are on earth, there's an MMA class or there's a boxing class that will teach you how to fight. You need to dedicate substantial periods and, 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 and portions of your time to learning how to fight. You need to get hit. You need to have your ass kicked. You need to learn how to kick someone's ass. And this is absolutely essential to one, the mindset, and two, the physicality. Firstly, mindset-wise, fighting is a, is a brilliant thing because fighting is 100% accountable. Even if you play soccer, for example, even if your team wins, maybe you didn't do very much, or maybe you kicked the ball and the wind helped you, who knows? But fighting, if you got punched in the face, you didn't move. And if you punched him in the face, you threw your hand. In fighting, we always say there's no such thing as a lucky punch, and it's true. You know, I, if I dedicate my life to learning how to punch, and then I knock someone out, is it a lucky punch? No, I knocked him out, that's what, that's what I've been training to do. No such thing as a lucky punch. So, mindset-wise, it's perfect for your accountability. Secondly, it's a huge challenge. Learning how to fight is extremely difficult. It's more difficult than learning how to dance or learning how to do anything else. And the reason for this is because learning how to fight, all humans have an instinctual 
way of fighting. We don't have an instinctual way to dance as much, but all humans basically are pre-programmed to fight, but the way we're pre-programmed to fight is completely wrong. We're pre-programmed to lift our head up so we look big and we can see and, and to swing with our hands low for maximum power. And these are completely wrong in terms of traditional chin down, hands up fighting. So when you're learning to fight, you're, you're reprogramming your basic instincts. And this is why it's so difficult. This is why it takes more practice than any other sport. I could learn to dance much easier than a dancer could learn to fight at high level. Um, and that's because fighting is extremely chaotic, it's extremely quick, it hurts. And on top of that, you're trying to reprogram a basic instinct. So it's a very difficult thing to do, but if you want to become a G for real, you need to learn how to fight. And once you learn how to fight, your body language, when I say once you learn how to fight, learning how to fight takes years. Once you start to begin to learn how to fight, it's a lifestyle choice. This is not a, I do a six week course and I know how to fight. No, this is a lifestyle choice where you start to dedicate a certain period of your time every single week to being a combative individual. And it's something that you never really give up on because you never completely learn how to fight. So it's something you're gonna to have to change your lifestyle and base it around. But when you start to do that, your body language is gonna change. And once again, just like in the first lesson, when you start to do that, the way you interact and view the world will start to change. The way you view other people will start to change. This is a great thing about, especially when I had Twitter and the internet. I wasn't, I wasn't big on Twitter until Trump was, Trump was elected and that's when I started to tweet and they verified me straight away and I got mixed up and everything went crazy. But um, you realize that 99% of the people on there with their opinions and who are being rude would never speak to you that way in, in, in real life. It never bothered me, it didn't ever upset me, but when I was on Twitter, I'd never been spoken to that way in real life. Nobody ever spoke to me that way. No one ever argued with me that way. And I thought, well, why is that? And I thought, because I have a physical presence that even I was unaware of. If I sit with someone who hates Trump in, real, in the real world, the way they speak to me is completely different than they do on Twitter because even subconsciously they're thinking, this guy is a dangerous guy. And even if, even if they know I'd never attack them, because I'm not, I'm not an idiot, I'm not an animal, I don't have a criminal record, I'm not, I'm not a thug. But instinctually, in, inside of their mind, from an evolutionary standpoint, they're thinking, this is not the kind of guy you, you call names. This is not the kind of guy you talk to in that manner. And it's, it was a really great experiment for me to see the way that people talk to you through a computer and the way that I've never been interacted with that way in real life. And I was like, well, why is that? Because I said this to someone else, they go, oh, people talk to me like that all the time. I was like, well, yeah, it's because you're you and I'm me. So a physical presence is, is a real thing. And it's a real thing, one with other males, and it's certainly a real thing with females. Absolutely a real thing with females. And this is something that either I can teach you to imitate, I can tell you tips and tricks, or you can just go and fucking do it. If you go and do it for real, you don't need tips and tricks. Are you gonna be world champion? No, because I'm in the top 0.1% of, of physical athletes. But can you be good? Sure, you can be good. And is it gonna damage your life in any way to dedicate specific time learning how to fight? Of course not. You're gonna be in physical, better physical condition, better mental condition. You're gonna have a better body language because a male's body language is a combative body language. That's what men are meant to do. We are meant to fight. We're meant to conquer. This is why men have been men since the dawn of human time. This is why the Romans got some rocks, melted the rocks, made swords, these motherfuckers, they didn't have Google Maps. They didn't know where they were going. They thought, let's just walk in this direction and then we're gonna find some people and we're gonna kill them. And we're gonna take all their women and we're gonna conquer their city because we want to. This is what men have been built to do since the dawn of human time. Men are combative individuals. So to pretend that combat's not real anymore and we live in society and you don't have to do that, all garbage, you know? And this is Western society bullshit anyway. If you've been, I've been to 71 countries. If you go to the places I've been, you will realize that physical presence is still a very real thing. Absolutely a very real thing in many parts of this planet still today. So body language of a G is a very, very short and simple lesson. One, go and learn to fight because a man's body language needs to be a combative body language and there's no point in me teaching you how to imitate that when you can go and learn it for real. That's the first thing, go and learn how to fight. And that's it, it's really that simple. If you want a body language which really does display your value as a high value male, then go and become one and learning how to fight is, is the easiest way to do that. My name is Tristan Tate. Congratulations on buying the body language course. My brother's body language, as it's been commented on by many, many people, is always on point. But I'm here today to talk about how you and your best friend, your brother, your companion, whoever you like to hang out with, 
how your body language can complement each other. Now, the main reason for this isn't to be combat ready, as Andrew touched on in a previous video, but it's more to avoid confrontation. Now, me and Andrew are very controversial characters. Almost nobody who knows who we are likes us. You are one of the <laughs> few people, you're one of the elite, the people who actually understand what we're talking about and like what we have to say, but most people don't. That said, we are never started on in the real world. Now, of course, now we're well-renowned uh, kickboxing champions, but we've always had the same principles and the same body language and the same mannerisms. And we've noticed that people do not start on us very often. And the best way to avoid conflict and to avoid combat is to be perceptive. There was a very famous experiment actually done in India where uh, tiger attacks on Indian miners were completely going crazy. The, the numbers were through the roof. And you can look this up. Please look it up. And the solution they came to, to avoid tigers attacking the miners, with these miners would take human-faced masks and wear them on the back of their heads. So they'd do their mining, go down in their boats, drive around in their trucks, be out in the open with this mask on the back of their head. And if you look it up on Google Images, uh, for sure you'll be able to find exactly what I'm talking about. You'll see that the masks look stupid. It, it looks ridiculous. It was, it was only a very minor touch that these guys thought about the problem and uh, actually applied something. But tiger attacks essentially dropped to zero. Now men, very much like tigers, are big pussies too. I just thought of that. I didn't actually write this. <laughs> but um, what you'll find is everyone's a coward and no one wants to fight one-on-one. -on -one. So even if there's only two of you, your body language, how you stand and where you place yourself can be a massive deterrent to being started on or having any kind of physical confrontation. Now in school, they teach you uh, things like a strong handshake. And I'm sure the basis of this is in every single course or guide to body language in the world, but they teach it for the wrong reasons. In school, I was taught that a strong handshake makes the person who I want to employ me like me more or take me more seriously. But you could convey many different expressions and emotions with something as simple as a handshake. If I'm in a room with a group of people who may or may not be hostile, if I'm in a room with a group of people who may or may not be hostile, the standard good handshake they'll teach you to give with the right expression on your face can also mean don't fuck with me. It can say I'm stronger than you. It could say I'm not a pushover. These are things that people don't think about because it's never taught. Everyone's taught how to shake hands to say, please employ me, please give me a job. But many other things can be conveyed with just a handshake. Now, when me and Andrew are out in public, we're always watching each other's backs. Now, paranoia isn't cool, it isn't sexy, uh, and it isn't really alpha to be paranoid all the time that somebody's gonna start on you. Um, I know people who walk through the world in this way. They're scared of everything and everybody. The, the police, the person walking behind them, they're jumpy. That's not what I'm talking about, and that is not the way men like me and Andrew behave. When I talk about watching each other's backs, it's the small things that me and Andrew do that people who hang around with us pick up on. You guys at home won't see these things because they're never recorded and they're never on camera. Me and Andrew always sit, for example, across the table from one another, just in case somebody decides to come up from behind and attack us. It's very much like the tiger analogy, wearing the mask on the back of your head. I am his other set of eyes. If Andrew's on a date with a beautiful woman and I'm sitting with my back against the wall and I can see what's going on behind Andrew, Andrew can relax. Andrew can have his good time. He can not worry about you know, looking over his shoulder because you know me and Andrew do have a few enemies um, everywhere, including the city where we live. This doesn't just apply when you're with somebody else, but it can very much apply to yourself. Are you by yourself? Are you in Starbucks getting a coffee about to do some work on your laptop? Fine. Be very careful about where you sit. Choose somewhere where your back is against the wall. Like right now, I'm sitting in a corner. I can see everything that's going on in the room in front of me. This is the place you want to sit. Not because you think somebody's going to come up and attack you. Not because you are 
scared of uh, assailants or muggers or robbers. Just being able to see everything that goes on in the room gives you the chance to react to situations. I guarantee if you were to look at some of the violent, crazy things that have happened in Europe from bombings to terrorist attacks in the last few years, some of the people who survived, survived because of where they were sitting. And it wasn't chance. A few of the people, I'm sure, were self-aware enough to be perspicacious about their environment, to sit in the corner, to watch what's going on, to be able to react to the environment around them. Now, when I see people with headphones in, slouched over a table with their coffee, typing away, away on their laptop, and the whole room's behind them and they're facing a wall, they look like a target to me. You don't have to be a tiger to know that that person is a target. If anything goes down in that coffee shop, if anything goes down in that restaurant, that person is going to be one of the first to die. So watch each other's backs and sit across the table from one another always. I have had people who I've invited over to Eastern Europe who assume that me and Andrew are the kings of everywhere we go. Mostly because me and Andrew are very adept fighters and we can handle ourselves very well. But you need to understand in most situations from Western Europe to Eastern Europe, when you go to very expensive, exclusive places, nightclubs, first class lounges at airports, the people around you are your equals or your betters in, in some respect, financially or, or, or something in, in one way or another. Now, if I'm in a club and I'm sitting in the VIP section, there are six tables only in an entire club that has maybe 2000 people in it. I know those other people are somebody's too. There very rarely will a club just let some loser in to sit around and drink their super expensive alcohol. And even then it's a promoter who knows people or who's friends with the owner or something like that. Now me and Andrew hang out in Eastern Europe a lot. So watching each other's backs isn't just actually viewing your surroundings and knowing what's going on around you, your self-awareness. It's also how you interact with the people who surround you. To give you an example, if I sit down at a table and there are three or four dudes, a, a number of dudes who outnumber us to my right. Now this has happened plenty of times where there are six or seven girls on my table. Now how you assert yourself is going to determine whether or not those guys try to roll up on your women. You're only two guys, you're with six girls. They assume that these girls are friends of my girlfriend. They don't know I'm fucking three and Andrew's fucking three. So of course it's natural and normal for other guys to at least think about talking to the girls who come with you to the club. That doesn't happen to me and Andrew because of the way we assert ourselves. What you'll typically find is the most confident amongst them works as a scout. will say hi, will say, can I borrow a lighter from one of the girls? When that happens, Always ask the girl if she's okay afterwards. I do it all the time. Girl, a guy will be like, excuse me, do you have a lighter to one of my girls? I'll say, hey, you okay? And touch her arm gently. So the guy says, oh, I was just asking for a lighter. No problem, my friend. Handshake, eye contact. You know, you have to assert, don't fuck with me with the initial contact with the guy. If I just turn my back and ignore him after the lighter has been borrowed and he gives it back, he's going to say, where are you from? Who are you? What's up? You know, you have to cut things off the moment they happen. You have to nip it in the bud. So the way you conduct yourself within your own group of people will stop others trying to come over and invade your space. So the key is always to put yourself in a position of power. Don't just sit down and start guzzling away on drinks. I don't typically sit next to Andrew and talk away and let our girls mind their own business. We're mixed in with them, two or three girls divided by one of us at any stage around a round table, uh, if you know what I mean. So we're always in control of our group, in control of our herd, if you like. So the way you position yourself lets others know not to creep up on you, not to try to talk to your women, and especially not to start some sort of stupid argument. That said, in clubs also, combat readiness. I always like to keep at least one of my hands free. If my hand isn't free, it's something that can be used as a weapon. Now I've, in my life, been in maybe two fights inside of nightclubs, none of them in Eastern Europe. It's more of an England thing. And I avoid conflict at all costs. But the way you stand can mean the difference between getting your ass kicked and winning a fight. Typically, even if I'm smoking a cigar, the cigar can be easily dropped. I'll keep it in my left hand. My right hand is the hand that I'm gonna strike with first. That's where I'll hold my glass because a glass can be used as a weapon just as much as a fist can be used as a weapon. 
and I always stand left foot in front of right foot ever so slightly just so I can't be caught off guard, just so that I'm not off balance, just so that at any one time with my glass and my cigar in one hand, if someone approaches really quickly, which is how these things always start, you're always good to throw a strike, throw the glass, or throw a punch. Before people even come over and try to talk to girls you're with, or try to start a fight with you, people will always scout you out. They'll always stare at you for a little period of time. They'll ask their friends, what do you think these two are, are doing with all those girls? Where do you think these guys are from? So when you catch them looking at you, don't stare them out. Don't put an aggressive look on your face because that just makes them want to fight you more, especially if you're outnumbered. That's going to encourage a, a physical altercation. So you don't sit there looking angry at them. And what you absolutely don't do is when they catch you looking at them, look away instantly. That shows cowardice. What I do, I'm a very confident guy, Andrew as well. Keep in mind that when we're in a high class establishment, the people who are with us are, you know, successful guys, rich guys, mafia guys, dangerous guys. There's somebody's to be sitting there. So if I'm holding my drink, typically if I catch them looking and I catch eye contact, I'll just nod at them or I'll go like this. I'll raise my glass slightly and continue drinking. They'll typically do the same thing back and that eases all tension. Nobody after that is going to come over and start trying to throw punches to your face. So if you sit confidently, and assert yourself just with your eyes and the looks that you give the people around you, you can avoid basically all types of, of, of confrontation. No one's going to come over and try and talk to your women. No one's going to come over and try to assault you, try to insult you. Um, you have to set an atmosphere and set a vibe that you're friendly, but you're not to be fucked with. And one more time, that takes me back to the handshake. That's what you need to say when you introduce yourself to people, especially if they come over to your table and try to do something you don't like, like talk to your girlfriend. Now, I know I may look big and scary and some people watching may think, oh, well, you know, it's all right for you. You're big and mean looking, so nobody's going to start a fight on you. Nobody's going to want to engage in conflict with you. That's not necessarily true. You can assert yourself with confidence alone. The way you scout the room, everything I was saying earlier, sitting in the corner, watching everybody around you, gives you the chance to see exactly what's going on. Now that reminds me of a clip I saw on the internet of a man, I believe it was in Australia, where 10 to 15 guys ran into a bar. I think they were trying to attack somebody or rob the place. I'm not sure what these assailants were doing, but this guy was standing, his, his back was to a, a pillar in the middle of the room, so no one could necessarily run up behind him. And he was standing at the bar. He wasn't a very big guy or a necessarily scary looking guy. But he stood there with one of his hands on his glass and the other hand completely free. And as each person rushed by him and rushed up to him, he glanced at them slightly. Now the CCTV footage is a little grainy. I can't see exactly how he looked at these people, but he didn't look down at the floor. He didn't stare at him with fear and he didn't sit there with an angry look on his face. He must have, by process of elimination, 10, 10 guys ran by him, they all glanced at him and nobody started on him. He must have conveyed some of the tips I've been talking to you about in this video. Now, why does nobody start on this guy? He doesn't panic, he doesn't flee, he doesn't run. That portrays somebody who can handle themselves, certainly. His hands are free, he's calm, he's confident, and he's looking at what's going on around him. The people who rushed into that bar were 10 to 15 individuals. They were not confident men. Nobody who wants to go and rob somebody or attack somebody has to bring 10 to 15 of their friends if they're not cowards. It's like splitting up a pack of sheep. You know, the herd on its own can look intimidating coming towards you. But when you get one on their own, they're absolutely terrified. And that's exactly how this guy handled the situation. He looked at each one of them as a one-on-one -on -one situation, a one-on-one -on -one man -on man confrontation. And when they got that look and when the guys made eye contact with him or when they brushed past him, none of those people wanted to fight him. And that's the way the real world is. This takes me back to my original point. What those Indian miners did by putting the masks on the back of their head may seem so insignificant and so stupid. And by all means, please Google it. They look ridiculous. But all it takes is the tiniest of little steps and the tiniest of little details to deter physical confrontation and to stay out of conflict. The reason behind this is because most men are cowards. Most men don't want to fight you one-on-one. -on -one. Occasionally, you'll meet that guy 
every once in a while who thinks he can handle himself has a problem with you and wants to deal with you and will actually come forward wanting to fight you head on but that's not the way the world is 99.9% .9 of men cannot throw a punch they can't throw a punch they can't take a punch and deep down they know it that's why tiny little details can completely avoid conflict now in the last 10 years me and andrew have had maybe five or six physical altercations where hitting someone has become a necessity and every single time they've been very easy to deal with but on top of those there have been at least 200 times where somebody has wanted to hit me or Andrew, or somebody has thought something negative about me or Andrew, and it could have spiraled into a physical altercation had I been in the wrong company or had I displayed the wrong body language. That's a massive part of conflict avoidance. Network brilliance. Every time I start one of these courses, I feel like I need to do some kind of intro and not just jump straight into it, but I don't know what the fuck you want me to do. I do a dance or some shit. So we're gonna get straight to it. I have met Hollywood actors, Idris Elba. I've met Donald Trump Jr., the son of the president. Um, I've met basically every big person in politics on the right from Twitter. Uh, I've met here in Romania, absolutely everybody who's anybody, actors, singers, etc., etc. And I've done this very, very deliberately. And it's one of those things, very similar to, let's say, girls, where once you get started, once you begin the process, it becomes easier. Once you start and you start getting a few girls, you end up with lots and lots of girls. Once you start meeting important and influential people, you'll meet lots and lots of important and influential people. But there are lots of mistakes that most people make when it comes to networking themselves to the top. And that's what this course is gonna be about. It's gonna be a long list of mistakes not to make. And it's also gonna explain the psychology of networking. What most people don't understand is as follows. There's huge psychology involved in networking. And there's three elements. The first element is, you don't know who I know. So if you go to meet somebody, let's say you're at an event and you meet someone, and that person happens to know the president, unless they're obviously overtly in the White House, unless they're overtly a, a member of the White House staff, or they're a loud mouth, you may have no idea they know the president. If I didn't advertise the fact just now, or put the picture on Instagram, nobody would have a clue that Donald Trump Jr and I speak to each other. No one would have a clue. So firstly, a lot of people don't overtly advertise who they know. Secondly, most people, when they do get a connection of influence that's important, they don't wanna give that away. So most people don't wanna give that away for a variety of reasons. One, because they're afraid of getting sidetracked or cut out. And two, because people are petty and jealous. That's how people are. So if I have a very important connection, and I know that introducing you to that connection is going to improve your life. What's my motivation to do that? Why would I want to do that? That's the first thing. Uh, and the second thing is, if I do do that and it works out particularly well and you two become best buddies, then I've just been cut out the picture perhaps. That, that important person has one more friend. He's doing business with you. I'm not getting anything. So what's, what's the advantage to it? So you have to understand that people are very secretive about who they know. And even if they do tell you who they know, they're very guarding of it. And thirdly, and this is the largest reason is, it's impossible to refer someone without also referring your reputation. So if I were to go to someone who I know is important and say, ah, this guy can do this, and I refer you, and you fuck up, that impacts me. Even if I say, oh, I don't know the guy that well, but you know, I've heard he's okay. Even if I try and disassociate myself, if you do a shit job, that impacts me. So when people are referring you and you're trying to network, what's really happening is people are recommending you, but they're really recommend, they're, they're putting their trust on the line to recommend you. So once again, they need a motivator to do that. The whole networking scene is down to motivators. And what most people make the mistake of doing is they run around trying to talk to everybody without motivating anybody ever to refer them. And that's the biggest mistake. So we have two ways we can look at this. Everybody you meet, it doesn't matter if you meet the president or you meet somebody at the bottom of the chain, you need to do the same things with. So if you're very lucky and you walk into the room and you see the president there, that's fantastic. But most likely you're going to see somebody far less important. And if you do a very good job, you can network your way to the top. When I met Idris and I was putting that TV show, I didn't meet him first. I knew a lot of people who knew a lot of people and I ended up there. So it's going to be very unlikely you're going to meet the person you want to meet straight away. 
But assuming that's the case, there's a few very basic rules. And these are super basic. And th these are things I shouldn't have to say. Introduce yourself, be confident. Body language is all explained in the body language course. Be sure of yourself. Don't be arrogant. And third, and one of the most important things, important people, especially super important people, they're not really that interested in you. You have to understand that it's a very fine balance. People think, oh, I'm gonna meet this guy. I need to prove to this guy I'm worth something. But also, you don't wanna sit there and tell the president about what you do for a job. He doesn't give a shit. He's the president. Compared to him, you're a nobody. So you have to really understand the balance of asking them questions while also validating yourself. So instead of saying, if I were to meet an important person, and let's say that important person was in banking, for example, if I sit there and go, oh, I'm a millionaire, I did this, I did that, and I made money, and da 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 da, he ain't gonna give a fuck. The dude could be getting a million pounds a week, as far as I know. So instead I'd say, ah, yeah, I'm actually looking for a banking solution. When I'm trying to move large sums of money, I'm struggling to get it done. What is the best banking solution? What would you recommend for someone living in Europe? So what I've done there is validate me as a person. I've explained that I make large sums of money, but I've also stroked his ego by asking him a question and engaging him in the conversation. That is completely different from me sitting there and talking shit, and it's completely different from only asking him questions. So you have to find a way to validate yourself while also engaging him and asking him questions and stroking his ego. Important people are arrogant. You're never gonna meet an important person who's not arrogant. All of them are. So stroking their ego is always a good idea. Not in a, in a, not in a pathetic way, because I'm not gonna respect you, but just respecting their position and their intelligence and their knowledge and asking for some of it. That's, that's it. There's a whole bunch of shit these people know that you don't know. That's the whole reason you want to network with them in the first place. So that's an important point. Next, and this is very key, and this could be a whole section on itself, but we'll, we'll start now. Networking is expensive. The key to networking is having money. And I say this all the time. If you meet someone who's more important than you, you're paying for everything. It doesn't matter how expensive the drinks are, how expensive the dinner is. You need to pay for it. You need to absolutely insist. No, please, no, it was a pleasure to meet you. It's on me, it's on me. They don't give a fuck about money, but it just proves a point. It allows you to have some kind of dominance and hold your own as a man. If you go to dinner with a really important person and that person pays for the dinner, do you think that same person is gonna trust you with thousands and thousands of dollars when you're sitting there taking a free dinner with a little dork? No, so you have to pay for the dinner. That's the first thing. You gotta look good when you turn up. You gotta turn up in these very expensive places like you've been there a thousand times before. You cannot be impressed by anything. You can't be like, oh wow, this food's great. Oh, this wine. Oh yeah, this is a really nice restaurant. It's just a fucking restaurant. It doesn't matter if you end up on a private jet for the first time in your life, you don't say a word. You're completely unimpressed. Like you've done it a thousand times. These are the basic things. If you're gonna sit there and go, oh wow, 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 then he's gonna show that you're much lower down than him. People at the top, they don't really wanna do business or network with people below them. Why would they? They want to do business with people on the same level of them as them. Or people maybe slightly below, but they have a good motivator to elevate you as an individual. If you're making it super clear you've never lived this kind of lifestyle, then you're going to struggle. So you're not impressed by anything. You're paying for everything when you're around someone more important than you. When Idris and I were in Thailand training for his fight, every time we'd go out, I'd pay. I was like, oh, I wouldn't even, because I wouldn't even, it wouldn't be offering. Just the bill would come, I'd just put the money down and we'd walk off. Now, Idris had more money than me, but I just, just whatever, just, it, it's a point of dominance. It's a point of, yeah, you're the Hollywood actor, but you're not the only motherfucker around here who has some money. And at the time, I didn't even have that much money, but I'm not a little bitch. I'm not going to let him pay for me because he's a more important one than I am. So that's a very important thing. Second thing when it comes to money, it's super important because networking is about chances. It is super rare that someone's going to say to you, Come here at this time and you're guaranteed to meet X. That's not how networking works. Networking is about taking a chance and taking chances is expensive. When I met Donald Trump Jr., he said, if you're around on these dates, I might be free for half an hour. And I was in Romania. How many people fly from Romania to New York, 3,000 miles, and sit there for a week for a maybe on 30 minutes? Most people go, ah, I can't do that. Or they'll say, oh, uh, can we guarantee? What about this? And they pressure the dude. And then the dude's gonna say, well, I can't guarantee. I've got a very busy schedule. 
How can I guarantee you anything? I'm the son of the president. I've got a super busy schedule. I've never met you. I don't know you. Meeting you is really not going to benefit me that much. I don't give a fuck about you. I'm not going to guarantee you a thing. If I tried to pressure him and said, okay, what about this day, this time, this day, this time, to try and get my guarantee, he would have bailed. So instead I said, yeah, okay, I'm around. And I flew there and I spent hex amount of thousands of dollars and it paid off. There's been times I've done similar things for other important people and it hasn't paid off. But this is the reality of networking. Networking is never going to be guaranteed. So because it's not guaranteed, you have to have the ability to take your chances and that is expensive. I'm not going to sit here and lie to you and pretend that networking is, is cheap. It's absolutely not cheap. You have to be prepared to go somewhere at a whim, turn up and see if that person has time. And maybe they don't. But you have to be there right place, right time. And being at the right place at the right time is certainly expensive to do. So that's the monetary element. Now we're talking about motivations. And like all my courses, this is lots of information, just like the PhD course. There's lots of information coming at you. I don't care how many times you have to watch this. I don't care if it's take notes, break it down, whatever. I don't sit and do little chapters. I speak what comes from my mind through experience. That's why it's so fucking golden. So you're just going to pay attention. Motivators. There's only two, in fact, three genuine motivators that are going to allow someone to refer you. Because that's all networking is. It's referrals. If you meet someone for the first time, we've just explained, you have to pay for it, you have to introduce yourself, don't waste the person's time, make sure you stroke their ego with your questions, validate yourself while also allowing them to validate themselves so they're happy being the dominant person, being Mr. Important. Those are the key things. Most networking is gonna come from referrals. Someone is gonna recommend you. So look at me here, you know who I am. I have access to the president's son. Why do I not recommend you to the president's son? Well, the reason for that is one, because I'm putting my reputation on the line. And two, the other three motivators have not been fulfilled. So there's three motivators. I'm only going to recommend you to somebody else, the president's son or anyone, for A, money, B, because I really like you, or C, because it raises my status. So these are the only three motivators that are going to take someone and make them put conscious effort into taking, into taking one of their relationships and sharing it with you. So we'll talk about the first one, money. It's very easy to, to, to go through the world and think, oh, I've got the people and I promise them they'll make lots of money and everyone's going to network with me because I've got this great business, da, da 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 It's all bullshit because one, your great business is not nearly as great as you think it is. Two, telling people about your great business, most people don't give a shit and most people aren't going to believe in you. I mean, the, the thing is about businesses, none of them are really that sexy. Starbucks is a coffee shop. If you were to walk around and say, oh, I'm going to start this coffee shop, people would be like, oh, whatever. Now it's, a super, it's, a, it's successful. It's a successful business. But if you were, if, before it started, if you were walking around trying to pitch it to people, try to network, and we're going to have this coffee shop, we're going to sell carrot cake, no one's going to give a fuck. No one's going to be interested. So business ideas are really not that sexy to talk about. Even though you think they are, they're not. And the ones that are are usually complicated and different, and you've got to have someone's attention, and they have to trust you, and know who you are as a person to really take you seriously. So money is quite a difficult one because if you think you're gonna go and, and email me now and say, Tate, I have an idea. And if you introduce me to the president and he buys it and I'll give you 25%, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna recommend you. So money is, is actually one of the things that probably comes later on. They have, people have to trust you first, they have to know you first, they have to like you first, and then you can add in a monetary motivation. If I've done business with you for four or five years and I know you very well and I know you're competent, I know you don't make mistakes, you don't fuck up, I know I can trust you, I know that if I recommend you, you're not going to embarrass me. And then you say, look, do you know any people who could achieve X, Y, and Z because that would allow me to make X amount of money and you're going to get a percent of it, then you can motivate me with money. So that's the monetary motivation. Next is because I really like you. This can happen. You can be liked by important people. And if you're liked by important people, you're going, to be, you're going to be invited places by important people and you'll be introduced to other important people. Being liked is a skill within itself. I've just basically explained to you how to be liked by important people. It is as simple as that. You validate yourself while allowing them to talk about themselves because important people love themselves because important people have spent a lot of time and energy and effort in building themselves. Unless you're born important, which a few are, morons, in general, important people have put in a lot of work to becoming themselves. And even if they haven't put in a lot of work, they think they have. Look at fucking Pitbull, the worst singer in the world. A loser, basically. 
But if you were to ask him how he got there, how did you become a famous recording artist? Do you think he'd say luck or would he say, oh, I just really worked at it? People believe they work hard. Everyone likes to believe that their success is down to work and nothing to do with luck. So everyone who's important believes they're a hard worker. So with this in mind, they're egotistical. So you have to stroke that ego because they've spent a long time building themselves up. But you have to do it in a way that you don't embarrass yourself. This is nuance. I can't teach you this. This is something that's going to take some skill. Get the body language course. It's going to help. With, it's going to certainly help you. But secondly, it's going to take some skill. I gave you one example earlier. Validate yourself while also asking them questions. Make sure you look like you're paying attention. Try and be a little bit witty, a little bit funny. And just validate yourself and use your own personality. I can't give you my personality. But when I met important people, the conversations were always free-flowing. They always went well. I always validated myself while allowing them to talk and allowing them to basically stroke their own ego because they love themselves. And there's nothing wrong with them loving themselves. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Two examples. We'll use me as an example. I'm not even that important. Anyway, um, if you were to email me and say, Tate, teach me how to punch. I'll give you, and now I'm going to fight and I'll give you a percent. I'm trying to motivate me with money. It's bullshit. If you were to mention me and say, Tate, I've watched your videos and I genuinely believe you're the best striker there's ever been. But then you have to validate yourself. They would say, I've been training for 10 or, 10, 10 or 12 years and I really enjoy it, but there's some things you do that I can't quite do. I was wondering if I could ask you a few questions. That, one, validates you, two, strokes my ego, and you're far more likely to get a reply than if you just emailed me, teach me how to punch, or teach me how to punch for money. Because it's making me like you. This is an important thing. And thirdly is status. If in certain situations, especially if you're a cool enough dude, as I am, People who may have high level connections will feel more comfortable or feel like it's going to raise their status if they introduce you to their connections. And this is going to happen as you elevate. This is not going to happen at the bottom, but as you elevate, this is going to happen. So with me, for example, now, because I'm, I've got some money, because I've got some nice cars, because I'm always with hot girls, there's people who think, ah, this guy's in town and I'm going to go meet him at the club. You know, what? I'm going to bring Tate because if I bring Tate, I roll up in a Lambo and there's going to be 10 chicks with us. So he's using me for to, to raise his status than just going on his own. And that's fine because I'm using him to meet the dude. So if you become start becoming important yourself, you're going to have people who use you to raise their status. And that happens. So those are the three motivators. Status, money, and because people like you. Now you're only going to be able to pull off any of these three. Either status, people liking you, or even money. If you have genuine relationships with people, the idea of walking through a business conference with your business card, hi, yeah, hi, here's my card. I do, I do accounting. I'm an accountant. I'm the best accountant. I'm a really good accountant. I, I guarantee I'll save you money. Yeah, here's an accountant. Hi, I'm a really good accountant. Yeah, you might get some, it's basically cold calling. You might get some calls. I'm not saying it's a completely terrible idea. It's better than doing nothing. But that's not nearly as effective as building a genuine relationship with somebody. You already know this. You know that if you were to go around that conference, take a little bit more time with each individual person, make them like you, make them remember you, that's the key to it. And once you have that connection, once you have that connection, then you have to nurture it. Look at email marketing. Email marketing does this perfectly. You sign up to an email list, they try and sell you something, you ignore it. Another email, to try and sell you something, you ignore it. If they keep trying to sell you things every day, you unsubscribe. If they tell you things of value, a long email, a story, something that made you laugh, something that's funny, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, going on and on and on, and then eventually try and sell you something again, you might buy it. That's nurturing a relationship, and it's exactly the same with networking. So if I, I have some very important friends, and I'll message them now and again. These are not, I say friends, that's the wrong word. I know some important people, and I may not speak to them for two or three months at a time. But I will consciously, I have a list of people I know who are important, a list of people I know who are high value, and I'll consciously contact them with things I believe might be relevant. So let's, I'll give you, I'm not gonna, like we said earlier in the course, most people don't give away everyone they know. I've only told you about the people I have pictures with. There's a whole bunch of other people I know who I'm not gonna tell you about. But let me give you an example. Let's say I know somebody who's a multimillionaire in England and they do business in Europe. So I will literally each month go through my list of people who I know are high value and I want to stay in touch with and I'll see that person and I'll, I'll Google up something about Brexit exports and I'll email them the link and say, hey, you might find this interesting. Don't know if this affects you. 
Uh, I'll be back in, in the country in a few weeks, but we should catch up then. So I provided value. It's not just me trying to get something from him, not just, hey, can we have a coffee? I provided him some value. I've sent him a link. He's probably already seen the link. He probably doesn't care about the link, but it's the gesture. Oh, it's sort of a break. Maybe that, maybe that does affect him. Or even if it doesn't affect him at all, he'll reply, ah, no, we've got all that handled actually. Thanks. Yeah, Andrew, it'd be good to see you. That's a perfect example of how I'm adding value. It's not just a matter of, hey, can I talk to you? Hey, can I talk to you? Hey, can I talk to you? No one wants that because if you keep doing that, hey, can I talk to you? You're not adding any value at any point. You become annoying. Important people are busy. So you have to add some value in your correspondence with them. They're, ex they're extremely busy people. So that little, that's a little example of what you'll do. So I guarantee you sitting here right now, if I were to tell you to make a list of the five richest people you know, you probably know five people who are quite well off. You probably know a few millionaires. But how often do you interact with them? And when you interact with them, do you provide them any value in your interactions? Because if you start to do that, they're going to start to like you more. And they're certainly going to start to trust you more. And it's going to display competence. And let's say, let's take a completely random example. Let's say you know a baker who has six or seven bakery shops. And he had, he's, he's making some good money. It's six or seven bakery shops, whatever. And you send him an article on the, the cake that won the cake of the year. There's all this shit off the top of my head. Say, hey man, you think you could, hey, I just saw this. Do you think you could even bake something like this? Just got one cake of the year. It was really good promotion for them. Maybe you should da, 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 do something like this, da, 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 and just send it to them straight away. When they reply to you, oh yeah. And they're going to sit there and think, oh, this dude's thinking about producing business for me. This guy's thinking about raising my profile. He's asking questions. He's doing things. He's giving me some value. He's giving me some ideas. So then let's say that bakery company decides it wants to up its marketing. You're going to cross their mind. Oh, well, that dude, he emailed me about replicating cake of the year or trying to enter cake of the year. That guy, yeah, we want a marketing strategy. And he's been emailing me on and off every couple of months, not annoying me every couple of months for, for like six, seven months now. He had a few good ideas. Let's bring him in for a meeting. Bam. So you've gone from knowing a baker to now going and sitting in a meeting with a baker. And that baker is looking to make more money. And you can sit there and go, I can guarantee you I'll double your money. I guarantee you I'll double your money. As long as I get X amount of money or I have, or I get, I get a company car or I get this percent, whatever, whatever, I'm guaranteeing you I will double your money. That's how networking is done. It's not about knowing the baker. It's about building a relationship with that baker of value so that they trust you and that they like you and that you prove yourself competent. This is the same with everything. Most people go through life never proving themselves competent at anything. And I mean this. When I meet people, I'm never late. I'm early. Of course, you have to be early. I make sure I pay, like I've said before, I make sure I pay for the bill. I make sure I don't look tired. I make sure I never complain about my problems. Hey, Tate, how are you? Yeah, I'm really good. Oh, I'm fine. Yeah, the traffic was a mess. Dude doesn't give a fuck. Guy doesn't care. Oh, I'm tired. I was out last night. Yeah, I'm really good. Because people want positivity in their lives. If you're really good, they want to be really good. Why are you really good? Maybe they want to know more about you. This person is really good. Well, I want to be really good. What they say good, what they say good for. You have, to, you have to display competence and you have to display the attributes that people want to connect with. And these are always positive attributes. You know what they are. Not just about being rich, it's about being a positive person, living a happy life. These are things that have to appear effortless. When you go and you sit down at a table and you're happy and you're smiling, and you're positive, and you have this aura of competence about you. You're going to have people who want to do business with you. And the Baker example is a perfect example because I guarantee you all know people right now. Let's say you work a normal job. You work a normal job. Let's say you're a fucking truck driver. I, you know your boss. You know the boss of the trucking company. There's nothing. He, he's, he's worth shitloads of money. What's stopping you Googling up a whole bunch of stuff about trucking or Googling, Googling up the biggest trucking companies in the world, how they advertise or Googling what they do and just emailing him saying, hey, he was reading this last night, you might find this interesting. And building a closer relationship with your boss or the richest person you know. Nothing's stopping you doing that. You need to build value, they need to believe you're competent and need to learn to trust you. So action list, make a list of the most important people or most rich people you know. Start finding a way to provide them value without annoying them. Get some money together so that you can be at the right place at the right time. That's the beginning. Next, a lot of people are only interested in networking up. 
Whereas you can do a lot of networking down. There's a whole bunch of people out there looking for a chance. And if you network that way correctly, you can also do very, very well. I've said this loads of times. People say to me, how do I get rich? And I say, find someone who will pay you $10 to do a job and find someone who will do it for $9. Because that way, you de-link your time to your money. Time is finite. You only have a certain amount of hours in the day. Money is, is infinite, effect, effectively. So if you find a way to make money without it requiring your time, then you can scale it infinitely. There's no reason why you can't scale it infinitely. So if you know a whole bunch of people who are looking for money or looking for a job or looking for a break, what you have to do is you have to vet them, make sure they're competent. And that's what I mean by networking down. So everything I've just told you about networking up, you have to reverse and do it the other way around. So you may have a younger brother. You may have some kids in college. You may know this guy. You may know a dude who works in fucking... I was about to say Blockbusters. Blockbusters has been open for years. Blockbusters. He's the only guy who still works at Blockbusters, standing there on his own. Works at Blockbusters, and he wants a chance. If someone ever goes to you, and let's say you're driving a half nice car or something, they say, oh, they know you make money online. Oh, how do you make money online? Say, oh, yeah, well, you know, I've got a few things. I've got this business going. Maybe we could work together sometime. But And then you have to, you have to get them to validate themselves. You have to say, yeah, maybe we can make work together sometime. Have you heard about this? Have you heard about uh, this course? Or have you heard about this kind of marketing? Or have you, have you looked into drop shipping? Yeah, send me an email about it. And see how, how much they apply themselves. And what you're gonna find out is, maybe nine out of 10 are time wasters, but you're gonna have the one guy who really wants it. And now you have someone who's prepared to basically work for free in many cases. Work for free in many cases just to have a chance at life. And that's the kind of thing that can be valuable. Networking up is fantastic, but networking down is just as good. I had a, a, I knew a guy who said, you need friends in high places and you need friends in low places. And he was absolutely correct. We could go through, in his town, we go through any McDonald's drive through it was free. Go to any liquor store, the vodka was free. He knew everyone at the low places and he knew the mayor of the town. So having people in low places is just as important as high places. So you're sitting here trying to make a list of all the people you know who are important, you now have an action list. You have to provide those guys value. Fine. But you also have a whole bunch of people looking for a chance. And if you're higher value than them, you're the value. Now you're the prize. you got to find a way to motivate them to work for you. And this is one of the biggest keys to networking. Because if you do this effectively, then you're going to be more and more. You're, you're going to push yourself higher up the ladder. You can find a whole bunch of college students. Let's say you have, I'll give you an example. You can go on Fiverr right now. You could, you could invent a graphic design company. I own a graphic design company. You can make a website. You can lie on the website and say you turn over millions of dollars. You can go to a graphic design college or know some kids who do graphic design. You can go to them and say you're going to give them all interviews they've designed three logos. You can go on Fiverr and say you design logos for 50 bucks each. And when people pay you 50 bucks, you'll get them to do it for free and you keep the money. That's just a very basic idea, but it's a very basic example of how you can network lower by just feigning when I say feigning competence, it's not even feigning competence. You're competent enough to make a website. You're competent enough to get the jobs on Fiverr. So by just being competent and, and just coming across as a more high value, higher value person, you can network down and get people lower than you to do work for you. And that's another thing that a lot of people don't do. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Because if the people below you prove themselves to be especially competent and prove themselves to do a very good job, then you're going to elevate them. If you have one guy who does fantastic logos, he does them in 20 minutes, he gets them straight across to you, and he's ready to work like a dog, well, then you're going to have a real company, aren't you? Because you're going to hire him. Say, so, okay, you're the guy. I'm going to use you all the time. I'm going to put more ads on Fiverr and get more jobs. You're going to do them all. I'll give you X amount of money per logo. I'll keep the rest. Bang, done. So networking down is a fantastic thing. It doesn't make you a bad person because if you find someone of competence, you're going to elevate them. And that, and that elevates you. You now own a graphic design company. You didn't own shit. Now you own a graphic design company. Now, you can be emailing all the five important people I told you on your list, the five important ones, and you can be saying, hey, uh, just looked at your logo. Yeah, it's really good, but I've got, I've got this graphic design company and I just had my guys have a look. Here's a few proofs. I don't know if you'd be interested. Something to take to think about. Let's catch up soon. Bang. Send a couple of free logos to an important person. Let them sit there and go, hmm, that's interesting. So you've networked down and now you're providing value to people higher than you. The whole thing about networking is providing value. Walking around in a suit and handing out your business card and saying your name isn't providing value to anybody. You need to provide value. And if you can't do that, you need to at least promise to provide value. And if you promise to provide value, it has to be a genuine, genuine promise. 
because the world's full of promises nowadays and the world's full of lies. So if I was an accountant and I was doing a networking event, everyone I introduced myself to, I would give them some ridiculous guarantee. I'd say, oh, hi, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm the accountant that, get, that guarantees a lower tax bill. Guarantees, yeah, I guarantee a lower tax bill. If you, it, it, there's no, I've never had a single client who didn't lower their taxes with me, ever. And it would be so brash and sort of the top that sit there and go, really? Say, really? Doesn't matter what company you're in, doesn't matter who you use, doesn't matter if you use PwC or Deloitte or the best accounts in the world, I guarantee you with 1000% certainty, any of my clients, I lower their tax bill. Now, that person will probably talk to you because you've given, you've, you haven't provided value, but you've assured them, you've promised insane value. Now you have the predicament, now you have to fulfill it. But a verbal contract isn't a contract. If, if, if this person emails you and goes, okay, lower my tax bill, and you look through his stuff and you work out you can't, you say, oh, okay, um, uh, we're really busy at the moment, we'll be back in touch in a couple of weeks, I'm sure we can work together, and you just never email him again, he'll forget. He ain't, gonna go, he ain't gonna go to court and say, I met this guy in a pub, this guy in a bar who promised to lower my tax bill, and he didn't email me back and sue you. He's not gonna take, what, what's, what's gonna happen? Nothing. But at least you had the chance. Maybe you can lower his tax bill. Now you've got yourself a client. So you need to be providing value, but if you're gonna promise value, which is what a lot of people try and do, but people do it like pussies. People walk around, oh, hi, yeah, hi, I'm an accountant. Yeah, I'm a certified accountant. Yeah, I've got some big clients, and yeah, I'm sure we could take a look. There might be something we can do. What does that mean? I've already got an accountant. You're coming up to me saying you could take a look. There might be something we could do. That sounds like it's gonna take time. I have to get all my records, all my files, send them across to you. Maybe we can do something. I've already got an accountant who I've been with for five years who does a perfectly fine job. And now you wanna fuck around me. I'm not gonna bother. If you were to come up to me and said, I guarantee you, Andrew, you're paying too much tax. You're getting ripped off. With me, I guarantee you I'll lower it by minimum 10%, minimum. Now, I'm gonna to talk to you. That's how networking's done. I'm certainly gonna to talk to you. Now, if I send you all my files and you look through it all and you realize that my accountant's actually fantastic and you can't lower my tax bill at all, then you just blag it off. Blag is an English word for you Americans. Blag means just like, just blag it off. Okay, yeah, fantastic, having a look here. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be back in touch in a few weeks. If, and you know what's gonna happen because I'm a busy guy and I've already got an accountant and I've probably forgot about it in a few weeks. I'm not even gonna chase you. And if I do chase you, hey, so there's anything we can do? Yeah, but we'll have to do it at the beginning of the next financial year. I'll be in touch a couple of weeks in advance. Take care. Just, just blag it off, delay it. I'll forget, you'll move on. No one's going to court, nothing bad happened. At least you had a chance to get my business. You had a chance to look through my accounts. If you would have come up to me and said, oh, hi, yeah, maybe we can do something. I'm, a, I'm an accredited accountant. You wouldn't have even got that far. So you've got to either provide value or promise value. And this is the mistake that people make with networking. You have to promise value. I said to Idris, with me, you'll win. He goes, oh, really? I said, I said no, no, with me, you're guaranteed to win. So if you get other people, I don't know, but with me, you're absolutely guaranteed to win. Yeah, there's a lot of good fighters out there, but I know how it was as an amateur. I know the mistakes you're gonna be making. I know the mistakes he's gonna make. With me, Idris, with me, you are guaranteed to win. And he did win. <laughs> I pulled it off. But if I didn't say that, I wouldn't have got the chance. Now imagine he lost. What's he gonna do? We're gonna sue me. You got knocked out, bro. You can't sue me. It's not my fault. You should have blocked. I told you to block that punch. You didn't listen. I gave you the right instructions. You didn't enact them correctly. That's not my fault. But I networked myself to the top with guarantees. So you either need to show value, which is a guarantee because it's something you've already done, or you need to promise insane value. And this is the mistake people make when networking. When someone comes to me, and I, cause I get this all the time, I get emails all the time from people saying, I'm gonna make you more money, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that, blah, 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 pay me up front. I don't wanna hear that shit. I'm gonna say, no, okay, do it then. If you come to me and say, Tate, I'm gonna sell 10 of your courses. Okay, I'm gonna sell 10 of your courses. If I sell 10 of your courses, can we Skype and talk business? Yeah, all right. And then just say, okay, every, every, one, every one of my courses I sell, the reference is gonna be this and I get 10 course sales, and in the box it says this person's name. Then I'm gonna be like, all right, let's Skype. What the fuck does this dude know? That's providing value. If you're gonna promise me you're gonna sell shitloads of my courses, you better come at me with some, some convincing shit. Come at me and go, well, maybe we could try, maybe this could, have you thought of, not interested, because I've thought of it all. 
yeah, I could try, blah, blah. No, you have to come to me with POW. Now, I know all of you watching this are probably going to try that exact thing. That's a bad idea because I'm a hard guy to sell to. But in, to other people, that's what people want, especially important people who are running businesses and making money. You need to either show them you can make the money or you need to promise them insanely you can make the money. But here's what's going to happen. The smart people, you'll get the odd idiot who will agree and pay you up front. Most smart people will want to see some work first. Promise the value and then they'll say, okay, now show me the value. And then I'll give you what you want. That's what's going to happen. And this is where the competence comes in. But isn't it better to be talking to millionaires and then replying to your emails and, and them going, okay, we're going to give you a chance. And then you might be able to pull off a miracle. Isn't that better than them never emailing you at all? This is the key to networking. I promised Idra, he, Idris he'd never lose. And he didn't lose. It worked out for me. It could have not worked out for me. But isn't it better that I promised him and took the chance than never took the chance at all? So the bakery example. You want to start emailing that baker and saying, you could sell double the cakes. I guarantee you I can sell double your cakes. And he'll go, if he's smart, he'll go, okay, do it then. And then you're going to sit there and go, fuck, how do I sell double the cakes? But at least you have a chance. Now you have a chance. Imagine you pull off double cakes for fucking two days. Imagine you get some hot chick to stand outside with a tray. She's your girlfriend, so she's free with a cake. And you've given her a little bit of a script and she convinces people that these, are the, these cakes are made with some special flour, some bullshit, and doubles to cake sales. When you go back in there now and say, okay, that's just the beginning of what I can do. I can triple this. I can quadruple that. I want X amount of money. Now you're going to be having serious conversations. And that's what networking is. Show value or absolutely promise value. Stroke people's egos and have enough cash to be in the right place at the right time. The guy who owns that bakery, he might own bakeries all over the world. He might say, okay, yeah, I'm interested in talking to you. Come to our head office in Singapore. Now what are you going to do? Oh, sorry, I can't afford the ticket. Look a dick. If you're so good at selling things and doubling people's turnovers, you've got to be able to afford the ticket. You have to. So money is absolutely an element. But the key to networking is you have to come across as super high value. Another great thing about this is, this is also how you get referrals. If you start doing good jobs for people, and you do a good job, and you prove yourself trustworthy, or even if you're at least promising to do a good job, and people see this, then they're going to be the ones who refer you, because it raises their status. So I'm the bakery owner. I own the bakery. You've come to me and promised to double my sales. You've managed to pull it off. I'm out with my other friend who owns a fucking car wash, and we're sitting there having beers. And I'm talking about this, this person. And I, now I get to say, you know what? I could double your turnover your car washes. And the guy goes, can you? He goes, yeah, I know a guy. And this guy can double your car wash turnover. Now I get to look cool for recommending you. So remember where I was talking earlier about motivators. Now I am motivated to recommend you because it raises my status with the car wash guy. Even if he's, if he's a good friend... I won't ask him for money. If he's not a good friend, I might say, I'll, I'll raise it and give me this amount. If I'm, a, if I'm a particularly savvy motherfucker, I'll say, I want to double your car wash turnover. You give me 20%. I'll send in a guy who works for me, who's really good. You could, they could do it for money. But in general, people don't even work that way. People just, just like to feel important, especially important people. The head of the bakery is going to sit there and say to the car wash guy, you know what? You've got some good car washes. You're washing some cars, but you could be making a lot more money. I know a guy who would help you make a lot more money. Yeah, he works for me. I, I found him. I trained him. He'll talk. He'll lie. But he's really good. And you know what? I'm thinking maybe you should talk to him. Because now the car wash guy thinks the bakery guy is a hero. Oh, wow. Okay. So the bakery guy's motivation for recommending you is raising his status. And this is the motivator for most people. This is how networking is done. You do a fantastic job for one person. They want to, sh to share your business. They want to tell others. If someone came along to me and did a fantastic job, I want to tell other people. I do this all the time. The people who wrapped my Lamborghini, for example, they did a fucking amazing job. Cheap, quick, beautiful, rainbow wrap, psychedelic, looks amazing. I'm happy to tell everyone, where'd you get that done? Oh, I got it done here, they're really good. That's, that's, the, that's, that's human nature. So you either have to be providing insane value or promising insane value. A lot of the people you network with especially at a lower level, they're gonna want things from you. And because mutual relationships, we all understand what mutual relationships are and how they work. People are gonna want things from you. So I know that 99% of the emails I get are people who want things from me. 
Nobody's trying to give me nothing. No one's emailing me going, hey, Tate, want a Ferrari? Everyone's like, oh, hi. Do you want to invest in? They want my money. Do you have the time to help me with? They want my knowledge, expertise, or connections. They want me to fucking network for them. I got an email today from some dude. Hey, uh, my, my girlfriend is struggling to get Schengen visa. And I know you can do these kind of things. Okay, cool. If you would have said, hi, Tate, good to see you. I know you're really well connected. I'm having a very particular problem and I'm thinking maybe you can help with it. In return, I think maybe we could make some money together. Da, 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 da. Make it at least more interesting. Not just, hey, get my girlfriend a Schengen visa. I don't even know you. It's crazy. Anyway, can I get his girlfriend a Schengen visa? Yeah, but am I motivated to? No. But 99% of the time, people want things from you. And that's fine. So what you have to do is turn those wants into something mutual. So if someone comes to you and says, hey, uh, can I use your email list? I want to promote my product. That'll happen a lot. The correct reply is, my email list you can't use, but when you build your own, I'll teach you how to monetize yours correctly. We'll work together on it. He'll go, oh, okay, thanks. He'll be happy with that reply. So what's happened? What's he gained from you? Nothing. What have you gained from him? A percent of his sales. Done. He'll come back to you and go, okay, I've got my email list. Say, okay, here's how we're going to do it. I'll send the emails, blah, 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 blah. X amount percent goes to me. This amount will go to you. And we're going to sell a whole bunch of products. Simple. When people come to you and they want something from you, that's a fantastic chance to change it around, to put it on its head and allow you to take something from them. There's another key element from networking. And also, if you're particularly savvy, especially with important people, is this is how smart, important people think. So you can, be, you can be aware it's happening, but pretend you don't know. So it's like one of the, one of the laws of power, 48 laws of power is never outshine the master, it's true. So if you go meet with a really important person you go, oh, you know what, I'm gonna give you a chance. If you double my sales for a week, I'm gonna give you a chance. You'd be like, oh yeah, okay, fantastic. And you can sit there and pretend you don't realize this dude is about to make a bunch of money off you. Okay, great. You don't wanna be too smart. If you're smarter than the dude, it's gonna piss him off. I've had this a few times myself. I've had people come to me and they say this, and I say, well, let's do it this way. They go, no, this, 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 and this. I'm like, bro, you're the one approaching me. I've got more money than you. You're trying to do business. Don't come at me and tell me how things are. You have to be super careful with that because people's egos, an ego is more than enough to stop someone doing business with you. They'd rather lose money than, than damage your ego. People are in jail over their ego. Jail's full of egos. You insult someone, they shoot you in the head. That's how important a man's ego is to it. So you want to come along and start insulting people and go, no, this, or no, you're going to be making lots of money off of me then. What am I going to get? That's not, that's not how you network. You've got to play the fool sometimes. Yeah, great. That's a really good idea. I'm happy to do that for you. Yeah, great. So be careful. So very often people who come to you, they want something from you. If they're lower down, you have to change that to your favor. Consciously think about how to do that. If they're higher up, they're going to try and get, when you're, when you're offering something, they're going to try and exploit you to a degree. And that's fine because you have to prove competence. Being exploited to a comfortable degree to prove confident, competence and make yourself likable is once again fine. Be very aware of that dynamic. Everyone is in everything for themselves. Every relationship is for themselves. You're with your girlfriend for yourself. Your love for her is nothing to do with her. It's for yourself. It's for your own sexual needs. So you're not, you're not lonely. It's completely selfish. You're with her for selfish reasons. She's with you for selfish reasons. And together you're both selfish and you both mutually benefit. The reason I talk to the bus driver is because he'll drive me and I give money to the bus, which keeps the company running that pays his wages. Mutual benefit. That's how interactions work around the world. There's no such thing as selflessness. It doesn't exist. So you have to completely understand this and understand the mutual benefits. Nobody's going to do anything with you if there's not a benefit for them. So at the beginning, if someone's really high value, sure, let them exploit you to a degree. Make sure the benefit is in their court. But once you've proved competence, that can change quickly. Once you've proved yourself to be competent, then they're going to want you. Then things change. If you're the dude who doubled sales, they're going to want you around. Absolutely they're going to. I prefer to stay in touch with my important people via email. I don't really like to use LinkedIn because LinkedIn is a professional platform and that means that relationships are professional. That's fine for your professional relationships, but for your genuine networking referrals, it's all about status and whether they like you or not. The money one, money, maybe LinkedIn. 
But in general, if you only speak to someone through LinkedIn, are they really going to be like, this guy's great? They're going to be like, oh, there's a guy on my LinkedIn, maybe. So it's, it's, very, it's very clinical. It's kind of like Tinder, you know, like the girl, you may want to bang her, but do you like her? You don't, you don't know her. So it's very clinical. So I don't even have a LinkedIn page. I don't even have one. I don't really use it for networking. And also, if someone's super important, are they really on LinkedIn? Like, I mean, you're going to meet some mid-level dudes on LinkedIn, but if, if there's a multi-millionaire who has his own company, he has a coconut business in Greece, and he has all these boats, he's making millions and millions, he's fucking all these models, he has private jets, is he really going to go, oh, let me just, let me just quickly log into LinkedIn, and oh, I got an email from Mr. Random. Yeah, hi. That ain't going to happen. I mean, that's my experience with LinkedIn. But yeah, that's fine. I use email. Try and get people's email addresses. Try and have an interesting business card like mine. Don't copy it. And like I said, provide value every couple of months. Don't flood them. Don't annoy them. People are busy. Next is protecting yourself from networking. So what a lot of you are going to be thinking after watching this is, well, how do I make sure I don't get exploited? How do I know that the baker is not going to see my ideas I did to, to double sales, take the ideas, and tell me to fuck off? And that is a genuine, very real risk. And to be honest with you, that risk is very hard to negate. You negate that primarily through making the dude like you. And this is my completely honest experience because I've been screwed this way exactly the same. If I've done work for someone and it's been work and I've done a really good job and at the end of it I said, look, I want some money, X, Y, Z, and they don't particularly like me as a person, they are far more likely to disappear than if they go, you know what, this guy's all right. And I know this sounds like shit advice, but it's the absolute truth. This is why I do business without contracts. Because if you need a contract with someone to try and stop them screwing you, they're gonna screw you. If you need a piece of paper and a court to try and stop someone from screwing you over, they're gonna do it eventually anyway. And you're gonna waste a whole bunch of time in court with lawyers, and even if you win the case, they're gonna claim bankruptcy. My chest connection. Claim bankruptcy and it's all over. The way it works is you have to make people like you. You have friendships with people, and people don't wanna fuck over their friends because everyone has a conscience. There's very few people out there who are truly sociopathic enough that they're going to screw over somebody who they like for a few, few, for a few dollars. I wouldn't do that. People who I know who could easily do that would never do that to me. Because if you like people, there's a, there's a few people on the planet you like and there's a whole bunch of people you don't like. So you don't want to really fuck up the relationships with the people you do like for money. Especially if you're making good money. It's very rare. So let's say the bakery example. If you were to do that for five people, one person's gonna screw you over. But you just have to eat that loss. There's no other way to do it. But the other four will probably give you some kind of uh, recuperation for your efforts. And on top of that, especially if you have more to show. So the bakery example is perfect because you can say, okay, I doubled your cake sales, but I've shown you nothing yet. I know X, I know this, I know that. Even if you don't know it, just say. You've seen a taste of what I can do. Well, now they definitely want to do business with you because they've seen your efforts and you've validated yourself and you're saying you know a whole bunch more, but they're going to continue to work with you. So if you're worried about safeguarding yourself, if you're worried about being exploited, I wouldn't worry about that. Worry about getting the opportunities. More opportunities you have, the better. It may take three or four opportunities for one to pay off, but one will eventually pay off. It's better to have tried at something and had an opportunity and fuck it up or tried at something, had an opportunity, did a fantastic job and then that person screw you over, then never had the opportunity at all. That's my genuine view. Because I've been screwed over, I've been robbed for money, I've been through all that shit that's happened to everyone else. But it never deterred me from making relationships and trying to do, get to high value places and do high value work for high ticket numbers because sometimes they pay off. So you can't be too worried about it. And this is what happens when I was saying earlier about uh, the people who are arrogant and insults people's e egos. I've had people email me going, Tate, your email strategy is shit. And they're right. I agree. My email strategy probably is a bit shit. It's disconjointed. You need to do this, 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 and this, and this. If you do this, you'll sell this much more. I say, okay, let's do it. $10,000 a month. I say, I'm not going to pay you $10,000 a month. You haven't even done it yet. Yeah, but how do I know I'm not going to implement it and you're going to rob me? Well, you don't know that. But it would have been better for them to have implemented it, start making me a whole bunch of money. And then there's two things that can happen. I'm either going to run off with the ideas and, and, and skank them and they're not going to get any money 
and then my reputation will be soured and they're going to go all over Twitter and all over everywhere and say I'm a bad person. Or I'm going to say, you know what, I'm making so much money from this person now and they want this, they, I'm making 20 a month that I wasn't making before, they want 10, okay, cool. There's two choices. Now, if you obviously you want them to pay. Most people are protective of their reputations. Most people aren't that sociopathic. And second, thirdly, if I actually kind of liked that guy, I wouldn't have done it. So let me give an example. Let's say he agreed to do the work first. Let's say he started doing the work. I never really heard from him. He just did the work and I sold products. And the end he goes, okay, where's my money? That's fine. If he did the work and he was, he sent me an email, hey man, I'm up really late, but I've got this idea and this idea. Also, after this one week trial, we can do this and this. Uh, I'm really excited about our partnership. Bang, email me that or something else or something else and something else to make me make himself more humanized. Then when it comes to paying, I'm going to be like, okay, well, he's told me there's more ideas. He was up working really late that night. I'm not going to fuck this dude over. I'm not that guy. So that's, that's a key element to it. And that's the same with all networking is being likable, likability. And I can't teach your personalities. I can't teach you how to be likable. But coming across as human and making it clear how much, you work, much work you're doing for someone, there's nothing wrong with that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that if you do it in a positive light. Don't complain. Don't be like, oh, I have to work so hard. Because uh, then they're going to be like, well, fucking well, don't then. But if you do it in a very positive light, look, I really believe we can do X, Y, Z. We're going to take over the world, blah, blah, blah. You're going to do fantastic. One of my jo Last time I had a job was about seven years ago. And after, I can tell you the story, I started, I went to a meeting to sell a website. Our market rate was 1,500 pounds for the website. I tried to sell it for three grand. And I did that because I'm a risk taker. And everyone told me, all the salesmen in the company said, oh, that's too much, he's not gonna buy it. And I said, well, I believe that we can sell our websites for more. And they said, okay, whatever. And the guy bought it. Within a week, I was giving a presentation to the other salesmen because the fucking managing director couldn't believe I'd, I'd sold this for double. I sold it for double, and after I sold it, I sent an email to the managing director saying, hey, I know I'm new, I know you don't know me. I've just pulled off this sale for double. I want to sell all the products for double. Is that okay? Was if he's going to say fucking no? I just pulled off. Or I just pulled it off. So he's going to say that. He's going to say, yeah, that's fine. Why do you believe that? And, I'm, and I gave my reasons. I said, there's only so many people in the world who want a website. If they don't need a website, they're not going to buy one. If they do need one and they're susceptible, we need to get as much money as possible from them. That's how we're going to increase the turnover of this business. And I believe that if we do a few things to add some value, small things, Another meeting halfway through the website being made, uh, a few more updates, fancier PDF updates, small things that I believe we can really increase our value and that means we really increase our prices, even though we're providing the same product. And I sent this back and forth to the managing director one Monday night and on Wednesday I was giving a presentation to all the top, all the salesmen who've been there for years and everyone hated me, but tough. I was the G. Now the best thing about this story is at the same time I was working this business, I had my own business selling websites. <laughs> So I was, stealing, I was stealing customers from this company and doing it myself with my friend. But what great was, after I did this and I sold two or three more at double the price, I had so much leniency in that business that even when for like one month or one month and a half at the end when I sold nothing because I was planning to leave, no one questioned me because I was the genius. I was the guru. I pulled it off and I just sold all the business things myself, kept on. But that's an example. But that's a short story. If you want people to like you, no, sorry, that's a short story. If you want to make sure you don't get ripped off, make sure people like you. Trying to get contracts involved, trying to get legality involved, all that shit is not the way to go. Make people like you, make people respect the work you do for them, and be a nice person, and no one's really out to screw you. Someone might screw you. I'm not saying it's not going to happen. I'm saying that it's still better to take those chances than to not take the chances at all. Now, all of you watching this, know people right now who you could contact and make money with. I don't say make money from, I make money with. You make them more money, you get a percentage. All of you know people, but you're just sitting there going, well, how do I do it? How do I approach it? Because if I email this person or I say to this person, I want to make more money, they might think I'm an idiot. Well, maybe, but what are you worried about? What's the worst I can say is no, who cares? Promise them something insane and then find a way to deliver. Finding a way to deliver is the key. I'm going to finish this first video off because we've got two more videos coming for this course. But my business card, which I think a lot of you have seen, if not, I'll get it here. My business card is a perfect example of this. And people always laugh when they see my business card because they think it's a joke. 
but a zero percent a joke. Maybe we should we'll put a picture in what my card is. It's my card, and it says on the back, I specialize in the following. Wars fought, assassinations plotted, uprisings quelled, whiskey merchant, helicopter hire, all this stuff. And people laugh and go, oh, you don't do those things. Wrong. I do do those things. Because I'm a promiser. I will promise you these things. And if I believe that it's worth my while, I will pull it off. If, if NASA come to me and say, put a probe on the moon, I ain't got a fucking clue how to put a probe on the moon. But if I believe if I do that, I'm going to get X amount of dollars, 10 billion. Or if I believe it's worth my while, or I believe it's going to save my life, or it's going to give me superpowers, whatever. If I'm motivated to do it, I will do it. I don't give a shit what I have to do. I don't care if I have to go and learn how to do it myself. I don't care if I have to hire someone else to do it. I don't care if I have to go to the Chinese and defect and, and, and get them to do it. I don't know what I'll do, but I will get it done. And that is the key to networking in most spheres. Promising the impossible, finding a way to pull it off when you have the opportunity, and doing so in a way that makes you come across likable, come across as someone people want to work with, building up competence and value, and then that's going to spread, and it's going to spread quickly. Another example, I'll tell you the best example of where this has happened for me personally is with girls. This has happened for me. I could talk about all the high net, all of high value people, I could, da, 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 but the thing that illustrates my point the best is with girls. Whenever I'm with people and they see me go up to a girl, I get a girl, or I turn up with hot girls, or there's always hot girls around me, people think, I want to bring this people, I want to introduce this person to other people because he's the guy, he's the one who raises the status, he's the guy who can do this, he's the guy, and that's networking all over, just purely because I've displayed competence, or I've promised things. If people have seen me turn up with two super hot girls, and then I turn up again on my own, next time I say, oh yeah, I could get us unlimited chicks, yeah, we can go get chicks, any club in this town will go get girls. Any. They're like, wow, this guy, I've, I've shown value and I'm promising value. If you do one of those two things, they want to invite you. So the next time those two dudes go out, especially if those dudes are millionaires and they're going to a club or they're going to Miami or a different town, they're going to start inviting me. I've had that happen. I've had guys go to me, oh, we're going to this, we're going to Miami. You want to come? Oh, I'm a bit busy. Oh, we'll pay your flight, bro. Because they're sitting there thinking, this dude gets pussy. I have something they want. I can provide, I've shown value and I've shown competence or I've promised value or competence and before you know it, you're getting invites. Before you know it, you're networking. Before you know it, people want to introduce you to other people. And that's all networking is, whether it's money, whether it's girls, whether it's anything else. Come across as competent, either get people richer, make people like you, or raise their status for them introducing you and you're going to find yourself with a lot of friends very quickly. And then you need to be selective about who's worth your time and who isn't. Like I said, there's nothing wrong with networking down. But that person you're networking down with has to be motivated. There's a whole bunch of time wasters, especially people at the bottom. People at the bottom, most of them are there because they're lazy. If people were motivated, they wouldn't be at the bottom. But there are a few gems you can find. But that's the, those are the basic elements to networking. Watch this video over and over again. We've got two more videos coming. Feel free to email me with any questions. Welcome to God Mode. My name is Tristan Tate. Now, if you bought this course, you already know who I am, I assume. But who am I to be teaching anyone how to get and retain beautiful women? Well, let me tell you something. Everybody who has ever met me, who has ever visited me, certainly in the last five or six years, has commented on how many beautiful girls I have. So before we get into the course material, let me tell you my credentials. I used to run one of Europe's largest webcam studios. I had 75 women employed by me, working, to, working for me, and following every single order I gave them. But right now, I no longer have my webcam studio. I just have a few models who work for me, but I have a few girlfriends. This is one of them. This is the next. You get the picture. Number three, all of these women are loyal to me and exclusive to me. Number four, five, I have six girlfriends. Six. Now, I'm not talking about girls I sleep with sometimes. I'm not talking about girls who will come to see me when I'm drunk or when I'm bored. I'm talking six relationships. Women who love me, women who want families with me, women who are not going to leave me, women who are loyal to me. I'm not even going to waste your time by naming how many side chicks I have. Come and hang out with me for a week or so. I don't know if you're in the war room or not, if I know you personally or not, but if you hang out with me, you will see my life 
is crazy. Now, how do I do it? My, creden my credentials are, are beyond doubt, but there's methodology to my madness. And that's why you bought this course. Let me explain something to you. There's no trick. There's no life hack. There's no being in a position where all the women you meet or come into contact with want to have sex with you. That doesn't exist for any man on the planet besides Brad Pitt and a few others. If you want to be an elite level player, an elite level playboy like me, you have to work at it. This is what I explain to everybody. Why is Floyd Mayweather the best boxer in the world? Why is Roger Federer the best tennis player in the world? Because they train and worked and perfect their skills and that's why they are the best in their field. I am exactly the same. I'm not some guy who women just all want and they chase me and message me on Instagram and want to come over to my house. No, I make a conscious effort every single day. I wake up, I plan, I make my moves like I'm on a chessboard and I keep not only my six relationships going, but I have plenty of time to meet new women. So that brings me into module one in this course. We're going to talk about meeting women and dating. Now guys, what I'm not going to go into in this course is how to dress, how to behave generally. You know the answer to the question. How to dress? I don't know. What's your style? Are you a rugged guy with a lumberjack t-shirt and a big beard? Good, look that way. Are you a black guy with dreadlocks? Good, look that way. I can't tell you how to dress, how to style, style yourself, or how to act and behave. That's all individual to you. So you be yourself and play the game the best way that you can and you know how to. How to behave? Don't be a woman hater. Don't be sour. Don't be bitter. Don't be unpleasant. Don't be rude. These are very basic things and I'm not even going to bother covering these. If you can't get a single girl to talk to you, this is probably the wrong course for you. I'm teaching you how to up your game from a guy with one or two girlfriends to five or six like me and a harem of side chicks. A question I'm asked a lot is how do you meet women? So before we get into the digital side of things, we're going to talk about how to meet women in the real world. Now, the best way to meet women in the real world is not what a lot of people on the internet will tell you. Approaches. Now, the guys who do approaches number their approaches. They count their statistics. Oh, I had sex with 10% of them. I did 100 approaches today. Are you a nerd? Are you a geek? What kind of person are you where you have all day to walk around trying to talk to women on the off chance that one might have sex with you? Approaches my way is completely completely different, you see. I don't march around trying to get women to have sex with me by talking to them. I have built a lifestyle. I have built a life which puts me in contact with beautiful women. I'm around them. I'm in the, I'm in the best clubs. I'm in the best restaurants. I'm in the best bars. I'm in the best spots in the world. I'm flying all over the place. The highest level women in the world are not in your local mall, gentlemen. They're in some bar in Cannes or Monte Carlo. And if you're not there, you're not going to get them. So the key to approaches is to keep your number of approaches very, very low. Aim like a sniper, not a flamethrower. If you see a beautiful girl, you're in a high-end spot, you want to add her to your harem, you want to add her to your collection, even if you're in your local bar. She could be a beautiful barmaid. You make your one approach, you try to get her contact details, and you then work on that lead. Mass approaching every woman who you could talk to is the enemy of an elite playboy like myself because you need the hours of the day. You need your hours in the day to work, to do business, to do other things that are important that add to the lifestyle that attracts beautiful women. You can't afford to waste all your day walking around, walking up to girls, asking for their Facebooks, asking for their Instagrams, asking for their numbers. It's pathetic. You need to make your approaches when it's approaching time. You're out with your friends, you're at a nice restaurant, you see a group of girls, you're out at a nice bar, you see a girl by the bar, she catches your eye. Then you go over and you make your approach. I make no more than two or three approaches a week. If that, and I'm a very social guy, and I get more women than all the people you see on the internet, every single one of them. So meeting women in the real world is very possible and relatively easy. Be confident. I'm not going to teach you how to approach women because every guy has their own methodology. I'll usually walk up and I'll start with a compliment. I'll open with something as cheesy as you're really pretty or you're beautiful because if she says, oh, thank you, then she's interested. If she looks at you funny 
or says I have a boyfriend or says anything negative, and you say, okay, no problem. I just wanted to say you're beautiful. Uh, have a nice day, goodbye. And you leave them. Whereas any kind of positive response to the compliment, you have your foot in the door and you can make your close in. You can get the telephone details, the WhatsApp number, which you then later work on. So speaking of WhatsApp, we're gonna go into the online dating game. Now let me tell you, the world has changed. The world has shifted from many years ago when all Playboys made their approaches person to person. There was no other way of doing it. The internet didn't exist, Instagram didn't exist, and the best dating app that exists right now is Instagram. Match.com, Tinder, this is where the ugly girls hang out. Girls who can't get a boyfriend, they might download Tinder. A hot girl might download Tinder and mess around with it for five minutes, but dating apps are nowhere near as powerful as Instagram. Everyone who's anyone, every attractive girl in the world is on Instagram. And every guy who's an elite level guy, every guy with some clout, some presence, uh, some money, some talent, some skill, something to offer is on Instagram too. Instagram is the most powerful dating app in the world. Now, if you've ever had a girlfriend, what you should do next time you do is get access to her Instagram inbox. I have Instagram inbox um, passwords to all of my girlfriends, all six of them. So I can see the messages they get every single day, 20, or 30 people are messaging them. Hi, babe. Hi, you look good. Now, they don't read the messages. This is the problem, and this is why Instagram is important if you understand Instagram game and you understand how it works. You could be the most handsome guy in the world. You could be a Ferrari driver. You could be in super yachts and all your pictures and private jets. If you have a boring profile picture and 200 people following you, it's not that the girl likes you for the number of followers. It's you are not going to be seen. You're going to send a message to this beautiful girl. She's going to scroll down her messages. Oh, who's this? This guy has 20,000 followers. Let me read this guy's messages. She's going to skip right past you. The importance of building up a nice Instagram page when it comes to game is exceptionally important in today's world. Right now, I'm 40 something thousand followers. I have a verified tick. Now, I'm uglier, I'm sure, than lots of guys who are messaging these models and these girls who I do meet on Instagram. However, when I send a message, it can be something as mundane as hello or a love heart reaction to one of her stories. She's scrolling down her page, guy more handsome than me, guy more handsome than me, billionaire, ugly guy, and then there's me. There's a little blue tick next to my name. It says I have 40 something thousand followers. Oh, who's this guy? She'll then click on my page and look at my page. She doesn't look at anyone else. She'll look at my page and think, oh, this guy decided to send me a message. You know what? I'm gonna message back or I won't message back. But my messages are getting opened. And that is the key to Instagram game. You need to have a powerful profile. You know, if you need to post photos of cars, do it. You need to post photos with other girls, do whatever it takes to build up your likes, to build up your online presence because it's almost as important when meeting women as your real life presence, which we're gonna get into later in this course. So Instagram is the most powerful dating app in the world. I made uh, headlines, national headlines, um, by stealing one of the most famous women in my country, Romania, from her husband. Over a million followers verified on Instagram, this girl. How did I meet her? I sent her an Instagram message. Now she gets thousands of messages every day, but very few from guys of my caliber. Very few from guys with that many followers, a blue check mark. She obviously was curious to see who I am. I made a nationwide scandal by stealing this woman from her husband. So if Instagram, you have to treat it like a job. As I said in the introduction to this, why, are, why is Floyd Mayweather the best boxer in the world? Because he trains. If you wanna be one of the best playboys in the world and operate on my level, you have to think Daily, you have to make a conscious effort to be more attractive, more out there, more in the face of, of, of the women around you. So every day, if you see a cool scene, you see a cool restaurant, you're in a cool place, get someone to take a picture of you. Yeah, it's narcissistic. I hate pictures. I'm not even photogenic. I'm ugly in pictures. But I take these cool pictures and I put them online because I know it's money in the bank. It's going to grow with interest and it's gonna pay off in the long run. So absolutely, you have to apply yourself to your online presence and nothing is more important than Instagram. There is a time and a place for dating apps. Dating apps really do work. I'm filming this on April the 11th, 2020, in the middle of a quarantine, 
which sucks. However, one country is not quarantined. Stockholm, Sweden. The capital of Sweden was open for business, so I decided to head over to Sweden with my brother and have a bit of fun. Play the Playboy game over in Stockholm, see how it goes. Now, if I had showed up in Stockholm, which was a lot quieter than usual, where would I meet the beautiful girls? I wouldn't really know where to hang out. I wouldn't know where to go or what to do. So I set my Tinder location. Yeah, I pay for Tinder. I pay for the premium Tinder. I set my location to Sweden. I don't bother swiping. I pay for those boost things and I have the Tinder goal to see who swipes me first. I run three or four boosts. Then I take my pick. Again, like with Instagram, my Tinder pictures are me next to my supercars, me by the pool, me looking good, having trained hard. I try to get all the attention I can from the social media and my Tinder pictures are my Instagram pictures. I then look at the best girls that have swiped me. I pick one. Her name was Philippa, absolutely beautiful girl. Absolutely beautiful girl. In fact, here's a picture. I'm including a picture of Philippa right now. This is her. Now, Tinder is great for one thing and one thing only. Finding the best places in the city to go. Now, years ago, if you were a playboy and you were to land in a new city, you land in Singapore, it's 1988. What you do is you get in a taxi and you tell the taxi driver, hey, brother, you know, where's the coolest spot in town? Where's the, where's the, where's the hot joint? Where's the, where's the cool restaurants, the cool bars, where the pretty girls hang out? And the taxi driver would give you all the information you needed. Maybe a hotel concierge. Today, taxi drivers don't know shit. They're bitter, they're upset, they, the world has changed. The rich-poor divide is wider than ever. Taxi drivers aren't going to the expensive places. But you know who knows the best places in every city? Beautiful girls. That's what Tinder is for. If you use Tinder trying to get your pee-pee sucked, you're doing it wrong. You need to use Tinder to find the best places to go. Match with a really beautiful girl and say, hey, what's the best place to go in Stockholm on a Friday night? Oh, uh, what was the name of the place now? Can't remember the name, but this girl, Philippa, replies to me. Oh, it's here. I said, okay, we're going. I'm going to take you out. Bring your friends, because I was with my friends. I'm going to take you out. Let's have fun. Now, she said yes. And if she had said no, who cares? I now know the best place in town. I know where girls like her hang out. So, Stockholm all worked out exceptionally well. I end up sleeping with this girl, Philippa. She's still messaging me now. I've been home for weeks and weeks. That's what Tinder is good for, finding the best places to hang out in town. And when you get to these places, make sure you check in on Instagram, take a picture, tag yourself on Instagram, because if you do that, I tag myself at the Stockholm Grand Hotel, the best hotel in the city, that's where I was staying. I had three or four girls message me simply because I tagged myself at that hotel. Girls from Sweden, they all are obsessed with Instagram. Hot girls are obsessed with Instagram. And how did I find out that the Stockholm Grand Hotel was the best place in town to stay? From a chick on Tinder who I never even met. I said, oh yeah, I'm thinking I don't know where to stay. She goes, oh, the best hotel is the Stockholm Grand Hotel. I Googled it, it was, boom, booked it. Then at the end of the night when I was done in that club or whatever with Philippa, oh, where are you staying? The Stockholm Grand Hotel. Of course, it's the best hotel in the city. Like I knew and I didn't. Oh, wow, yeah, it is the best hotel in the city. You know, I've got a killer mini bar. Let's go and have some drinks. Come on, it's not late. I know everything here closes at three. That's weird. You know, in my, in, in my country, the party goes on until five. True or not, I would have used that line. Let's go. Back to the hotel. That's what dating apps are useful for. If you're there trying to get laid, trying to talk, trying to make your girlfriend and stuff, forget about it, man. Forget about it. These girls get every dude they swipe is a match. After a day or two of talking to them, you are, they're going to stop replying regardless of who you are. If you think she's really hot and you met her on Tinder, get her off Tinder ASAP. Get her onto Instagram, get her onto WhatsApp. Because at least if you get her onto Instagram and you send messages back and forth, hey, it's me, you are now out of her other inbox and in her main inbox. You're a guy she knows, a guy she swiped and said she's attracted to, and she will always read your messages. That's a good lead. Forget about Tinder. Terrible, that's its only use. Now, depending on the culture of the country you're in, another way you can meet women is by having a group of women with you. Now, I know this sounds insane, guys. I know this sounds crazy. But if you know two or three girls and you're heading over to a nightclub or a bar and you invite them with you, having a group of women with you in a town or city where these women are from, it acts like a magnet. This is elite level stuff that you will not hear anywhere else. 
If you have three or four girls from New York with you while you are in New York and you're taking them to the best clubs and the best bars and the best spots, the girls they know congregate around you. They come to talk to their friends. You can make your brief introduction. Hello, my name's Tristan. Oh, really nice to meet you. Yeah, I'm just out uh, with these girls right now. Blah, blah. I tell you what, have you got Instagram? Yeah, no, you come out with us next time. Why, you know, stay here, stay at our table. Screw those guys. Having girls with you acts like a magnet. Now, when I was much younger, if I went out trying to look for women, it was a different world, but I'd go out by myself to crappy bars and clubs and try to talk to girls. You know, I learned things the hard way. However, now I do not go out with just men. I go out with women every single time. I don't care if they're my friends, my girlfriends, girls I'm sleeping with. I bring women when I go out because they're friends, they're girlfriends, they're mates. They all want to come over and talk. Oh, hi. Oh, you're at Tristan's table. Or maybe they don't even know me. Maybe I can make an introduction. And that is a way that I meet a lot of women. The friends of the women who I fuck, you better believe I've been through a lot of them, especially my side chicks. When it comes to keeping my girlfriends, I don't really fuck their friends. That's a bit of a, a line I tend not to cross because I'm spoiled for choice. But yeah, having women with you attracts women. Don't let anyone tell you that it doesn't because I know better than anyone else. Another way to meet women is reputation, especially in your home city. I don't care if you, if you live in South Africa, Johannesburg. I don't care if you live in Mozambique. I don't care if you live in uh, Sydney, LA, wherever you're from, your reputation matters, especially in the city you live, especially in the city you live in. Now, this is when being a gentleman comes in. Kissing and telling, bragging about girls you fucked, showing their nudes to people. It's just not cool. Now, guys who do this, when I meet a guy and he's like, oh, I fucked this girl, I fucked this girl. It's a bunch of naked titty pictures. I'm like, okay, yeah, cool. Yeah, I do all right myself. I don't brag. That's an amateur tactic because what they're doing is they're ruining their reputation. Now, I can meet a girl and she'll be like, yeah, you actually met my friend before. And I'll say, who's your friend? And it's a girl I used to sleep with for a little while. But I was nice. I was polite. I was kind. I took her to nice places. You know, I, I bought her some nice cocktails. I was always a good host. We had sex a few times. I let her know that it wasn't anything serious. And her friends want a piece of the action. Her friends will hear this and, <laughs> and actually want to date me or want the same kind of setup with me than she had. So reputation is another way to meet women. Don't let anyone tell you that it doesn't work. As I said, these guys on the internet who pretend to be playboys, they don't know what they're talking about. They won't believe in a million years you could meet a woman because you met their friend. Yeah, that's because they're butthurt. They're losers. When a girl breaks up with them, they throw insults at them and cry and scream and threaten to kill themselves because they're nerds. Me, when I break up with a woman or she breaks up with me, God forbid, especially side chicks. Side chicks leave me because they find out about my girlfriends. I say, you know what? Well, I had a lot of fun with you. You're an awesome girl. I wish you all the best. Yeah, cool. That's the way to do it. Reputation is another way of meeting women. And so is being scouted out, being actively searched out. So when I talk about Instagram game from a man's perspective, actually approaching women and trying to talk to them, I very briefly mentioned tagging myself at the Grand Hotel in Stockholm. Women will seek you out, not just in the real world, but in the online world more so than ever before. Young women who uh, have never lived a life without Instagram or 18, 19, 20, 21. If you take a very good picture, as of this day, I recently uploaded one of me sitting in a hot tub, which is full of money with a girl in a bikini lighting my cigar while I'm drinking a glass of whiskey. That picture went viral. Thousands and thousands of likes. People who didn't know who I was, people who had never interacted with my profile saw it on their newsfeed because I planned out the good picture and I took it. I had lots of women message me. Ha ha, I'd never light your cigar for you. But she messaged me. That means she would. You actively get searched out when you're an elite level guy. And this is what I mean one more time when I say you have to train and you have to work at being an elite playboy. That's the key. That way you do get searched out. If you're a normal guy marching around the mall trying to collect phone numbers, no girl in the universe is ever going to say to her friend, hey, that guy who marches around the mall asking every girl's number, yeah, he's hot. Do you know his name? Or no one is going to message you on Instagram. Aren't you that guy who marches around the mall asking girls for her number? Wow. You know what? Why don't you take me on a date? No, you get searched out and you get scouted and hunted when you're a top 1% man.
So if you're not being scouted out, if you're not being hunted, if you're not being searched for, what exactly are you missing, guys? Stand up, look down. Can you see your dick? No, then you're too fat, lose some weight. Women care about looks too. I'm not the best looking guy in the world, sure, but I make an effort, I try, I work out, I get into shape. All these women wouldn't like me as much if I was 20 pounds heavier or 30 pounds heavier. Of course they wouldn't. So you do get searched out when you're a top level guy, so absolutely invest your time in that. Get a gym membership, obviously make some money, drive a nice car, do something productive. Maybe you play the guitar very well. I don't play the guitar. Maybe you're an amazing surfer. These things get women too. I myself was a kickboxer. It didn't attract as many women as many women as you'd think. But when I was young and I didn't have any money and I couldn't do fun things and I couldn't go to nice bars or nice clubs, the fact that I was a kickboxer got a lot of attention. I could beat another man up. Sure, I was broke, but girls liked that. I always had pretty girlfriends. So what are you doing right now? If you are just a normal guy with a normal job doing nothing, you don't produce any content, you're not talented, you can't do gymnastics or, or play the guitar, do something. Because every man in the world has a dick that he wants to get sucked. Every dude on earth, and you're just another one of them. Unless you make yourself different in some way, you will never get scouted out. But it certainly is a way to meet women. Believe me, happens to me all the time. That's how top level guys meet women. So essentially all the same ways most other guys do, but there are little twists and little spins on everything. I'm gonna very briefly cover what not to do. Obviously I've gone into day game, don't do that. You need your time, you need your time to work out, you need your time to make money, you need your hours of your day. You can't go marching around malls or marching around parks trying to go up to every woman who you speak to. Do not send pictures of your dick. If you're watching this, if you're watching this and you send pictures of your dick, what are you doing? Women don't wanna see your dick, bro. Don't send random fucking dick pictures to girls. That's obviously a fucking red line. That's uh, More women see my dick than the guys who send their dick to all the women on the internet. And you know why? Because women actually wanna have sex with me. Don't send pictures of your dick, guys. That's an obviously uh, a big thing not to do. Do not spam messages. If you message a girl once and she does not reply, do not send her another message. Even if you have her number and you message her once, twice, three times, no reply, give up, quit delete her number, move on to the next target. Message spamming isn't cool. These are the basic things of what not to do. But that is in essence how I meet my women. Now I'm gonna go on to dating because dating is the important part. Dating is how I add women to my collection. The most important part of dating when you are an elite playboy is something that you guys probably wouldn't guess if you've bought this course. It is time management. When do you go on dates? In the evening, what do you do? Dinner, after dinner, drinks, after drinks, you try to have sex with her, maybe she goes home, maybe she comes back to your place. Wrong, wrong, you don't do that. How are you going to have six girlfriends and 10 side chicks if you commit an entire evening of dinner and drinks, ignoring your other girls on your phone to try to have sex with a single girl? That is not possible. If that is your method, you're gonna have two girls or three girls on the go maximum. That is it. Six girlfriends, I see them all more than once a week. How does that work out? Well, it's not magic. I can't add hours of the day and I can't make time, but time management is the key to dating multiple women, to having an, a harem of women. You have to manage your time. So I'm gonna give you an example. You need to turn things that you have to do anyway into dates. You can't commit a whole evening to a new girl. So I've met a new girl at a club. I have her phone number. All of my girlfriends wanna see me. Let's say I've picked one of them for tonight. I know which girlfriend is coming over to my house and which girl I'm having sex with tonight. I meet my new girl when I do something mundane that I have to do anyway. I'm running errands in the city. I'll say, you know, baby, I'll tell you what, I'll pick you up. We'll go for a little drive. We'll go for coffee. I'll pick her up at three or 4 p.m. I'll do my errands, drop the things off that I have to drop off, you know. Have a coffee with the girl for 20 minutes, make her laugh, make her smile, two hours only, then I'll take her home. Now, something different has happened to this girl when she's been with me than she's been with the typical guy. Made her laugh, made her smile, she had a wonderful time. 
But there was no drinking, there was no getting her drunk. There was no me trying to have sex with her. There was no me leaning in for a kiss. She's back at home at 5 p.m. Like, ah, oh, okay, well that was fun. And she's alone in the evening. Who's she thinking about? Me. I can then commit my evening to my girlfriend. I can finish my work around nine o'clock, spend a few hours watching a movie with my girl, fuck her. I could text on my phone, my girlfriends don't look at my phone. And the girl who I went on a date with was mine all day. She was mine in the afternoon after I left her home. She was mine in the evening. She was mine at night when I said goodnight to her and she went to sleep thinking about me. I didn't try to fuck her, but I spent enough time with her to implant myself into her mind. I owned her thoughts for 12 hours by investing a little bit of time in the afternoon and still had my evening free to have sex with my girlfriend, keep her happy. That's how you do dates. That's how you time manage. Fuck this evening, go out for drinks, go out for dinner, try and bang them. Cool, you wanna get a girlfriend, do that. That's, that's all you. But if you wanna play the game on my level, you cannot afford to waste your evenings. You have to manage your time. Now, this was money well spent. I'm gonna let you guys in on the most exclusive elite player tactic that exists in the world. I have never seen another man even do it. I've never heard of another man doing it. I've never heard of another man attempting it. And that is having two dates or three at the exact same time in the exact same place. A system my brother and I call double booking. What is double booking? How is this possible? I'm gonna tell you how. Only the elitist of the elite can pull this off. But once again, I can date three or four women in a night in the same place, have them all thinking about me, go home to one of my girlfriends and spend the next two or three days cleaning up the mess and fucking the girls who I went on the date with. How does one do this? Now, I'm gonna tell you, double booking does not work in certain settings. You cannot double book at the cinema. You cannot invite three girls to the cinema, all to meet you in the same place and take them all out for a movie who, when they don't know each other. That doesn't work. Double booking works when there's a vibe, when there's a party atmosphere. And you have to understand that in parties and clubs and bars, women will put on their makeup, put on their dress, do their hair, come out and see you. They haven't got any money. They're hanging out at my table, your table, drinking your drinks. They're not gonna storm off and go home because there are some other girls around, especially when you're out with a crew of your friends. Yeah, you know everyone. They're all your friends. It relies on a poker face. These girls do not say to each other, oh, hi, I came here for a date with Tristan. So when I go to a club on a Friday, this is an example of double booking. I'll bring one of my girlfriends, why not? I love my girlfriends, they're wonderful people. Maybe two, but let's, let's say one. One of my girlfriends, and then I'll take three of the women I've been texting who I have yet to meet. I'll, I'll say, you know, baby, I'm going out to the club tonight. I'm hitting this club. You know, why don't you come with me? Bring your friends. Yeah, it's a group vibe. I'm out with some people I know. I repeat that times three. Three women get done up. They shave their legs. They wax their fucking eyebrows. They do their makeup. They do their hair. They paint their fingernails. They put on their lipstick, they put on their high heels, and they come to the club to meet me, to impress me. I give each one of them maximum 20 minutes of my time. Oh, hey, baby. Kiss on the cheek, kiss on the cheek. I'm really glad you could make it. Yeah, you know, have a drink. It's way too loud for anyone to hear any conversation that isn't one-on-one. -on -one. You buy champagne, you keep the party going, everyone's doing shots, everyone's yelling, shouting, celebrating, having a good time. You're all in a big group, and the party atmosphere drowns out the room for difficult conversation. These girls then don't say to each other, hi, why are you here? Did you come here to see, which one of the guys? Tristan, yeah, I came here to see Tristan. That doesn't happen. They literally introduce themselves to each other. Hi, my name's Andrea. Oh, hi, my name's Christine, hi. They kiss each other on the cheek. Hey girls, would you like some champagne? I hand them both a glass and the party continues. I call it double booking. Now you'll see these guys on the internet, playboys, um, so-called, who have tables full of girls. These girls are either not interested in them, not fucking them, or they're escorts, prostitutes, girls who are being paid, girls who are being hired to uh, hang out. That's not how I do it. 
at all. I don't think elite level playboys ever play that game. So I have women all coming for a date with me. They've all bought one or two friends. My friends talk to their friends in a huge mixed group. And if I want one at the end of the night, if one's made it clear she wants to stay with me, I could sneak off with her, leave 20 minutes before my friends. My friends will give me covering fire. If not, then I'll go home with one of my girlfriends. I'll go home to one of my girlfriends. I'll go home to two of my girlfriends. But all of these women, as far as they're concerned, I went to the club and I took them with me. They were my date for that evening. The evening when all the champagne comes over, everyone's looking at the party that's being had. They were my date. So yeah, double booking, elite playboy tactic. Nobody I know does this. Only me and my brother. And we have a good saying, the only thing better than double booking is triple booking, which sounds stupid, but now you understand how the tactic works. The more there are, the less room there is for any difficult conversation to happen or any mistakes to be made. You couldn't pull this off at the cinema. You couldn't pull this off at the restaurant, but next time you're going to a club and taking a date, invite more girls. Double book yourself, try it out, and then message me on Instagram and tell me, Tristan, thank you, because it fucking works. So you know when I go to clubs and when I go to bars, I'm usually double booked or triple booked. My table has lots of women on it. Now I'm gonna to talk to you about club game, how I run game inside of the club. Now of course I'm spending some money, I have some bottles of vodka, some bottles of champagne, depending on what your budget is, as long as you have enough alcohol to get everyone at the table drunk and partying, that's enough. You don't need to be a millionaire to pull off these, this double booking technique. Any club, any bar or restaurant that has a party atmosphere, you could do it at. But when I'm there, as I said, if you want to be elite, you have to make the effort. I can't go out there with three or four women and a girlfriend and think, you know what? Wow, this is wonderful. I can have any of these girls I choose. This is great. That's enough. It's never enough. So when you're in that position, the winning position, you're the man in the club with the women, how do you capitalize on it to meet more women? This is when you do your approaches, gentlemen. You're the guy, you're dressed nicely. You're looking your best. You're surrounded by women, you're on the table, you're drinking your champagne. If you think that other women in the, in the club don't notice this, you are wrong. You need to expand your horizons. You don't just look at your table and what you have there. Look further, look deeper into the crowd. Look at the bar. Who are the two girls standing on the bar? They're looking at you. Of course they are, you're the guy with all the girls in the club. Now, they're looking at you, who in their right mind, if they were with their girlfriends and on dates, would walk over and approach the two girls at the bar? Surely nobody. That's why you do it. You walk over to the girls and say, hey girls, hey I saw you looking, you look familiar. Have I met you before? Oh no, maybe you just have one of those faces. No, I'll tell you what, no, me and my friends are all having a drink. Don't stand over here by the bar, it's lame, all these dorks trying to talk to you. Come over with me, come have a drink with me, uh, let's go. Maybe it's a yes, maybe it's a no, but you have to make your approaches. It doesn't matter what crowd you're in. They may say yes, they come over, they'll introduce themselves to the other girls. They won't say, oh, are you on a date with Tristan, are you not? They are blinded by how fun the party situation is and you've added two more to your triple booked girlfriend date situation. That is club game. Also, as I said, if you're out with women from a certain city, their friends come over. When they come over, they're like magnets. The more of them congregate in one area, the more flow in. Make your approaches then. Talk to their friends, introduce yourself. Tell them your name, if nothing else. Oh, hey, no, hi, my name is Tristan. Really nice to meet you. Would you like a drink? Cool, have whatever you like, bye. You'd be surprised, you do that with every single girl. A few times a year, you're gonna get an Instagram follow the very next day. Oh, hi, it's, it's Cynthia. No, oh, hi, Tristan. Yeah, we, we met in the club. It's that simple. You need to run game on top of game. There's no universe where you try to get 10 women and you get all 10. To get as many women as me, you have to try with hundreds. You have to make yourself available and out there for hundreds of women to know and hundreds of women to see. So when you're in the club, you can get into the minds of 50, you can have 15 or 20 women thinking about you and you can get six or seven of their details on top of your own situation which you're already running. That is why nerds who do day game are never elite level playboys. I do not approach women all day long. I've built a beautiful life and put myself in a wonderful situation where my situation attracts the women. 
They, are, they come to me for me then to attack. I'm a trapper. I'm not a hunter. That's the way to do it. And that's why I have so many women. But yeah, club game. Don't just look at what's on your table. Maybe, maybe your girlfriend will break up with you tomorrow and none of those four girls will want to fuck. Maybe they just wanted to drink some champagne. Maybe they don't like it in the, maybe they don't like you. They just wanted to hang out at the club. Cool, what are you going to do then? Go home and jerk off? No, no, you're going to talk. You're going to get one of the girls you went and approached the bar. Always overstretch and always be thinking on how to capitalize your situation and add more women to the harem. That's the end of module one, how to meet women. If you apply all these things the way that I've taught you, you should meet women and be ready for the next stage, which is dating, module two. Nobody covers this topic, nobody. But I'm gonna talk to you about how to have sex with virgins. Virgins, now, elite level playboys, these dorks who take these pictures with all these girls, they are usually paid, they're models, they're actresses, they're, they're sent there by their agency. I do not pay for sex. I've never hired a prostitute in my life and I won't, I don't need to. But when you don't pay for sex, there are advantages to that. You get the women no one else gets. Any sheikh in Dubai can hire a, the hottest Dubai escort and bang her. I could go to Dubai and bang the exact same escort. Why would I want to? That's disgusting. However, in my situation, you get access to girls that no one else has access to. When you run game like me and meet the women who I meet and roll in the circles I meet, you meet beautiful virgins sometimes. Me, I'll do two or three virgins a year. Now, how do you date a virgin when you're, a, when you're an ice cold player? There is a tactic which I'm going to share with you on how to date a virgin and how to take a girl's virginity. Typically, the first girl's virginity I took, I was 16 years old, she was a virgin, I was a virgin. It was rubbish. And what I did was this, I dated her. She was my girlfriend for three months. Then we had very boring sex. That's how I had sex with my first virgin. Now, the recipe hasn't changed, but the tactics and the implementation has certainly changed. Be their boyfriend for three months and be in a nice relationship with them. That is the recipe. I'm sorry, guys. You want to run into a virgin and fuck her the next day? Don't ask me how. I don't know. I don't think anyone knows. I don't even think it's possible. You have to be their boyfriend for an extended period of time. You then have to take a virginity on the second month anniversary or something along those lines. And I'm going to teach you how to do it while still being in a playboy lifestyle scenario. What you do with your virgin is you turn everything into a date. I need to go have a business lunch with my brother or my friends. I make sure she's there. I Uber her in, I Uber her out. If I have to go for a drive, I make sure she's with me. I go and pick her up, do my drive, drop her off, go back home. If I have to go to a, a club, she's part of my double booking scenario. She's always with me at least three or four times a week, regardless of what I'm doing. I go to a lot of lunches and a lot of dinners. I eat at restaurants a lot. I take her to the restaurant. Nothing about my life has changed. I'm not going out of my way. I'm not making specific time for her. I'm not trying my best to take her on dates and show her a good time. What I'm doing is I'm adding her into my normal everyday life. Now, to me, I'm fucking my girls. I have my girlfriends, my relationships. I'm getting my sex. I'm having my drinks, hanging out with my friends. Nothing has changed in my life apart from there's some quiet girl next to me half the time when I'm out and I would otherwise be alone. But to her, in her mindset, Tristan is my boyfriend. He took me to lunch today and he dropped me home. He took me to the bar today. He was with his friends and he took me with him and then he sent me home. Tristan is my boyfriend. In her mind, we've been dating and then one day that day will come when she's ready and you'll know. You'll know because she'll make it obvious to you. No matter what you do with virgins, don't get pushy. Don't take them to your bed and try and sleep with them and get your dick hard. And no matter what, do not violate my golden rule with virgins. If she won't fuck you, do not let her touch you. Oh, you're a virgin, maybe you can suck my dick. No, 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 it's desperate. Uh, maybe you can wank me off. It, it smells of desperation. Do not do this. Baby, you're not ready? 
I understand. Let's go to sleep. Go to sleep like a fucking man without sex for one day if she stays with you. For fuck's sake, have some dignity while some virgin giving you the worst blowjob in the world trying to explain her how to... Guys, grow the fuck up. If you're with a virgin in bed, she's not ready, cool. Go to sleep. Nothing will make her want you more than this. So I've come into situations where I've been seeing these virgins for a month, two months, nothing about my life has changed. And then they'll come to me and say, oh, maybe we can do something special this weekend. Boom, I book a hotel, we have a few drinks at the hotel bar, take her upstairs, virginity gone. As far as she's concerned, I've been her boyfriend for three months. She's in a long-term committed relationship. And all it's taken is me to order some Ubers when I'm having my free time with my friends. That is how I have added virgins to my list. Two of the girls of my six were virgins when I met them. They're not anymore, but now they're mine. Now, when it comes to dating, I know what some of you think. Women love money. No. Whores love money. Women love fun, and fun costs money. If you're broke, you're not going to get as many women. Why? You don't pay the women. I don't give women money. Women very rarely see my money and think, ooh, maybe I can get some money from him, only if they're real bitches or real whores or prostitutes. Good girls don't care if you have money. They're not going to ask you for money. But if you don't have any money, all you can do is invite them to your apartment. Money is important because money facilitates fun. You can take a girl out in your nice car. That's fun for her. You want to take her out? In my house, I have a jacuzzi. That's nice. I have a fully stocked bar in my cigar lounge in my house. They can come here. They can have some drinks. Money facilitates fun. So when it comes to dating, yes, you need money. Now, there's an old fallacy when they say, oh, well, you pay for it one way or the other. You're paying for it if you hire a hooker. You're paying for it if you go to the club. No. One, going to clubs, bars, and restaurants is much more expensive than paying a hooker. One, it costs more. Two, it costs more because it's better. It's better. You can't pay for the sex that I have. You can't buy the sex that I have. Do not hire escorts and do not hire prostitutes. If a woman comes to bed with me, she has a genuine desire for me. I may have bought champagne. I may have bought dinner. I may have bought movie tickets. It doesn't matter. She comes into my bed with me thinking, wow, I want this man. I'm going to fuck with this guy. I'm going to let this guy inside of me. I'm crazy about him. He seduced me. I want to have sex with him. Any situation where you are paying for sex eliminates that spark. And that spark is what makes male-female interaction beautiful. I love having women around me, but I would hate women sitting around me, charging me by the hour, looking at their watches. Oop, that's another $300. That's another $200. That's another $100. I would detest them. Who the fuck do you think you are sitting around me, charging me by the hour to be in my company? No. So yes, it is more expensive. You do pay one way or the other, if you date them or if you pay them. But paying for them, you don't get them. You're giving her money, she thinks, ah, oh, okay. I better go fuck this loser. I better go fuck this guy because he gave me some money. That's very different to a woman thinking, I want to be in bed with this man. Elite playboys do not pay for sex because anybody could teach that. Ready? I'm gonna give you the playboy pay for sex course. Make lots of money, hire hookers, have sex with them, done. Anyone with money can do that. But as I said, with the virgins, with the good girls, with the girls looking for long-term relationships, if you're smart enough and your tactics are solid, you can play the game and you get access to women that the guys who pay simply can never touch. Another important aspect of dating your women is when you have your guy time. When you're an elite level playboy like me and you have all the women that I do, you need to maximize your hours in your day. But what you can't do is you can't eat into guy time by replacing it to date women. Your guy time is when you hang around with your friends. Maybe you drink beers, I drink whiskey. Maybe you, I don't know, smoke your cigarettes, I smoke cigars. So regardless of what you do in your guy time, you need it. Men need to be around other men. You can't just be around women exclusively. So a very good test to whether women are relationship quality or friend quality is how are they around your friends? Now, my women are all the same. All six of my girlfriends are the ones who pass my test and they get to be around me when I have my guy time. Now, when they're around me, what do they do? They make sure the ice stays cold. They bring the beers over. They make us coffee. They make us tea. 
and they remain quiet. Your guide time is important date time, especially when you're hanging around with virgins or girls you need to put a lot of hours in with. You can happily invite them around, introduce them to your friends and make sure they sit there and stay silent. Do not eat into your guide time and replace it with women time, but you can absolutely use that when dating as well. Basic things you shouldn't do when dating. Now we're wrapping up dating. I'm gonna tell you one not to do. I already covered, do not waste evenings. Do not commit mass amounts of time to a single female. You can commit the time by living inside of her mind. I can do a date at one o'clock, a date at three o'clock, a date at five o'clock, and then I can fuck my girlfriend. I'm with four women all night. Four women all night. I have turned 12 hours into 48 somehow. Why? Because all they think about is me. The one on a date today, his name was Tristan. He was nice. He took me for coffee. He made me laugh. He made me smile. I could run the same script on all of them. Tell them all the same joke. I'm gonna fuck two or three of them probably of the girls I dated. That's the way to manage your time. Do not waste massive hours, dozens of hours with the same girl. That's never going to get you to the point where I'm at because you only have 24 hours in a day. Other things not to do. Do not sideline important business for women. You need your money. You need your vehicle. You need your agency. You need your presence as a man to have your women. If you start sidelining important business for pussy, you're gonna end up without your important business, which means you end up without your money, which ends up means you end up without your lifestyle. And without your lifestyle, you're gonna end up without your pussy too. So never ever sideline important business for pussy. And don't try to fuck women too fast. Guys get their, you know, the typical dating game of meeting one girl, it's all about when are we finally gonna fuck? It doesn't matter, guys. Build up your collection of women very much. If you've ever worked a sales job, like you build up your sales leads. It's a bunch of maybes and they all come crashing in eventually. And when they all come crashing in, you won't care that the new girl you just met isn't fucking you yet. Because you're getting your dick sucked that night irregardless of her and what she does. However, you can meet her, show her a good time, make her smile, make her laugh, have your nice afternoon, go and get your dick sucked anyway. Doesn't matter if she wants to fuck yet, but she's gonna lay in bed thinking, oh, he didn't even try to fuck me. I wonder if he's into me. Do not try to fuck too fast. That's a mistake too many guys make and it's amateur and it's desperate. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about toys. And when I mean toys, I mean supercars, jacuzzis, jet skis. I don't know what you have, surfboards. I don't know who you are or what you have, but all of us men have our toys. Now trying to impress a woman with a supercar doesn't work. If you're trying to impress a 12 year old boy, yeah, it might work. I'm gonna tell you how to handle toys. So a Ferrari can make an amazing date, but you don't, a, a jacuzzi can make an amazing date. Uh, I don't know what else you have, a guitar, a surfboard, whatever your talents are, they can add to a date massively if you're talented. I don't have a surfboard or a car. Or, I don't know what type of girl would like that kind of stuff. Quite a few, but I mean, not the girls I typically date. But for example, if you have a Lamborghini like I do, you don't say, oh, you wanna go out with my Lamborghini. Talking about money is narcissistic. Talking about money is not attractive when it's one-on-one -on -one with a female. It's not cool. Do your boasting on Instagram, do your boasting on Twitter, tell guys you have money, make them feel bad. You know, But boasting to women is stupid, it's asinine. No woman has a Lamborghini. What are you boasting for? You look like a dickhead. What you just say is let's go for a drive. I'll tell you what, no, you wanna come over to my place? Yeah, cool, come over. Make sure you bring a bikini. Then you say, let's get in the jacuzzi. You take it for a drive, then you're in the Lamborghini. All it is is a extra surprise on top of things. Never approach a girl and say, hi, I have a Lamborghini. Uh, would you like to come for a drive with me? Say, you know what, you're really cool. You know, let's go for a drive sometime. Never talk about your assets. Never talk about your toys. Never say, uh, here, come to my house and I'm gonna play the guitar and sing a song for you. That sounds gay. However, if you have your guitar on display in your room and you take her back to your house and she sees your guitar and goes, oh, play me something. Uh, okay, you know what? Cool, I'll play you a little something. Then bust out the guitar. I can't even play guitar, but if you can, that's your game. And the guitar analogy, I don't know what else you want to apply it to, but there's something that you have that they don't. Something you have to impress her, but never mention it. Understate these things. Let them, they already know who you are. They like you enough to meet you. Cool, everything else is a bonus on top. 
If they're meeting you, you don't have to say, oh, I could play the guitar and I have a, a Ferrari and uh, I have a jet ski at my lake house. But if they want to meet you, hang out with them. First have coffee, then add these things in. They're just bonuses, things that are going to make her smile, things that are going to excite her and things that are going to lock her in to you even further than she's already invested. Vacations. Do you take a girl on vacation? Why take sand to a beach? People always say. Vacations can be used, but they should never be used on new women. See, in the 1960s, the elite playboys, I don't know, I won't say elite playboys actually. In the 1960s, the womanizers had their fast cars. You had a Mustang, you pick up your girl in your fast car, you drive her around, she'll want to suck your dick. That doesn't work today. Uh, various things in the 1980s, you take her to the luxury casinos, you get all dressed up in your tuxedo, she'd wear her nice dress, you know, take her to the nice parties, drink, buy her champagne, she'd want to have sex with you. Yeah, cool. Today, it has changed. Today, it's flight tickets. Flight tickets and plane tickets will get you in a girl's pants if you're a customer, if you're a dork, if you're a loser. If you're going to go on vacation and bring a woman, cool, take one of your girlfriends, a girl you've been with a while, a girl whose loyalty you've tested, a girl whose loyalty you want to reward. People see me on vacation, and there are some vacation pictures of me in Dubai, and I'm with some beautiful women, and losers, haters will come at me, huh, yeah, you're taking women on vacation, huh, it's the same as hiring escorts. No, 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 no. The women I take on vacation have been my girlfriend for years. They've been my girlfriends through me cheating, through catching me doing all sorts of bad shit, They've been loyal to me. They've been respectful around me and my friends. They've been faithful to me. Yeah, cool, you wanna come on vacation? I'm coming. I'll go for two weeks. I'll bring them out for four or five days. Do not use vacations for dating, guys. Do not, you're gonna attract the wrong type of woman and you're gonna set a precedent with these girls who are gonna expect you to take them everywhere and really they're just, they, they'd fuck anyone for a plane ticket. Girls who are eager to go on vacations with guys they've never met, you wanna stay away from them. So do not use vacations as dates. Vacations are not Dates, do not use them in your dating game. Use them as rewards for long-term long girlfriends. Obviously, when you're on vacation, all the rules to the game, the Tinder, uh, the Instagram, that all applies. By all means, meet new women when you're there. Leave your girlfriend in your, ho in her, in her, in your hotel room for the night. Go and stay in a different hotel if you get lucky. Cool, but do not, as a rule, go on vacations as dates. Golden rule, don't do that. Text game. Now your text game is very important because after meeting a woman, your text game is what gets her to actually being in a relationship with you or being a girl who shares a bed with you. Text game is intensely important. The one mistake guys make that elite level players do not is they text too much. Let me explain to you. It's a very simple mathematical problem. If I spend three or four hours a day talking to a girl on WhatsApp, how many girls can I maintain that level of conversation with? Two, three. I need to be talking to 15 girls at a time. I keep a numerical system. If you've got Andrew's PhD course, my numerical system is explained in there. And I have all my girls filed in my phone. I need to talk to all of them all the time. How do I do it? A few messages a day. Every two hours, I'll open WhatsApp. I'll reply to every single girl. Another two hours passes, I'll reply to every single girl. It's only a couple minutes every two hours. You don't lock yourself down into huge conversations for two reasons. One, the conversation should simply be trying to secure a date. Secure a time and a date to go for coffee. And when she's happy, you put it in your calendar and you make sure you text her a few hours before or a day before. Can't wait to see you tomorrow. I'm really looking forward to it tomorrow. And you confirm the date before you go. That's all text game is. If you, and I know lots of guys do it, so don't feel bad for making this mistake, are talking on text about her interests, what she likes doing, uh, why are you single, uh, her life story, where any of this shit is date material. You wanna be sitting at a dinner table or sitting at a, a coffee bar having that conversation. She's met you, she finds you moderately attractive, at least she gave you her contact details, the whole text game is aiming at closing a date. Hey, how are you? It was good to see you the other night. Continue with your business. A couple hours passed. She's replied. Yeah, yeah, it was really good. It was a really night out. You know, I'd like to see you again and get to know you a bit better. You free tomorrow? Let's go for coffee. Boom. That's it. 
That's all you need. If you set the precedent, we are talking for hours and hours a day on WhatsApp, you probably do it now. What you're doing is when you do become her boyfriend, when you are in a relationship with her and you start texting her less and less to message your new girls, she's gonna think you're ignoring her. However, I'm always the guy who texts five times a day. I'm always the guy who replies five or six replies a day over the course of 24 hours and that's it. That's always been me. I'm not the guy who has huge long conversations all day on WhatsApp and I set that since day one. Now, since day one, that's been the case. Cool, she's not gonna ever expect any more from me. Then our interaction could be the kind of interaction I like. Do you get excited talking to girls on WhatsApp? That's gay, that's lame, that's loser shit. The interaction I want with women, I want them sitting across the table from me, smiling, rubbing my shoulders while we watch a movie, eating popcorn together, in bed, waking up together. That's what I want. I don't wanna be talking on WhatsApp all day. So text game, keep it minimal and keep it to the point. However you do it, I, I don't speak, maybe you don't speak English as your first language, maybe you're doing, uh, what, regardless of what your game is and how well your text game uh, comes together, the goal is simple. Make sure it's all orientated to getting her on a date. What kind of food do you like? Perfectly okay question. Oh, I like this, I like that. Oh, you like Japanese food, that's cool. I, I know a really great Japanese restaurant in town. Have you ever been to this? Yeah, it's my favorite restaurant. Okay, I'll take you there tomorrow. Or, no, I've never been there. Oh, you gotta try it. I'll take you there tomorrow. Everything has to be a slow closing process to getting that date. And if she really won't go on a date with you because you're not texting enough, fuck her. There's plenty of girls who will. That's text game summed up. And that is the end of module two. That is everything you need to know about dating to be an elite playboy. But dating isn't the end goal, which is why we have module three. I'm gonna talk about relationships. I've covered meeting women and I've covered dating women, but that's not all you want. Now there are guys on Twitter. There are guys on the internet who are like, yeah, women ain't nothing. I just fuck them and leave them. I just hit it and quit it. Nah, you're missing out on something. They're missing out on the fundamental, enjoyable experience of being with women. Women aren't just sex objects. Yeah, that's coming from me one of the baddest playboys in the world. Women are not just sex objects. Women have a special type of energy around them. They're fascinating. They're wonderful in their own special way. I'll never trust a woman like I'll trust a man. If I, if I need backup in a situation or if I have problems, I'm never gonna call a woman. I'll call a man like my brother. However, women are unique and they make life beautiful. You're taking a walk on the beach, it's better with a woman. You're laying in the park looking up at the sky, it's better with a woman. You're at dinner, it's better with a woman. You're at a club with your male friends, you want women around. Women are the seasoning to life. They make it more special. If you're sick, you're in bed, you're not feeling well, you want a woman to look after you. You don't want a man bringing you soup and rubbing your back, that's gay. I mean, maybe you're gay wouldn't buy this course if you were, but yeah, in which case you would want a man, but women have a special type of energy and I love women. So these hit it and quit it guys, they don't have serious relationships like I do. I have six serious relationships. Why? Because the love and the relationship is maybe the most rewarding part of being an elite playboy, collecting the relationships, not just the notches on the bedpost, but the women who would cry their eyes out if I stopped speaking to them. That is power and that is truly having affinity with women. So now we're gonna go into the details of how to have relationships. First and foremost, in any relationship, you have to establish if she's relationship material. Now there are people who will talk about how to find the right partner for you, how to navigate the sexual marketplace. I see them all the time. I look at their videos and I laugh because these guys have never navigated the sexual marketplace. To be a man who knows what a good apple is and what a bad apple is, you have to try thousands of apples. Every day, taking bites of new apples, knowing what tastes good, knowing what doesn't. This is why I have such wonderful women in my life. Because I have met the psychopaths and the terrible women that men warn you about. I've met the women who would divorce rape me or try to have my baby or upset my life or try to ruin my business. I've met them. 
I fucked him once, I never talked to him again because I can spot a good one from a bad one from a mile off. So that is the key to having relationships. You have to differentiate which girls you fuck from which girls you wanna stay with. The best way to do this is as hard as it is, guys, we all think with our dicks sometimes, you have to eliminate beauty in your mind. The hottest girl in the world can be a horrible, backstabbing, money-grabbing, gold-digging bitch. And most dudes will stay with her. Oh, but she's so nice. What exactly is nice about her? Me, when I'm trying to differentiate which kind of women I want to love and which women I want to just sleep with, I usually close my eyes and I think about them as an asexual, blackened figurine. I think of what their qualities are. I wake up in the morning, she makes me coffee. My injured shoulder's playing up, she gives me a massage. She leaves her phone around unlocked. Doesn't matter, doesn't care if I look in it. Never goes out of the room to, make, to take a phone call. Is respectful to my friends, cleans up my house, cooks my meals. If these things are adding up, then I'll usually uh, turn it into something serious. I'll tell her she's exclusively with me. I'll tell her the truth, I'm a busy man, I'll see her as much as I can. I'll tell her that I love her even. I'll tell her I have respect for her. I'll tell her I care about her. All of it's true. Yeah, I have other women. And a lot of them know that. But women would rather share the king than marry the jester. And when I say about training yourself to be in that elite level position, whether it be fitness, income, maybe you're the most handsome dude in the world. One of my friends, Alexander Cortez, is the most handsome guy I've ever seen. I'm sure he could have a collection of women if he chose to, if he wanted to live this lifestyle based on looks alone. I don't know what your attributes are, but whatever you, they are, understand that women would rather share a top 1% guy than be with some fat dork who's exclusive to them. Believe me. And fat dorks come with their own set of problems anyway. Now, I meet the type of women all the time who are no good. And I just know that men would fall in love with them. Because men are weak and men are stupid. You have to be better than most men. To have a collection like mine, you have to be better than most men. Because the good girls are the ones who are willing to share you. This is what people don't understand. And this is what people don't teach. Like, huh, my wife would uh, never tolerate me talking to other women. Yeah, great. Great, your wife's a bitch. Let me tell you something. I know women who are so invested in my happiness that they know when they're not around, there may be another woman in my bed. I don't know if they know the true extent of it, but they love me so much that they allow me to have other women. When you meet a horrible, nasty, vindictive, jealous bitch, and she's like, oh, well, you better not go out with your friends. You better not do that. Oh, you think that's the woman who really loves you because she wouldn't tolerate you with another woman? No, the woman who really loves you is like, look, I know you have another girl, tears streaming down her face, but I really love you. Please don't leave me. Just tell me I'm different from the rest. That's the woman who loves you. So you have to differentiate which girls you fuck and which girls you wanna love. Simple as that. A good way of doing this is testing their loyalty. Now, I'm not a obsessive stalker. I'm not a jealous guy. I know my girlfriends don't cheat on me. Sure, do I sleep with some side hoes that may have a boyfriend? I may be their side guy. Do I sleep with side hoes who may do that every weekend? Maybe, maybe. But my girlfriends certainly don't cheat on me. But you have to test their loyalty. Now, don't even look through their phone. Don't even look through their phone. Hey, baby, give me your phone. Unlock it. I want to do something on it. Unlocks, hands it over. Don't do shit. Take a selfie and give it back to her. If she'll hand you her unlocked phone, she ain't cheating. Because believe me, these girls get hundreds and hundreds of messages every day on Instagram, on Facebook. If they're replying in a way that they know you won't like, they will not unlock their phone. So if they won't unlock your phone and hand it to you, then that is a very good loyalty test. She's probably not girlfriend material. By all means, get her to suck your dick, have your fun with her, but she's probably not the girl you wanna be with. And I hear a lot about harems, about how to have multiple women. Let me tell you something, I don't enjoy group sex. I don't enjoy threesomes. I don't enjoy foursomes. I don't think they're enjoyable. Sex is a lot more intimate and a lot more fun one-on-one. -on -one. You only have one dick, that's it. So you can only, be, it's taking turns one way or the other. So I don't enjoy group, se group sex. So my harem game is different um, than a lot of guys. Now on the internet, there are very few people who have multiple women. 
Uh, I know one, I'm not going to name him and shame him in my course, but he's a Muslim guy, black guy, American, lives in Germany, a very smart guy. He legitimately has a harem. He has multiple wives. Uh, respect, respect to him, and he's a good friend of mine. Almost no one you see talk about having multiple women has multiple women, besides my brother and myself. Now, how do I run my harem game? It's different than most people. You see, women behave better, and take this from an elite level guy, women behave better when they know you have other options. If you have one girl, one girl only, she'll try to stop you talking to other women, stop you meeting other women, and she'll aggressively try to interject in your life. But when you have other women and she knows that you have other women, maybe she turns a blind eye, maybe she doesn't want to hear about it, but she knows, maybe she's seen you tagged on your Instagram with them, maybe she's seen them in the background of your Instagram story, when she knows you have other women, women up their game. I'm telling you the truth. Good women don't leave. They try to make you happier. Now, when you have a harem all living together, I've lived with two or three women maximum at any, any one point. Very unpleasant experience uh, because sleeping arrangements were always difficult. Sex, I didn't enjoy that much because there was always too many girls. However, the women behaved very well. One woman didn't want to be the one who fucks up out of three because she knows that she's sleeping on the couch and you're fucking those two that night. It was always a game of one-upmanship. The women try to up their game to out-compete one another. Now my harem game is very similar to this, however the women are never in the same place at the same time. They know each other's names. They know who they are. They know that these girls are around me. Even one of my girlfriends isn't quite sure if I'm sleeping with these women, but she heavily suspects that I am. And she checks her, their stories all the time. She knows they're at my house. And that does not make her flip out and cause arguments because she knows she'll get blocked. And she knows when she's blocked, I'm going to be around these other women. It makes her up her game. So my women are not in the same place, but they're fully aware of each other's presence. They're fully aware that the other ones exist and they up their behavior and they check themselves so I don't have to check them and end up with these other women. So my harem game is, is what I call distance game. They're, they're far away from each other, but they know each other exists and that's what makes them behave. I'm going to be honest with you. This is a refreshing moment of honesty. It is hard to have six girlfriends. I have six. I didn't know the exact number I had until I started filming this course. I had to actually count. I didn't know. I thought it was five, six, seven. It could have been one of those numbers. It's difficult because time management is a problem. Luckily for me, I live a lifestyle and you need to set your lifestyle up in the same way where you are busy all hours of the day, but no hours of the day. I can be busy anytime I like. I have a very busy, hectic work schedule, which is usually my excuse, but you do have to see your girlfriends. Now, I'll take a girlfriend on a date, I'll date a new girl, and I'll see a second girlfriend in the evening. I'll usually wake up with that girlfriend, Uber in a girl for lunch, and see another girlfriend that, the second evening. I see my girls about two times a week, maybe three times a week each. Well, but instead of having one relationship, you can have six relationships where the girl thinks you're a busier man than you are. It is possible, but you have to manage your time very, very closely, which makes meeting new girls difficult. Now, whatever you do when you're in a relationship, never ever concede to having enough women. Never think, you know what, I've got my three girlfriends. That's wonderful. I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna delete Tinder. I'm gonna stop posting on Instagram. I'm gonna stop going to clubs, I'm gonna stop doing my approaches. I've got three girlfriends that are all smoking hot. You know why? Because I've lived it. I've been in that situation and I've been content. One girl has an argument with another girl, they find out about each other, they both break up with you. Maybe you only get one back, boom, you're down to two. Same thing happens again, boom, you're down to one. Shit, suddenly you're the guy who's happily married. You got one gina. You're stuck there with one chick. Now you've done no legwork, you've put in zero hours, in terms of getting new women, so you have to start from scratch. Build up your collection again. It's months before you have three again. Then four, then five, then six. Never ever be content. But in relationships, it's very important to be kind. People think players, especially guys who worked in the industry that I have, are horrible people. That I'm rude to women. That my house is a revolving door with women in that. Okay, that bit is a bit true. But it, you think they leave unhappy? No, they do not. Be polite, buy them flowers sometimes, buy them chocolates, 
you don't have to go out of your way to make a woman smile. I stop at the gas station all the time. Look at my cars. Every time I stop at the gas station, I buy a box of chocolates. It's the thought that will make a woman's day. If you have lunch with a woman and you bought her a teddy bear and a bouquet of flowers, girlfriends only, obviously, she'll go home in the evening and she won't think about what I'm doing, who my dick's in. She's like, oh, Tristan loves me. He bought me flowers and a teddy bear. And she'll be posting photos to her Instagram of the flower and the teddy bears I bought her, which makes my other girls see. They suspect that I bought them. They up their game. Hey, Tristan, when am I seeing you? It's a beautiful system, but be nice to your girlfriends in your relationships. But being nice also includes not engaging in bullshit arguments. If a girl wants to argue with you all the time, she's not a girl that's cohesive with the elite player lifestyle. You need to stay away from those women. Engaging in needless arguments is a tactic women use. They're smarter than you think to eat away the hours of your day and the hours of time you could be using to pursue other women. I recently had to let a girlfriend of mine go. Beautiful. I'm not gonna show her a picture here. She's long gone. I don't reminisce over old news. However, absolutely stunning. But every moment I wasn't with her, you're with other girls, blah, 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 starting arguments with me, complaining, moaning. I was engaging on WhatsApp for a, an extra 30, 40 minutes a day that I didn't have. Stay away from women who make arguments. So be nice, be kind, but don't take shit. If they want to start arguments, stop talking to them. If you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. So if they're arguing with you and you have no nice response to them, cut them off. Do not invest hours in that shit. In relationships, a good way to keep your relationship fresh and a good way to keep your relationship happy is to make demands of women. Women love to serve men. They really do. If a woman cooks you a meal and it's good, she's going to be happy. She can spend an hour in the kitchen, sweating, toiling. She can burn her hand. If she brings you a plate of food and you eat it and you're satisfied, she is happy. Believe me, women are servile. Good women are servile. And a good way to keep your relationship happy is to make demands of your women. I have a ritual. Every morning I drink a black coffee in bed. I never make it myself. Whichever girl I wake up next to goes downstairs, makes my coffee, she knows how I like it, she brings it upstairs, I sip it. Now I don't just sip it, I'll add something in. You know, I love when you make me coffee. Your coffee's the best, because I can tell it's made with love. It's a joke, we'll laugh, it's cheesy, it's corny, but that will set the mood for the day. That will set the pace for the day. It's a wonderful thing. Women are very servile creatures, so do not be afraid to make demands of them. So if you hang around me, or you know people who have hung around me, you'll know how it goes. I'm sitting with the boys, I'm drinking some whiskeys. Hey baby, uh, Bobby wants a refill. Hey, Iggy wants another few ice cubes, uh, darling. Uh, excuse me, uh, Jonathan's beer is out and you're, you're in the house. Like, I mean, get, get him a lighter as well, cigars out, come on. They love it, they really do, if you have a good woman. So that is certainly an important part of having a relationship. Make demands, be the man, be assertive, be, Alpha, be dominant, it helps. When you're maintaining relationships like I am and your time is limited, you have to be sure not to burn your time. I call it burning time. You're with your girlfriend for three hours. All you have is three hours. Netflix, no, not fucking Netflix. Why would you sit there and burn three hours away on Netflix? You have other girls to see and other things to do. Now, admission. I am a guy, I fuck every day. I do not masturbate, I do not watch porn. Elite level playboys do not do these things because you can't. So I'm gonna have sex with three different women a day and I still need to jerk off? No, I'm fine. I haven't jerked off in a year and a half. Yeah, I was in India last time because there were no girls around. I remember the exact fucking date. So I'm telling you, porn, masturbation, throw them out the window. You wanna be an elite level playboy? Be a fucking man. You don't get sex for one day, cool, you'll live. Do 50 press-ups before you go to sleep. Go out the next day hungrier. I'm gonna tell you, women need sex just like men do. Now, it's very easy for me, if I wanted to, to not have sex with my women for a week, two weeks, for an individual girl. Because say I only see her three times in a week and it's all during the afternoon. I've already had sex that morning. I know I have another girl to see in the evening. It's easy for me to just spend time, burn the hours watching Netflix, but she will not be as happy. Guys, 
Tiger Woods isn't the best golf player in the world because he sits on his couch watching Netflix. Floyd Mo Muhammad Ali was not the best heavyweight boxer of all time because he sat on his couch watching TV. You want to be an elite level playboy, you want to collect these women, then you have to keep them happy. You know what? It's the middle of the afternoon. I've already had sex three hours ago or four hours ago. A girl sucked my dick because I woke up in the morning. Ah, my girlfriend's over. You know what? Grab her by the fucking tits till your dick gets hard and make sure you fuck her. Make sure you do. There is no maintaining a relationship without sex. Maintaining a healthy relationship and never having sex with your woman is not real. Doesn't matter who she is, doesn't matter how loyal she is. If she's really loyal, she'll bring it up to you. Uh, why aren't we having sex? Oh, you never want to have sex with me. And she'll get mad. If she's disloyal, she'll seem fine and she'll, she's fucking someone else. If you're going to collect these women, they're not cars. You can't park them all on your driveway for months and sit there triumphantly and say, ah, look at my collection of cars. Aren't they beautiful? You've got to drive them. If you don't drive them, they'll disappear. Someone else will take them off your driveway. That's the way women are. So you absolutely have to keep your woman happy. Man up. I'm not going to tell you how to fuck your girl. You know how to fuck your girl. I'm not going to go into sex tactics. That's not what this course is about. But if you have multiple women, make sure you fuck them. You got to keep them happy. What women really crave is attention. They love the attention because they love feeling in demand. They love feeling desired. Now, if you hang out with a girl three times in a week and you don't fuck her once, now you can brag to your friends, yeah, I was tired, I fucked too many other girls. That's cool, but she doesn't feel desired and she's going to be unfulfilled in your relationship. When your hours are scarce, you have to invest your hours doing things that make her feel wanted. Take some pictures together. Say, you know, baby, here, to get in your underwear, I'm gonna take some photos of you. Take some photos of her. What do you do with them? Nothing. Make her feel special, then get your dick out. Make sure you fuck it right. There's no excuse for women leaving you. Even if you have six or seven, I have more girlfriends and less time than most guys who get dumped. And I don't get dumped. Why? Because even when I'm not in the mood, I man up and I understand what I have to do to keep my women happy. I'm often not in the mood, often I've been training, often I've been fucking other women, but you gotta get it done. Now I've covered how to maintain a healthy relationship when you have multiple girls, but I'm gonna touch on what not to do. The basics of what not to do. Never admit that you're wrong for doing something that you wanted to do. I'll give you an example. Another girl sucks your dick. Another girl, you fuck her. Your girlfriend finds out. Two of your girlfriend, girlfriends find out. Don't even say sorry. You, you're not sorry, one. Why are you not sorry? Because you wanted to do it at the time. So you're sorry you got caught. You're not really sorry and she knows it. You know, you have to hold the line. The moment you start apologizing, you're making a concession. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry means I shouldn't have done it. It means I won't do it again. Many things are implied by your sorry. I never engage in this kind of behavior. This girl was at your house, this girl was at your house. Hey, the fuck? Haven't you got a life? Stay off Instagram. What are you watching this girl's story for anyway? It's really embarrassing. What, are you gonna stalk everyone who comes into my house? But don't look through my phone. Why are you looking through my phone? Now, you, you know what? I was having a really nice day with you and now we're arguing because you wanted to look through my phone. This is so stupid. How old are you, 16? You're obsessed with, with, with social media. Quit fucking looking at Instagram. Never admit you're wrong. Hold the line, say whatever it is you can, but never concede and never admit mistakes because they're not mistakes. You are on your way to being an elite level playboy. I am an elite level player. I don't make mistakes. I fuck them because I want to fuck them. It isn't a mistake. No, I'm not sorry. Now, this isn't an act. I mean it. I don't apologize and I fucking mean it. I'm really not sorry. So, Jesus, they can't break me down. They can't squeeze an apology out of me because I really, really mean it when I say that I'm not sorry. Never concede. In a relationship, another thing not to do, I've covered this basically, but do not engage in pointless arguments and do not engage in pointless conversation. Um, if you have a relationship, if you're gonna get caught cheating, don't let it be with some girl who lives in California that you're flirting with online for no reason. It makes you look like a simp, makes you look like a fan, makes you look like a customer, makes you look like a nerd. If you're gonna get caught, get caught fucking something. Do not burn your hours cheating on your girlfriend emotionally with girls far away, with girls you haven't got a chance with, with girls with boyfriends who don't take you seriously. Don't waste your time with this stuff, man. You only have 24 hours in the day and you need to see three or four women, minimum, if you wanna operate on my level. 
So do not waste your time with girls that are far away because there's nothing worse than getting caught and having your girlfriend all strung up on some nonsense with some girl who's hotter than her, but she's in Singapore anyway. What are you doing? So absolutely do not do that. One of the most fundamental mistakes. When you get attention like I do as a man, make sure it's localized. Make sure you have an opportunity to fuck her, an opportunity to see her, and don't get caught by your girlfriend doing nonsense shit. Don't get caught watching porn. It makes women feel undesirable. Cut porn out of your life if you want to operate on my level. Do not get caught masturbating. That's super embarrassing. These are very basic things, but I think if you, if you are on your way to being an elite level guy, you should know these things already. Those are the don'ts in relationships. No elite playboy lives without girlfriends or the respect of women. Relationships are essentially important. To every single man, it's not enough to just have sex. Relationships are intensely important. So use everything I taught you and maintain your relationships the way that I do it. Believe me, some of these things may not seem like they work. Test them and hit me back with some feedback because I know from personal experience they do. That's the end of module three. Now, there's a part to this no one wants to hear. Everyone, uh, most guys are looking for a quick fix. You're looking for a secret, something I'm gonna tell you, a magic word, a spell, an incantation that's gonna make you be surrounded with women who wanna have sex with you all the time. It doesn't exist. It does not exist. It's a recipe. It's a recipe which includes lots of hard work. And this is, be, this, is a, this is something I call being a man in demand. Or the five F's. I've got five F's. They are fitness, finance, fun, free time, and fucking. Those are the five F's. And that is the recipe of what makes you a man who women want to fuck. If you're not a man who women want to fuck, if you are lazy and you're broke, and your Instagram looks terrible, and you're fat as fuck, and you look like shit, and you're not smart, you're not interesting, you're not funny, you're busy all the time, how many women do you think you're gonna get? Zero. It doesn't matter what you apply of what I know. You have to be a man who has some level of demand about him to be an elite level playboy. So we're gonna take these five Fs in a row. The first one, fitness. Now, I don't mean just physical fitness, but how well do you look? Women care about looks, they do. I'm not the best looking guy in the world, but I try my hardest. Right now, as we film, April the 11th, I'm in quarantine. My beard isn't trimmed, my hair isn't cut nicely, but most of the time I'm walking around with a nice trimmed razored beard. My haircut is always on point, I've gelled my hair, I've dressed nicely. I'm wearing a designer shirt, nice watch, nice shoes. I'm presentable to the world. I work out. I'm physically fit. Uh, I'm, always, I'm not always in the best shape, but you know, I do my push-ups every morning. I do my boxing. I do my training. Whatever training you do, you have to do it. Fitness is important. How fit do you look? It is basic human evolutionary biology. Oh, look, this big, strong, handsome guy. He'll give me nice children. Women may not think that exactly in their heads, but it's a big part of what makes women want to have sex with you. If you disregard it, if you think, oh, well, I'm rich. Uh, it doesn't matter. I'm a big, fat, ugly fuck. I've got loads of money. Women will want to fuck me. They won't. They won't. They may fuck you if you pay them, but that isn't what this is about. That's not being a playboy. That's being a customer. And I'm not teaching you how to be a customer. So yes, you do have to be presentable. You have to look your best. Train as much as you can. Make sure your hair is the way that you like it. I don't know. Don't get your hair cut if you have long hair, whatever. Do whatever makes you look good. Fitness is essential because it's something that women desire. And there are general rules to women. No woman on earth thinks, ah, oh, I love big, fat, ugly guys. I mean, there are guys who like fat chicks, maybe. No woman on earth wants a big, fat, ugly dude who gets out of breath when he walks up the stairs. Not a single one. So you take that general rule and you think, okay, I wanna be as attractive as I can to as many women as possible. Don't be a fat, lazy fuck. Rule number one, if you're a fat, lazy fuck, get to the gym. You're not gonna be able to live like me until you do. Get into reasonable shape, at least. Being a fat, lazy fuck is not attractive to women. Fitness is essential. Now with these general rules, when I say women don't like guys who are big, fat, and ugly, you can take everything else I say in the five Fs 
and apply them exactly the same way. I am not every woman's type. A lot of women look at me and think, you know what? I don't like him. I don't like the way he looks. Don't like the way he's shaped. Don't like his height. I'm too tall, maybe, for some women. Yeah, if they're short. Uh, I don't like this. I don't like that. Cool. I'm not every woman's type. Neither are you. Nobody is. I know some handsome dudes. They're not every woman's type. They can't be. However, being fit makes it far more likely that you are going to be the type of the women you meet. So absolutely, this is an essential rule. The first of the five Fs, being a man in demand, is fitness. Look your best, train hard. Women like to feel safe. They like to feel protected. They like when you put your big arms around them. They like if you can pick them up. Women love that shit. Get to the gym. Now, some people have further to go than others. Yes, some people are genetically blessed. If this is you, you may work out once a week and have an iron six pack. I don't have a six pack right now. That may be you. Cool. Lucky you. You may work out five times a week and still look like shit. Then you simply have to try harder than the other guys. Being a top 1% guy, everyone's born with different attributes. You're born smarter. Okay, it's easier to get rich. You're born with better genetics. Okay, it's easier to get fit. You're born, you're born uh, wittier. You're, you're raised in a, in a better environment. Okay, it's better to be funny and, and, and make them laugh. Everyone has advantages and disadvantages, but you need to maximize all of these as much as you can. As much as you can, regardless of who you are. And some have further to go than others. But if you're not taking into account your fitness at all, you're not going to get the girls that I get. Number two, finance. Finance is important. Finance gives you the ability to do things. If all of the hottest women were in a building and it cost $500 to go inside that building to have drinks and you only had $100 to your name, you're not going to meet any beautiful women. That's the way the world is. It sounds like such a crazy example, but the world works that way. All of the most beautiful women in the world, with very few exceptions, are in high-end, luxurious places. They attract women. And if you're not there, you're not going to meet them. Finance is very important. You do not give women money, ever. You do not give them money for sex. You do not give them money to show off. You don't give women money, that's bullshit. However, your financial situation creates an aura of fun. Women love fun. I have a swimming pool in my house. Women love that. In the summer, they're coming here, jumping in the pool, taking their bikinis off. Now, are they thinking, ah, this pool, 28,000 euros this cost. Oh, this pool costs so much money. Tristan has money. Wonderful. No. They're thinking, wow, swimming pool. That's it. Finance and your financial situation makes you fun. Now, this is something else that you are not going to hear anywhere else but this course. Investing. Investing, you say? Investing your money to get women? That doesn't make any sense. You don't understand. You can invest in a city. You can invest in a club, in a bar. You can invest in your location. That doesn't mean buy shares. I'm talking about wasting your money. I call wasting my money investing. Why? I was once asked what the best investment I ever made was. I looked straight at my cousin and I said, you know what? One of the best investments I ever made was blowing hundreds of thousands of dollars right here in Bucharest. Champagne shows for drinks I don't drink, getting all the sparklers come over, my name put up on the wall, tipping really heavily in restaurants, ordering lobster and champagne when I go out, being out in clubs and bars all the time, buying coffees all the time. Being cheap isn't cool. Now me throwing all this money around I am the man that everybody knows. When I go into the club, everything is made possible for me. I, no smoking allowed. Have you ever seen a picture of me in a club without a cigar in my mouth? I have special privileges, special rights. Everyone treats me with respect. If I'm with a girl, the security shake my hand. The manager comes over with a free bottle of champagne every time I go anywhere because I've invested in becoming a somebody in this city. Nobody will give you this advice. The advice you read on the internet be cheap, save £3.50 and don't buy that coffee. Make a coffee at home. No, don't make a coffee at home. Go to a cool cafe and drink their fancy coffees every day. 
tip the waiter heavily. Then you're that guy. You go there and they're on a date. Tristan, how are you doing, sir? Good to see you again, Mr. Tate. Has someone parked your car for you nicely? Investing in your city is important. And it's what most people will call wasting money. What does wasting money even mean? What is money for? You can't hold on to money. You never really even own money, even if you have it in your pocket. Money is just to be interchanged with other people. You got it because you sold something they want. You want good service, you throw it to someone else. You're just passing it around. Don't waste all your money, obviously, but you live in Atlanta, Georgia. I was in Atlanta, and there's a cigar bar where they would recognize me right now if I went there. Same in uh, Hollywood in California. There's a cigar lounge where they'd recognize me right now because I went there for two weeks. I was there four or five times, bought the most expensive cigars, tipped heavily, ordered some nice drinks. They know me today. So there are a few parts in the world, uh, Moscow, Slovakia, some parts in the United States, certainly, where I would be no Stockholm now, where I'd be known on a first name basis if I walked into the establishment. But within my city, yes, I am a celebrity. I mean, I'm in the newspapers all the time. I'm actually a celebrity here. But again, that stems from my initial investment. The club owners knowing me, the barmen knowing me, everyone knowing who I was. Before the newspapers got a sniff of who was this Tristan Tate, I'd invested. So finance is important. Blow your money in the city you're in. You want to be a somebody? It's not free. You make good money, great. Good for you. There are millionaires on Twitter, who people who claim to be millionaires, who also talk about, oh, save all your money, don't spend it. Yeah, cool, that's all right. Yeah, you want, you, want, you want no one to know who you are and have a big number in your bank account? Yeah, that's cool. I invest my money by blowing it in my city. It was the best investment I ever made. I'm one of the most famous faces in this city. I walk down the street, I, I get asked for photos all the time. Girls know who I am. I get hit up on Instagram by random females. Yeah, you want to be a playboy? Throw some money around. Finance is the second of the five Fs exceptionally important. Number three, fun. You have to be entertaining. Now, there are ways that nerds think you could be entertaining that don't work. Having a Lamborghini, for example. Having a Lamborghini does not make women want to have sex with you. It makes little boys want to drive around in your car. Women don't give a shit about driving around in your Lamborghini that much unless they like you. You have to make it fun. Having a supercar gets you an opening conversation. You park at the club, you walk inside. Is that your car? If you reply, yeah, that's my car. Uh, it has 600 horsepower and uh, I got the tires custom from, from Germany and, and the body kit is actually from a, a custom body shop in Bucharest and I changed the color and uh, I've got a special steering wheel. The girl's gonna be like, uh-huh, uh-huh, cool, see you later. If you're a boring twat, it doesn't matter what car you drive. It doesn't matter what car you drive. Hi, is that your car? No, it's yours. I'm gonna get drunk tonight, you're driving me home, yeah? Cool, obviously you don't really let her drive your car. But say something funny, I just came off, uh, up with that off the top of my head. Say something witty, say something entertaining. Being a millionaire, having nice things, having cool things, it doesn't get you pussy, it gets you a five second opener. And if you squander that, if you waste it, it was all for nothing. You have to be fun. Women don't care about money. They care about what's entertaining. Now, when I was broke, I used to have no money. I would be funny. I'd take girls on a date. I'd say, uh, oh, you didn't wear high heels on our date in my Volkswagen Golf. They'd be like, ah, oh, no, where are we even going? Well, you know what? You're not wearing high heels. I'm gonna take you, I'm gonna take you to somewhere suitable. Bro, McDonald's. This was my routine. I go to McDonald's. I had a few pounds to my name. I rolled on the window, hi. I need an ice cream McFlurry. Yeah, bring me an ice cream McFlurry, but put extra love in it. What? What? You, what did you say? Extra love. Extra toppings? No, no, no. Extra love. I'm on a date. I need to make her fall in love with me. Oh, uh, okay. The girl's laughing her ass off. She thinks it's hilarious. I give her her ice cream. Uh, is it working? Are you in love with me yet? Why'd you take me to McDonald's? Well, you weren't wearing high shoes. Ha, ha, ha. I didn't have any money. Make them laugh. Make them enjoy their time with you. And this is what I said about dating earlier. You have to implant yourselves in their mind. Wow, I had a wonderful time. That could be on her mind for two days while you're fucking your girlfriends and you're fucking other women. That could be on her mind all week while she's working, maybe she's busy and she can't wait to see you again. You have to be fun. Fun is important. Now, this is very subjective. It varies from man to man. I don't know where you are. I don't know where you live. I don't know who you are. I don't know what you know. I don't know who you know. But you know, kill the mosquito.
See? Boom. I'm a ninja. But you know how to have fun in your own city, I'm sure, or your own town. You know how to show a girl a good time. Don't be boring. Yeah, that is essential. And if you're a boring guy, work on it. If you're broke, work on it. If you're unfit, work on it. Those are the first three of the five Fs. Free time. Free time is essential. It kind of links to finance because what money buys you is free time. You need to have free time. I was watching a dork who was a former Goldman Sachs trader who's saying, yeah, well, I used to go to bed at midnight, wake up at four in the morning, and I had one girlfriend, and one day she left me. She got up in the middle of the night at four when I woke up and started screaming at me, saying, are you kidding? You're never home. Okay, you're a Goldman Sachs trader. Maybe you're a Goldman Sachs trader. I don't know what you do, but you're working 70, 80 hours a week. Find a better way. If you really want to be an elite level playboy, you need to be working 40 hours a week max. 45 at the very, very upper limit. You can't do it any other way. All of my women, all of my girlfriends, all the sex that I have, all the dates that I go on, there's no 70 hour week where I can accommodate that. I'd have to cut my women, I'd have to cut them in half, literally. So yeah, free time is essential. It really is essential. And you need to be flexible with your time as well. The flexibility of time is just important as your free time because if a woman says, oh, well, there's this place I wanna go or there's this lunch event at this restaurant or I, you know, I wanna go to a swimming pool or in the middle of the day when most dudes are at their nine to five, you need to be like, yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, let's go. I'm gonna come pick you up. It sets you aside for most men. Being available whenever you want, the flexibility is very important as well. Most guys work nine to fives. At one o'clock in the afternoon, you know I'm gonna take you out for a spin. Let's go for a drive, let's go for a coffee. Being free at those hours when no one else is free is important. So yeah, you absolutely have to maximize your income but minimize your hours worked. That's super important. If you're working a, a wage job, where you're getting paid per hour, no shame in it, brothers. I used to do the same thing. But a way to get women, don't start working more hours. No, cut your workload in half. Do budget dates. You'll get more women than if you up your work hours, trust me. Free time, immensely important. Number five, the F word, fucking. You have to fuck your women right. Not just for them. I've covered about how it keeps relationships together. But fuck relationships. I'm talking about bitches, sluts. Girls who are at your table, one night stands. Put the work in. I'm not gonna tell you how to fuck. I'm not gonna tell you how to please a woman. If you don't know, then you're never gonna be an elite playboy. You never will be if you can't fuck. But when you do it right, it gets you more women. It really does. Women talk about this shit on a scale you have no idea. Believe me, if you fuck a girl, ignore your girlfriends. You don't, you don't wanna be messing around with your girlfriend's friends anyway. But let's say you meet a girl for one night. You don't see her for four weeks. Oh, her friend's now following me on Instagram. Why is that? Because this bitch has been talking about, yeah, I met this guy, Tristan. Yeah, he took me for a drink. It's a bit of an asshole. Oh my God, he fucked me so good. Yeah, he fucked me so good. Oh, I can't be mad at him. I'd like to see him again, actually, but he's not really texting me. Boom! Her friend hears you. Her friend's on it. Sex is immensely important. That is the most important one of the five Fs. Because if you have everything else on point, and you fuck your girl and you only last 30 seconds and then you fall asleep, you're a joke. You're never gonna secure her into a relationship. You're never gonna get the love. You're never gonna get the respect. And you're never gonna have the reputation that leads to residual women coming in. Those are the five Fs. Remember, fitness, finance, fun, free time, fucking. You cannot neglect any one of these if you wish to be an elite. You wanna be a guy with one girlfriend, maybe two. You wanna have sex once a month, maybe twice, cool. Neglect as many as you like. You can't live like me if you neglect these things. And there we have it, short and sweet, module four, the five Fs, immensely important stuff. You have to put the work in. This is the most important part of the course. Do not neglect module four. Do not neglect the five Fs. If you do, you're gonna be very lonely and you're never gonna pull it off.